tracks that I've seen tonight in booths that I've never won before. And uh, look, it's, um, I'm just really humbled and thank the people of Petrie for what I've seen so far. And what about Queensland generally there, Luke Howe? Uh, the, uh, the Labor vote's really struggling in a lot of parts, not just in the north and centre, but in the southeast as well. Well, look, Labor went into this election um, unprecedented with the amount of new taxes that they wanted to put on the Queensland and Australian people. You know, some, they're almost increasing the tax take by 10%. Australians aren't going to cop that. You know, people work hard and they deserve to keep more of their own money. And I think that really bit. You can't be bringing all these taxes in, whether it's on retirees and housing and income We're tax and business, win. and expect to get a great result. And I'm just really, um, you know, really pleased with uh, the result that I've been able to get locally and thank the local people, and I'll work hard for them. But I also think that Scott Morrison has, won, has run an exceptional campaign at the federal level. And, uh, look, I, I wouldn't be surprised at all if he, if he wins tonight. All right, Luke Howe, thank you very much for joining us. Well done again on uh, your win there in Petrie. I want to go to how things look now. The State of the House, now bear in mind, 76 seats is required for a majority government. Of course, you can put together a minority government from uh, less than that. But here's how things look right now. And you can see the Coalition sitting on 57, Labor 52, the Greens 1, that's the seat of Melbourne. Bob Catter holding his seat in uh, Kennedy. Centre Alliance is Rebecca Sharkey in Mayo and then two independents. So, 37 undecided right now in that blue and red column. Uh, uh, as you look at the chamber, uh, it tells you just how close this is right now, but the government obviously in a better position than they might have thought. 33% uh, of the vote count there now. The state of the parties and perhaps the wins and the losses. Let's see where they are happening. All right, so the state of the parties telling us much the same there. Uh, that the Coalition's 57, Labor 52. Where have the gains and losses been? Let's bring that one up. All right, so the gains for the Coalition right now. Herbert Longman, they're the Queensland seats we mentioned. Braddon in Tasmania and Lindsay in uh, outer western Sydney. have all gone the Coalition's way. And, of course, we've seen some losses as well. And, uh, well, the gains for Labor have been Dunkley in Victoria... <clears throat> And Gilmore, on the south coast of New South Wales, is now in a win there for the Labor column. And Warringah, of course, is the other one, not won by Labor, but by Zali Stegall. Chris Kenny is in Warringah. He's been keeping an eye on the contest there, where it's now very clear, Chris Kenny, that Tony Abbott has lost this. Zali Stegall has won. It's been such a fascinating contest to watch. Uh, you're now... Well, tell us where you are now. David, we're now inside the uh, Sea Eagles, uh, the Manly Sea Eagles uh, Rugby League Club here at uh, Brookvale in the heart of Tony Abbott's electorate. Inside this room are all his workers and supporters who are there ready to welcome him. We're expecting him to walk through here in the next minute or so. Already his wife, Margie, at least one of his daughters, sister Christine Forster and her partner, Virginia, have gone in there waiting to hear from Tony Abbott. The mood here is really mixed, as you'd understand. So many of them, David, clinging to the hope, of course, the promise that the coalition might be able to hang on to government here, so they're buoyed by that. But, of course, they're not just disappointed about what's happened to Tony Abbott. They're very, very angry about the hateful campaign that's been run against him. You know, the posters with the C word, the uh, poo feces sent to his office, uh, just the uh, general tone of this campaign, which, of course, uh, raised uh, to new levels last night with all sorts of uh, allegations of violence on the hustings. But, um, so there's a mood here of anger and disappointment. Uh, amazing support still for Tony Abbott, as you'd understand. Uh, but, of course, they're buoyed by the prospects of... Uh, I think what most of us have looked, talked about, well, some of us, I suppose, who saw this as being very close, thought that you'd see co outside Victoria a good prospect the Coalition could actually be in net positive territory, the campaign coming down in the end, the election result coming down in the end, as to how many seats are lost in Victoria. But I'll leave you and all the number crunches to tell us what's happening there. We're now waiting for Tony Abbott to come into this room, be greeted, no doubt, very emotionally by this quite large gathering now, and make what is going to be a concession speech, which is going to be the end of a 25-year political wow. career in this seat of Warringah. We definitely want to see that, Chris Kenny. Thank you. We'll come back for that. Uh, Andrew Bolt's with us as well. And, Andrew, it's pretty clear what's happened now in Warringah. Tony Abbott gone, but nationally right now, Labor in, uh, look, a fair bit of trouble in their hopes of trying to reach a majority, that's for sure. Uh, Labor's in a disaster. 
Going into this election, it needed to pick up seven seats to win a majority government. It's picked up zero, zero. The coalition has lost net zero, but one of those is Warringah, as you've just said. Sally Stegall says she's basically conservative. It is now more likely for the coalition to form a minority government than it is for Labor. Now, these still lots of, you know, early figures in many cases, and we've got a huge pre-poll that we've still got to count for, and we've got to wait for Western Australia, and it might even come down to whether Lingari in the Northern Territory is picked up by the coalition as well. I find that unlikely, but if it is, the well, coalition that, will Andrew, be returned. Here, I, I want to bring in... I'll just show you Lingiari. So we're now... We've got a bit of a count here of 13.5%. Jacinda Price is doing spectacularly well. Her vote's up 10% for the CLP. She was a star pick for, uh, for, the, for the CLP. She's sitting on 47.6%. Now, that's the sort of primary vote that's pretty hard to lose from, isn't it, Andrew Bolt? It will be the Well, it is, but... Uh, Northern, yes, Northern Territory is a very disparate electorate. Uh, Lingara is a very disparate electorate. So you've got the big, you know, the, the, the country towns, but then you've got the far-flung booths which get counted first. So we don't know where that goes. But if, uh, if she wins this, Jacinta Price will be the heroine of the Liberal Party, along with, of course, the Prime Minister, because that would make them able to form a minority government with the help, say, of Bob Catter, and one or two of the other independents, uh, Karen Phelps, maybe, or Zali Stegall. But whatever, whoever wins, whether it's Labor or Liberal, what Australians have voted for is three years of indecisive, crippled government that is hampered in the lower house by being a minority government, whoever wins, and in the Senate by not controlling the numbers there either. I'm afraid that we are going to have a lack of leadership for three years. Very good point, very depressing point, but a very good one, <laughs> Andrew Bolt, based on where things stand right now. Let's have a look at Solomon, though, uh, as well, because that's the other Northern Territory seat. You saw Lingiari there. Uh, Solomon's the one that is based in Darwin itself. No, we don't have any results there coming in just yet. Bear in mind they're um, <clears throat> a little further behind in the time zone. We'll go to that when we can. We're also standing by, you might see on this shot here, for uh, Tony Abbott to concede defeat there in Warringah the end of his political parliamentary career. 25 years he's held that seat, and a former Prime Minister, no less. But Zali Stegall has taken that seat tonight in what's been such a high-profile contest. And, look, you know, for, for all the... Um, you can see the supporters there. They'll give him a big cheer. They'll want to give him a good send-off here, but there's no doubt this is a disappointing night for all of them. Sorry, Peter. Well, just while we're waiting for Tony Abbott, I've just got a note here regarding uh, Solomon. Mm. 10,000 TPP votes have been counted uh, and the CLP are ahead 54 yep. to 46. Wow. Mm. This is um, not a good night for Labor, there's no doubt about sure. that. Sure. And Labor will struggle to form a government. I, um, I think you've got to take your hat off to Scott Morrison. He was written off and he's done brilliantly. I, I work far better than I would have thought possible. So. Um, uh, he's an old mate of mine, and I, I, I just want to say I salute you. You've done brilliantly. Here's Tony Abbott now. He's coming up to the microphone here to give his concession speech. Look, a smile on his face. This is going to be a tough moment for him. Let's have a listen in, see what he has to say. something which I did uh, 25 years ago in a earlier speech at this club and that was the speech I gave at my pre-selection. I'm going to move this lectern out.
Well, first I want to say to all of you that tonight we've got good news and yes, we've got a little bit of bad news, but the good news is much more important than the bad news. The good news is that there is every chance that the Liberal National Coalition has won this election. extraordinary result. It is a stupendous result. It is a great result for Scott Morrison and the rest of the wider Liberal team and Scott Morrison will now quite rightly enter the Liberal pantheon forever. So, so of course it's disappointing for us here in Warringah. But what matters is what's best for the country. And what's best for the country is not so much who wins or loses Warringah, but who forms or does not form a government in Canberra. And tonight, we can be extraordinarily confident, uh, more confident than we had ever had any right to expect that we will have continued good Liberal National Government. <laughs> now, I have to say that once we had the result in the Wentworth by-election uh, six months or so back, I always knew it was going to be tough here in Warringah. And I can't say that it doesn't hurt to lose, but I decided uh, back then in October of last year that if I had to lose, so be it. I'd rather be a loser than a quitter. Yeah. Yeah. and ultimately successful campaign uh, that has been waged by my political opponents in this speech. Uh, I do congratulate Zali Stegel on what is a magnificent win for her, and I hope that she will have a long... <laughs> and, and I hope uh, that she will have the long and successful career as local member that the people of Warringah deserve. But I think we can see that there is something of a realignment of politics going on right around this country. It's clear that in what might be described as working seats, we are doing so much better. It's also clear that in at least some of what might be described as wealthy seats, we are doing it tough and the Green Left is doing better. But the truth is that if you believe that the most important thing is to raise people up, if you believe that the most important thing is to give people a better life, the fact that so many people in seats that might be thought of as doing it tough are now looking to our party for leadership is a great tribute and a great credit. days and weeks, I suspect there will be a great deal of analysis of the part that climate change did or did not play uh, in the Warringah outcome. And let me just say this as my first word, if not necessarily my last word, on this subject. <laughs> Where climate change is a moral issue, 
we Liberals do it tough. But where climate change is an economic issue, as the result tonight shows, we do very, very well. Now, it's often said, it's often said that all public lives end badly, but I'm certainly not going to let one bad day spoil 25 great years. Obviously, there are some things that, with the wisdom of hindsight, might have been done differently and better. But I've got to say that I can look back on the last 25 years, and I do look back on the last 25 years with immense pride and satisfaction. And I'm incredibly proud of the fact that, so far, I am one of just four people in history who has led our party from opposition into government in Canberra. And I hope that the Morrison government has such a long life that it's a long time till there is a fifth. <laughs> some thank yous. Uh, I don't believe that the Warringah campaign could have done more or done better. Uh, I think every aspect of our campaign was as good as it humanly could have been under the circumstances. I want to thank Peter O'Hanlon for his outstanding job as the director. I thank Michelle Moffat for her outstanding work as his deputy. And I thank Roger Corbett, a really great Australian, for coming into the team as my FEC conference president. I thank my staff. I could not have had a better, more loyal and more professional staff, particularly Sam Jackson Hope for his wonderful work. You have been a wonderfully supportive yeah. spouse. I thank my children, two of whom can't be here tonight, but one of whom did a wonderful job of winning votes up at Lambie High School today. <laughs> sisters, all three of whom were booth captains today. So, for, the first time, for the first time ever, uh, politics has finally become the family business, <laughs> just as I bow out of it. Uh, finally, I do want to say a big thank, thank you to the people of Warringah. Uh, I could not have achieved anything in public life but for the support that the people of Warringah have given me over 25 great years. Uh, my public life will, I imagine, go on. My life as member for Warringah will not. We need you back. But Warringah is the place I live. It's the place I will continue to serve and I look forward to many, many more years living, working and serving in the greatest part of the greatest city of the greatest country on earth. Thank you.
Well, pretty gracious concession speech there from Tony Abbott as he bows out after 25 years, extraordinary years, in the federal parliament, including a period as prime minister, of course, as well. He did say there that after what we saw in the Wentworth by-election last year, when Karen Phelps won as an independent, uh, he knew that it was going to be tough there in Warringah. Hang on a minute. Disappointment here. Cloud your satisfaction and joy uh, at what's happened elsewhere in the country. Uh, this is a good night for Australia. It's a great night for the Liberal Party. It's a, it's a good night for Australia. It's a great night for the Liberal Party. That means it's got to be a great night for us as well. All right. We will, we'll, we'll, we'll leave that there. He's giving a rev up to the folks there to give them something to celebrate. The reason I say it was gracious was because he really focused on uh, what's the good thing about tonight for the Liberal Party, for the Coalition. That's that there is every chance in his word that the LNP has won this election. We don't know that yet. We'll get back to the count in a minute, but he's focusing on the positive there for the party rather than his own disappointment. Peter Credlin, I've got to get your thoughts right there watching Tony Abbott, who you worked so closely with, um, concede. This is it. The end of the road. That's the measure of the man. I mean, that was such a masterclass in dignity and grace. You know, a tough blow losing your seat. John Howard lost his seat. Uh, it's not unusual for Liberal Prime Ministers to lose their seat. Um, he was very gracious to Zali Stegall, very gracious to her campaign, and it has been her campaign, not her, but her campaign, certainly been less than ideal, uh, certainly not, uh, you know, the rules according to Hoyle. Um, he's a conviction politician that sort of belongs in another age nowadays. You know, we talked about Hawke the, uh, the last couple of days. Um, Abbott is one of those people who feels very deeply that, that public office should be something, as Australians, we should better revere, we should treat all politicians, left and right, uh, with a, a better treatment a, as public, yeah. in uh, public domains, how we greet them on the street, how we respect their convictions, because Richard's here and Stephen Conroy and... Graham Richardson, it's a very tough ask on the individual, on their families, and it should be a contest of ideas. It shouldn't be faeces in books. It shouldn't be personal campaigns. Correct. It shouldn't be the C word on posters. And I just think he, anyone who has supported him um, throughout those 25 years, you look at that speech tonight and you know you supported a good man. Just, I've got to ask, though, I mean, he acknowledges there he knew it would be tough after what happened in Wentworth. You know, I'm sure some will say, should he have gone after losing the prime ministership? Should, was he the best candidate to put up there in Warringah? Now, no-one was clearly... Um, I don't think they, they, they had the pre-selection meeting and there was an empty chair. We're willing to knock him off, per se, but was it the right thing to do to stick around and contest Warringah, given all this? I could go back to 2009. It would have been a good idea when Malcolm Turnbull lost the leadership. He should have left the parliament mm. as he intended then. I think this would have been a very different decade if Malcolm Turnbull had left when he said he was leaving, rather than stay uh, and keep going in politics. No one has a rear view vision. Uh, Correct. Mira yeah, David. I, so. I think that, uh, as he said, he didn't want to be a quitter. Mm. Um, he's prepared to lose and uh, he's got a thick skin. If, if nothing else can be said about Tony Abbott, the stuff that gets thrown at him, the very personal attacks. Interestingly, Margie was there tonight. I mean, people at home might not know. She couldn't go to the booths today for fear of all the personal attacks. She couldn't vote with her husband no. after 25 years. Uh, great that she was there tonight, great the rest of his family was, and congratulations on an outstanding career. Well, Alan Jones uh, watching there as well. Alan, I guess, you know, plenty of things to ask here. What's next for Tony Abbott? Um, you know, he's plenty of energy there, you can tell. Uh, but what did you make of the way he's bowed out there tonight? Well, sometimes, of course, people... Uh, the real person is often only seen by the public when the wind is in their face. <clears throat> it's very easy for people to perform... Uh, commendably and laudably when the wind's behind them. Uh, he confirmed tonight what I have argued for 25 years. Mm -hmm. This is a remarkable and outstanding Australian. And the choice of words, the delivery tonight, indicated what I have said for a long time. In everything that Tony Abbott has done in public life, he has put the interests of the nation ahead of himself. And that's precisely why he continued to serve. He didn't resign just because he lost the Prime Ministership just because he'd been white-handed and knifed, which he had been from the moment he became Prime Minister, and yet he bears no malice. I've known this man, I've never, ever heard Tony Abbott in any dialogue with me white-hand anybody. He's always maintained a, an optimism, a sense of commitment and a sense of decency. We saw all of those things tonight. That was a very, very tough speech to make, and yet through it all, 
Why was there no emotion? The reason being that the party and the nation have always been to Tony Abbott bigger than the man. And as I said earlier tonight, and I say it again, he would be disappointed at losing, of course, but he believes that the greater interest would be served tonight if the Liberal Party were reaffirmed as the Government of Australia. And so there's a sense of optimism by him that that may yet happen. So uh, the public have seen tonight a remarkable Australian, and I hope they appreciate the nature of that person. He's never, ever been given credit, I don't think, for the qualities he's brought to office. And tonight we've seen in the face of disappointment a sense of dignity and decency for which he's never been given credit, and I think for which many, many Australians will be eternally thankful. Alan, thank you. We need to keep ploughing through what's going on, though, in terms of who's going to be winning government tonight. We'll uh, hear from you later, Alan. I want to go quickly to Boothby in South Australia. This is the uh, seat held by Nicole Flint, margin 2.7% coming into tonight. Now we've got more than a third of the vote count. As you can see there, it's very close indeed, too close to call, uh, based on our projection at the moment. Nicole Flint is with us right now. How confident are you, Nicole Flint, about hanging on there in Boothby tonight? <laughs> Well, Boothby has always been a marginal seat and that's why we have worked so incredibly hard for the past, you know, six months and really the past three years to make sure that we were doing everything to look after my local community here in Boothby. And what about the government's chances more generally, Nicole? I mean, do you think there's a prospect of the coalition holding on to government? Sorry, I didn't quite catch that. It's a little bit noisy here. I've got lots of very excited volunteers. No, look, that, that's all right. Well, I'll let you go and get back to them. Uh, I know they're all anxiously watching the count, so thank you for joining us, and we'll keep an eye on how things are going there in Boothby. Look, uh, Richo, I want to come over to you because you've been going through while we're watching Tony Abbott and so on there. Look, it's, it's very close. What's your feeling right now as to where this is going to land? Well, I still think Labor would be favoured to, to just get there, but it's so close... I'm not, as I said before, not putting the mortgage on it. Um, but it's just so sad which, watching Tony. Um, as, as many people know, he's a great friend of mine, and despite the political divide, and he has been for decades. I didn't just become a mate of his yesterday. Um, and I'm, I, I just wish it hadn't happened. But the fact that it had, just remarkable, that kind of speech... Yep. He is an extraordinary... I hold that thought there, Richo, because he's talking to Chris Kenny. Oh. I can see on the okay. screen there. Let's go to Chris. He's with Tony Abbott right now. Thanks, David. Uh, Tony, you won't have been able to hear it, but Graham Richardson was just telling the nation how sad he was to see your political career end in this way. All the highs and lows you've had over 25 years, you must have thought about it, how it would end. How sad is it for you to end in this way, losing your own seat in your own heartland? Well, I'm not the first uh, person to lose his seat. Uh, obviously, John Howard lost his seat in 2007. Um, Stanley Melbourne Bruce lost his seat back in 1929, I think it was. Um, and at least I didn't lose the seat as PM. Uh, but look, over the years, I've had ups, I've had downs. Uh, I accept that there are good days and bad days in this business. And as I said a moment ago, I'm not going to let one bad day spoil 25 good years. You made a very gracious speech. Richo just noted that. There was one line that stood out for me, though. You said that you would rather be a loser than a quitter. Mm -hmm. Was that a barb at uh, the man who followed you into the Prime Ministership? Well, no, it's the truth. It's the truth. Look, uh, I think that it's important uh, to stand up for the things you believe in, even if it means you lose. Uh, some things are worth losing for. And I thought uh, fighting for the seat that I've represented for 25 years, uh, fighting for the political positions that I've held for 25 years uh, was worth going on with, even though I knew after the Wentworth by-election that it was going to be a very, very tough struggle indeed. What about the campaign that was launched against you? I don't believe Australia's ever seen anything like this before. Get up the independence, no doubt vote about out that. Tony, the C word plastered around your electorate, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the violence last night. Yeah. Is this an ugly and dangerous new phase in Australian politics? Well, there is no doubt that um, there was a massive array of forces. Uh, there was uh, uh, the independence, uh, there was uh, the Greens, the Labor Party and get up. So it was really four against one here in Warringah and all four of them uh, 
Each, four, each of the four are a pretty formidable force, but all four of them together uh, are extraordinarily formidable. Um, I take some solace from the fact that by drawing so many of uh, the forces of the Green left into Oringa, uh, maybe that has made it easier for some of my colleagues to hold on or indeed to win in other parts of Australia. But there was no positive agenda. Their only aim was to get rid of you. You were the target as the leading conservative in the Australian politics in many ways. Uh, even the Vote Tony Out mob preferenced um, Fraser Ennings' representative ahead of you. I, I just don't think that we're seeing that sort of negative campaigning this country ever before? Look, there is, there is absolutely no doubt that it was very personal, it was often nasty, and occasionally it was vile. Um, and look, it was successful, but on the other hand, however much disappointment there might be about the result in Moringa, there should be great satisfaction about what seems to be the national result. And as I say, uh, if we continue to have good, steady government in Canberra, courtesy of the coalition. Uh, the loss of the seat of Oringa is, may I say, a small price to pay. Two last questions before we let you go. Firstly, that national result, what do you believe it says about the issue of climate change above all others and the state of Australian politics? Well, as I said a moment ago, where climate change is a moral issue, it's a problem for us. Where climate change is an economic issue, I actually think it works to our benefit. And in all of the seats that have swung, and it seems swung strongly uh, to the coalition tonight, they're battler seats where people are much more interested uh, in their cost of living than they are in some hypothetical argument about what might happen uh, globally uh, in many decades' time. I also want to ask you if you have any idea at this stage what next? No, uh, uh, other than uh, quite a few days surfing, uh, next week and I suspect availability to do hazard reduction burns and generally turn out for the local fire brigade. Maybe tidy up the back end. There is one, I yeah. lied, but one yeah. more question. Is there something, what would you like to say to the people of Australia tonight as you, your political career ends, both to those who have been great supporters of mm -hmm. yours and the haters? Well, thank you. Thank you. Because to represent the people in the parliament is a wonderful honour to have been a party leader for six years and a Prime Minister for two years. That's an extraordinary privilege and I am forever grateful. Tony Abbott, thanks so much for joining okay, us. Thanks, mate. Good on you. Thank you. Tony Abbott there, David Spears, uh, amazingly philosophical at the end of his 25-year political career. Back to you. Indeed, uh, Chris Kenny, well done. Thank you very much for that. And uh, uh, quite a perceptive comment we might dig into perhaps a little later on from Tony Abbott in the speech he gave earlier that working seats are going the Conservatives' way. Wealthy seats are not, are going to the Green left. Pretty much my column tomorrow, right. David. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Might, might tease that out a little later. Right now, as Ali Stegall is about to give a victory speech, being introduced by James Matheson, who stood there, was it last, last time around, last election? Uh, yes. As an independent. Let's have a listen.
everyone. I know I'm gonna sound croaky, but what a day. <laughs> It is so humbling. I can't begin to tell you. Um, what a day. Look, this day started this morning. Uh, we've had a tour of so many booths around Warringah, and it has been so uplifting uh, hearing from everybody, all of you who have been manning the booths and out there in this electorate. Non voted for the future. Yeah. And you all show that when communities want change, yeah. they make it happen. Yeah. This is a win for moderates with a heart. Yeah. We've had over 1,400 volunteers, many of you here tonight. We've had a presence all over Warringah. Every corner, every fun run, we've done some swims, community events, on the spit, waving our flags. We have definitely turned Warringah turquoise. I would like to pay tribute to Tony Abbott, who has been a dedicated and long-serving local member. Nobody, nobody can doubt his community spirit, his work ethic, and his contribution to this con <laughs> and his contribution to this community. And I wish him well. Yeah. Yeah. Warringah, we have a new beginning for our environment. Climate change has nothing to do with price. <laughs> I will be a climate leader for you. government to account and make sure we take action on climate change. I will push for real action so our children and generations to come, they can enjoy the environment and our beautiful beaches and our beautiful country the way we enjoy it. This is also an opportunity for a new beginning in Australian politics. Yeah. It is a beginning for, uh, for honesty. Yeah. And yeah. Yes. 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 No on Murdoch Press. <laughs> Respect in government. Yeah. We are all we all benefit from the diversity of opinions, but we must all respect one another. And we must treat everyone, no matter what our backgrounds, our gender or sexual preferences. Yes! Fight against corruption. Yes! And vested interest in politics. Yes! Warringah, I pledge that I will represent your views and your concerns and your needs. I will work collaboratively with all sides of politics so that we can achieve results and we can focus on the future 
and a positive discourse for the generations to come. Thank you. leave Zali Stegall there because we're of course still in the middle of the count we've got a lot to get through in the seat count right now but I'm going to be a climate leader Zali Stegall says there what will be interesting is if we do end up with a hung parliament all these questions she's copped other independent candidates as well so which way they go will come right into play would she be willing to back a coalition or a Labor minority government we're not there yet but certainly things are very very tight indeed I want to go back up to Queensland this is the seat of Dawson George Christensen's seat you can see there his primary votes up just a touch to 42, nearly 43%. The Labor votes really come off 13%, and there was a strong One Nation vote there as well after preferences. He's easily won this, the swing to him, in fact. And George Christensen's with us now. A very good evening to you. Thanks for your time. Congratulations on your win there in Dawson. What do you put it down to, George Christensen? Well, we're not declaring yet because the votes are still being counted, but I've got to say that the Labor primary, uh, slumping to about 20%, is a clear sign that people are just rejecting this view uh, that these green preferences and all these green activists should be put ahead of local jobs and local workers, particularly in the coal sector up here. And I think it's a clear message to the Federal Labor Party, but also a clear message to the Queensland Labor Government that if you want to retain your seats here, which were once safe throughout regional Queensland, places like Mackay, places like Rock Rockhampton, you've got to put workers first. You know, don't sell them out to cheap green preferences in the cities. That's what people are sick of up here. Yeah, yeah. 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 And let me ask you one more, George Christensen. If the government is returned, if you hold on to government, what would be your message to Scott Morrison about those very issues you mentioned there, the need for coal-fired power in particular there in North Queensland? Yeah. Well, I think that's what the people want here. They want to see uh, mines continue because it creates local jobs and they want to see us back in our traditional industries like coal mining. And, you know, we had a policy of providing $10 million to basically get a coal-fired power station in Collinsville to bankability stage so that private investors could come in and build the thing. That's what people want to see. They want to see dams, they want to see coal-fired power stations, they want to see more support for the mining industry because it's all about local jobs throughout mm -hmm. central and north Queensland. Yeah. Uh, you know, they're for local jobs. They're against selling out the cheap green boats right. as Labor continue to do. And this is a message to them. When you, when you vote plummets to 20% in what was a marginal seat, and they got, you know, they, they got 30-something uh, uh, percent last time round. This is a 12% uh, slump. Uh, it's a clear message, and it's got. I'll tell you, it'd probably be shivers uh, down Anastasia Palaszczuk's back, and shivers amongst some of the state MPs' backs here. Who are in comfortable seats, but not comfortable anymore. People like Julianne Gilbert, the member for Rockhampton, <laughs> as well. They're going to be very worried tonight. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much for joining us. Let's keep moving. We'll go to the Liberal HQ in Sydney, where Laura Jays and Paul Murray are standing by. Uh, look, this is still right up in the air at the moment, Laura, but uh, what are you picking up? Extraordinary results. So you look at the primary vote on the current count nationwide. The Liberals are on 40% primary. The Labor Party is on 34%. The biggest swings against Labor, of course, have been in Queensland. A huge collapse in their uh, primary vote, but it's been in that over 65 age group. So franking credits, the so-called retirees tax has hurt them in Queensland. Also some of those uh, New South Wales seats as well. I'm hearing from Labor. Their only path to victory now is that they need to pick up one or two more seats in Victoria that's not in the win column already. They need Boothby. Oh, it's not, Boothby, yeah, it's going to come down to Boothby in Adelaide, in South Australia, but also all eyes on Western Australia. They cannot win there without at least two, one or two seats in WA. And that's where the story is good for the Liberals. The first numbers are back from Western Australia and it shows that the Labor vote is off. It is off by about 4%. It's still because of the time difference very early, very early, the earliest of numbers, pre-poll, all of that. But if the path that was the highway has become a footpath at this stage for the Labor Party, WA has to be doing better than that. The icing on the cake potentially for Scott Morrison here is to see what's going to happen in Lingiari yep. in the Northern Territory. But as we have talked about a couple of times this evening, and if this happens to end up as a minority government or, well the impossible uh, that people were talking about even a couple of hours ago of an outright victory for Scott Morrison. Preference discipline has mattered. Yeah. About 6% in Queensland is Palmer and Hanson. 
They are running still below the Greens, but for the first time in modern Australian political history, the right is showing discipline with its minor party vote as the left has with the Greens. Put that together with a 40%, and we've said it all the way through, they can't win without a four in front of it. Yeah, and One Nation is ahead in WA on those early numbers that we've looked at. Another seat to uh, look closely at, as Paul said, the seat of Lingiari. Uh, I can tell you, though, in the last half an hour, the Liberals aren't even writing off Kerangamite. Uh, there have been a huge uh, dump of pre-poll votes. It's not quite enough for Sarah Henderson just yet. But those pre-polls are going 44% her way on the current count. Board. And that, in many ways, is what will continue to spook the room, what will continue to spook the analysts, and no doubt the carpet that is being worn out somewhere in this hotel by the <laughs> Prime Minister uh, or his office just is he across watching, the road. Paul? Do you think he's watching? Well, I don't know. Is that, it too hard to watch? It might be a bit too hard to watch at this stage, is what I understand. It may be the case, but I think you might be able to hear it from the from the other room at this stage. We'll see. Paul, Laura, thank you very much. Let's go to the Labor headquarters in Melbourne where Kieran Gilbert, Nick Rees are standing by. It still looks very sombre where you are, boys. Yeah, well, uh, 26 years ago, John Hewson lost the uh, unlosable election and I feel like I might be in a bit of, you know, history repeating itself, but this time on a, the Labor Party brand because it feels like... They're, they're shell-shocked. They, they thought they were going to win. Very optimistic at the start of the night. And now, silence. It's basically silence in this room. Yeah, I mean, the shell shock, it's disbelief. Uh, it's a very sombre mood here. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think uh, there's been some wins in Victoria, uh, but uh, Labor has gone backwards in seats it picked up in 2016. Why is, like why is like Labor Braden. so bad in Queensland? I mean, the, the, the numbers in Queensland are horrendous. And obviously no published poll picked it up. Look, I think the One Nation and United Australia Party vote has been a big factor. I mean, you look at a seat like Longman, where Susan Lamb, is her, her primary's off less than 2%, but the One Nation and uh, Palmer vote is up 6.5%, and that is flowing through to the coalition. It looks like uh, those voters on the right are uh, following the How to Vote cards, uh, showing a voting discipline, if you like, that... We haven't seen in previous elections. Those voters have tended to go every which way, uh, but this time they do look like those preferences are follow following through, flowing through to the LNP, and that is delivering uh, uh, seats to the LNP in Queensland. Very uh, sombre crowd here, and uh, at the launch the other day in Brisbane, the Labor launch, I said that Ford would go to Labor. I was reprimanded by the Finance Minister, Matthias Cormann, and, uh, well, you've been proven to be right, Senator Cormann. <laughs> we'll take that up with him, Kieran. Nick, thank you very much for that. Well, as mentioned there, a lot of this is now going to come down to Western Australia. Let's check out some seats there. This is Christian Porter's seat of Pearce. And you can see there, we've only got 7.5% of the vote counted there in, the, in this West Australian seat. Christian Porter's vote's down a bit, but the Labor vote's down about twice as much and the Greens vote's down. Where is it going? One Nation. 9% of the vote there they've picked up. And you think a lot of that is going to go right back to Christian Porter. And how does he look at the moment? Well, uh, pretty comfortable. It says too close to call because it's only 1.5% of the count there. But right now, he's in a pretty good position, as you can see. We might check out some of the other West Australian seats after Pierce. Um, perhaps let's, uh, let's have a look at Hasluck. This was a more hopeful one for Labor. 2.1% the margin for Ken Wyatt. We've got 6% of the vote count there now. His vote is down nearly 2%. The Labor vote's down as well. The Greens vote's down. And once again, uh, I just missed it on the primary vote there, but was it a One Nation um, pick-up uh, there that's, that's, uh, that's got, collecting I those think votes? You, you, Western Australia is the most like Queensland. And the One Nation vote and the, the Palmer vote uh, have hit us very hard in, West, in uh, Queensland. And on the very early figures, it looks like doing the same. Very early figures, but it looks like doing the same at the moment in Western Australia. What about Swan? Can we check out Swan and see whether that's any better for Labor there? Swan now 3% of the vote count, so not much. Hannah Beasley, Kim Beasley's daughter. Uh, a bit better in terms of the swing to her and the swing away from the Liberals. This will be but a 47.5% primary vote there for Steve Irons. You'd think he'd be all right. Too early to call. There's very, very few votes in that two-party count. But, but look, none of the West Australian numbers look very good to me early. They're, they're all pretty grim. So if Stephen's right, Western Australia is going to mirror Queensland to a degree. Uh, Labor can't exactly hold their breath there, Richard Miles, to win government in the West. Yeah, I, I certainly think WA is critical 
in terms of the pathway. And and, um, and Ali could be in trouble. Oh, and Ali it. might lose that. I'm less than got the green primary vote. I know the green just on ten percent right. there. So, yeah. but uh, yeah, I mean WA is clearly a critical part of this, and yeah. and Queensland. traditionally WA has been like Queensland. That's true. What's gone wrong, Richard Miles? Uh, look, I think. Um, there's no doubt that the preference deal with um, uh, with Palmer has hurt us significantly, um, and, and that's clearly the case in uh, Queensland. Um, it doesn't as, explain Labor's primary vote dropping like it is, though. Well, as I said, I mean, I said at the start, I thought this was going to be close, and I, I said I thought we were trying to do a difficult thing, which was to, you know, put a very significant agenda in front of the Australian people. And are voters in Queensland rejecting that agenda? Well, I, th I mean, there's clearly been a very significant scare campaign um, in relation to it. But oh, I also think, but, at but it just and yeah. But I also think you know, there's a little way to go here. Um, no, it's, look, it's not over yet. But let's go to Northern Territory because this. Hopefully, we've got some updated yeah, numbers I've on Lingiari, Lingiari and Solomon. So Lingiari is the, uh, the the seat covering the bulk of the the territory, and that's a big movement. Yeah, Jacinda Price, that swing to the CLP there. Seven and a half percent on the primary vote, and um, it is the case though that every election Snowden's behind early every yeah, yeah. election, and then he wins. Yeah. Every election, you watch. Cor correct, because the outlying areas yeah. start to come yeah, in. No. I accept that, but it's not often he's had an Indigenous candidate and someone who has, uh, you know, if I go back to when she was uh, elected as a councillor in Alice Springs, she got the, the proportion of vote that would get two people on the council. So she's got a hugely uh, strong presence in, in Alice Springs. Yeah, Luke Gosling's looking safer there in Solomon, obviously. Yeah, that's right. Um, but Lingiari will be worth keeping an eye on. Um, but, I mean, what, what explains the Liberal Party, the coalition vote being two points higher than News Poll, Labor's vote being 3% down, Ipsos was closer to Labor's primary... Do we have any of those poll? national uh, votes at the moment, the primary votes across the country right now? No, there's still a fair bit of counting to go in WA, but just a point Stephen's making here, if we could bring up something that shows us, please, the primary vote nationwide right now for the major parties. Someone just let me know if we can do that. And OK, it is coming. Uh, there we go. So the um, coalition... Yeah, you're right. The coalition primary vote's above 40% right now. That was not reflected in any of the polls. I don't think they got above no. 39. Ips nope. And Ipsos got... And yeah, Labor didn't vote much closer. Yeah, Ipsos had you at 33. 30, and uh, Labor 34, I think. 34, OK. 33, 34. But I think News Poll had you at 37. And, and Ipsos's analysis of the pre-poll was that there was a 53, 47 pre-poll lean nationally to That's the right. Conservatives. That's right. Uh, so if they were right on that, then... Which they appear to be. And here's the two-party preferred count with 37% of that counted. And Which you can is see there. basically a reverse... Of where news yeah, polls. What the news polls show. Yeah. yeah, correct. But I think, go back to Not your to one before, that, you can uh, see the, the national, say, One Nation vote at 2%, Clive Palmer at 2%, that that belies the impact that they have yeah, in particular seats when they're 15 and, and we're 10s. seeing it exactly yeah. 10s and 15s. So, so to then borrow from Alan Jones, it's you've got to win the seats. I mean, at the moment, we think the Libs are ahead in a doubtful of Robertson. We think Solomon is OK. We think we're still uh, favoured in Chisholm. Uh, in the too close to call, Gilmore is leaning our way. Bass is absolutely 50-50. Blair, we think, has come back to us. Longman clearly... Well, have a look at this, Stephen Connor. He's leaning. Yeah, we're looking at the state of the thing, uh, the parties right now. Coalition's on 66. They've got to get to 76. Labor's only on 56. There's 24 undecided. Can I just ask everyone on the panel, is it possible for Labor to even get a majority government here right now? I can't see it. Oh, I, I can't so see Labor Boothby, getting majority. Boothby, we think we're now leaning ahead. Uh, and Macquarie, we're marginally behind. Well, Stephen, do you think Labor can get a majority government? Until we see some more Western Australian results, it's too early to call. Yeah. Richard, what, what do you think? Is it majority <laughs> Labor? Just saying good night to Darcy. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> good night, Darcy. <laughs> He's done well. Um, you give him a wave. What do you think? Can Labor get a majority government? No. Can't see it. Just can't see it. Not on these numbers. So, so the uh, best Labor can now hope for, Richard, you reckon? Minority government. It's the, government. the best Labor can hope for. This uh, has not been a great night for Labor. Uh, certainly a long way short of where most of us thought it might have been. And um, I just personally can't see how we get a majority. Richard Maybe Mars. Richard's got a, got a plan. 
<laughs> no, no, I thought, look, I think it's close. I, and I, I, it's, it's what I said at the very start. Um, I mean, my, my, my working assumption was that if we were fighting in Krangamite, we were fighting everywhere. Um, and, uh, and that's what it looks like. Um, and your, yeah, your pessimism is borne out in, in yeah. the results. Well, I, I, well but, but, but do you I think still, a majority is possible? Oh, I, th I think I, 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 the reality is I think right now a majority for both sides looks uh, difficult. I mean, I think that's, that's the reality of where we're at. But we've got to see more of WA. Yeah, uh, these are the cliffhangers right now. And then, of course, WA on top of that. So Bass in Tasmania. These are the ones we may not know tonight. Blair in Queensland. Boothby in South Australia. You've got Burt, you've got Chisholm. Uh, there are more on this cliffhanger list. There probably are because, yeah, Karangamite uh, is still up in the air. Cowan, Dobell, Eden Monaro and Hunter. Hunter. Let's have a look at Hunter. I hadn't checked in on Hunter. Can we go to the seat of Hunter? And on that list goes of cliffhangers. There's just so many of them. So, um, Hunter, Joel Fitzgibbon's seat. Look at the swing against him in uh, coal mining heartland of New South Wales. 14.5%. Yeah. Wow. Look, at the, look like... at the green swing too. The Greens, yeah, down a, down a touch there. A but bit. that One Nation vote at 21.5%. 21.5% One Nation vote there in Hunter. So it's basically gone, that uh, Labor vote. It's gone straight to One Nation. Richo, are you amazed That's, at that? Yeah, and I'm, I'm being amazed that that was the result too. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I think some of the computer numbers at the moment are looking a little odd. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, Joel's in some strife there, which is... Pretty amazing, but of course coal is a big issue, yeah. and Labor has not been exactly pro coal. So, what does this do for Labor? Win or lose here, Richo? Looking at what's happening in Queensland and in coal seats like Hunter, how do they reposition? Well, after every election, you, you attempt to do that, um, but uh, it's hard to reposition on on renewables and all the rest of it because we've we've gone down that track so far, so long. Um, I think that uh, turning around and reversing would look pretty strange. Um, mind you, I think I'd do a bit of it if I was uh, in the leadership position because I, I think we've gone too far. The I think we're better off admitting it. Too far too quickly. It. That's been your argument for yeah. a long time. Too far too quickly. And the danger out of this is that people will look at the result in, say, a Warringah and read it through the prism of climate change when, in fact, there's a lot of factors in in there, least of all the demonisation and a 25-year career and all of that. But if you look at the seats in Queensland, if you look at the seats on the Central Coast and you look at Hunter and places like that, you go over into the West, um, people support doing the right thing by the environment, David, but they want it in a way that doesn't cost them jobs and a livelihood for their kids. And I think that's, that was part of the fear in Queensland, I, I would say... Or higher this, power prices. ..at this early stage, yeah. Yeah, look, this is, uh, this is going to have a fascinating impact on that debate around climate change, energy prices, you name it. Um, look, Australia is divided. That's what we're seeing tonight. It really is divided on these issues and uh, no doubt on these tax issues that have been debated through the campaign as well. Um, you know, whether we do need to wind back negative gearing and franken credit tax breaks and all these sorts of things. Uh, it's, it's been a stark choice for voters at this election and right now we're seeing a torn electorate Anyway, the gains for Labor, as you can see there, uh, Dunkley, <coughs> uh, Gilmore as well. Perhaps we should uh, just... And Dunkley was already a Labor seat notionally. It notionally was, was, you're right, a 1%. Yeah. And, and we're a... not giving up on Gilmore yet. Let's have a look at Gilmore. Can we go to that south coast of New South Wales, see how Warren Mundine is going? Or will it be Fiona Phillips? She's at the top of the primary vote count there, as you can see. So we're nearly half the votes counted in Gilmore, and she's sitting on... 38.5% primary The Green vote. vote and the ALP vote. Yeah, yeah. Almost... I reckon it's very hard to see, the, uh, a, to see a, Phillips a, getting beaten, yeah. seriously. Yeah, there's it's... a lot of pre-poll and post votes uh, to come in that seat. That's true. But, but still it's still going to be very hard to see us getting beaten. Yeah, <clears throat> I think so. Anyway, be needing a big change in the... So, so do we, we think we've edged ahead in Boothby? Let's have a look at Boothby. This is in South Australia. Nicole Flint, we spoke to earlier, it was looking very, very close indeed. We've now got 62% of the vote count there. She's sitting on 44.7% primary vote. That's not bad. Uh, and she'd pick up... I don't know, there's not a... Yeah, but then when you put the Greens and the Labor Party yeah. together, that's what's happening there. So I don't know if we'll know that one tonight, will we? Can't possibly yeah. pick that. Mac Macquarie, we, we need to look out and see if it's another potential loss. Right, this is Labor. in the Blue Mountains to the west of Sydney. Uh, the seat of Macquarie, a Labor-held seat. We saw Lindsay go earlier for Labor, the neighbouring seat uh, down at the...
plains at Penrith, but Macquarie up in the mountains. Susan, Susan Templeman uh, sitting on 39% of the primary vote. I don't know if we'll know that one tonight either, but she's clinging on there. And we should check Bass and see how Bass is going. Yeah. All right. Well, let's go back down to Tasmania. Labor's lost the seat of Braddon in the west coast, but of the northeast of Tasmania, Bass now with 80% of the vote count. Ross Hart has uh, lost 5.5% of the primary vote there. He's now sitting on just under 35%. The Liberal vote has gone up 4% to 42 and We're narrowly ahead. Very tight. And uh, can we have another look at Wentworth? That's a good idea. Let's go back up to the eastern suburbs of Sydney. Wentworth, Karen Phelps v Dave Sharma. So has that come down a touch there for just Dave Sharma? Yeah, down, a, down a percent. 46.7%. And Karen Phelps sitting on 34 again. I don't know if we'll find out this one tonight. That doesn't get much closer than that. Yeah, still hanging in there. Uh, Some of the Victorian ones. Higgins. Yep. OK, well, let's go back to Victoria while we... Uh, where are we? OK, Victoria. We want to see Chisholm, we want to see Casey, mm -hmm. and we want to see Flinders and Higgins. So Higgins starting with Higgins, now. we've now got getting up to nearly half the votes counted. Paddy Allen holding up 45% primary vote there, but a big swing for Fiona McLeod. I don't know if we'll find that one out tonight. No. Uh, let's have a look at... Casey. Chisholm first. Thanks. Chisholm, held by the Liberals, 2.9% when Julia Banks won it last time around. Gladys Liu now <coughs> down 4.5%, and that's looking better, more comfortable for Labor, you'd think. Yep. I need, you, you need to win that one, mate. Eh? We definitely need to win that one. Uh, Casey... Tony Smith's seat, the Speaker of the House. I think he's... Uh... Swing against him, only 3%. He's got a margin of, what is it, 4.5%. And how does that look now? He's clinging on there. Mm -hmm. It says a Liberal hold. Yep. And Flinders for Greg Hunt. A bigger margin there, 7% for him. And right now you can see the swing against him on the primary vote's about 7%. Gee, I don't know if we'll find that one out tonight either. That's Well, it says Liberal hold. And Would like, you, I'm just uh, looking at seats in Western Australia, Swan, Hazelak, Sterling, yeah. they're all looking good for us. Yeah, OK. We're, we're not at that trend we talked about, possibly. So what are you winning in Victoria there, Stephen Connery? Are you winning Dunkley? Uh, well, depending on your, your definition, but Dunkley was in our column, uh, Karangamite in our column. Is that Karangamite? Uh, Karangamite, yeah, well, yeah, well, yeah, people have argued it's, it's 0. 0.0 or 0. 0.001, yeah, 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 yeah. but... Uh, and Chisholm seemed to be there. Latrobe, uh, I don't think yeah, it's being called the other way. Uh, and Casey, as you saw, is none, close. None of them are a clear win, though. No, no, no. We're no, all no, no. We're not saying that. Yep. No, yeah. yeah, and this was Latrobe. Yeah, Jason Wood um, has increased his primary vote there. Yep. Yeah, you'd be so, all right. Plus both One Nation can. preferences as well. Let's see what that looks like after preferences. He'll, do you think he'll hold that? I think he'll hold it. I, I would want to be ahead uh, you just before, before pre-polls and postals. Which means at the moment you're only gaining two in Victoria, is that right? And then there's a few that are on, on the night. And then Chisholm and then you've got Higgins and Flinders are both yeah, no, we've got very close. Potentially a couple. I think we'll win three. But anyway, we'll see. But it's not enough. But that's not going to be like in WA. In I, in I'm getting Queen's intel Maine. out of WA agreeing with Cormand. Uh, so yes, Conroy. <laughs> at the moment, at the moment, moment uh, <laughs> at the moment, it's both sides. Neither side is likely to have a majority tonight that they can claim confidently. That's right. But I think mean, that's right. Uh, but we. Uh, it means that we have the struggles of the world have got more power, doesn't it? Uh, Amazing. God help us. So no, we well, got they, Bob Catter. Maybe God help us, but it's a fact. Yeah, no, you're right. You're right. So who have we got on the cross we bench? We Bob Catter. Bob Catter. Andrew Wilkie. Bant. Zali Stegall. Adam Bant. Bant. Uh, uh, the girl in South Sharkey. Australia. Um, uh, Rebecca, Rebecca Sharkey. Rebecca Sharkey. And then um, Indi. Indi. What's the latest in Indi? Let's have a look at Indi. Indi. Too close to call last time. I think we looked at it. Yeah, I think Steve Martin. Yeah, look at his vote's gone up seven percent. The primary vote. 35% uh, he's sitting on there, and the Nationals' preferences will help him. <clears throat> Let's see after preferences how Indi it looks. Well, back ahead. OK, well, maybe another crossbench. I, I just make a point, because yeah. uh, 
It's been given a note, um, uh, and this is from uh, Kayla Manane, the party secretary, who knows a bit about these things. Um, she says there are double-digit swings in booths that have high 65-plus voters. They've just left the ALP. So, obviously, franking, um, credits. franking credits has hurt us badly, and uh, it means that uh, we lost Woi Woi for the first time pre-poll. I mean, people are doing what wow. Chris Bowen told them to do, though. And Chris Bowen said, if you don't like it, don't vote for us. Yeah, well, we've, we're losing all those powered battlers, the, the tradies but, and but the... You've allowed a coalition, this is the problem with that, that raft of policies, you've allowed a coalition of people to band together, whether it was negative gearing, whether it was franking credits, uh, whether it was young people being told the other day, don't worry if you go into negative equity. Um, they've all sort of coalesced. There was plenty of reasons to find vote away from Labor in this election. It wasn't one single issue. No, well, I would have thought that the negative gearing decision was courageous. Sir Humphrey. Um, yeah, maybe Chris Bowen better stay under the table for tomorrow and the next day as well. Like he was absent in most of the campaign. Did you get him on, David? Did uh, I did him? not succeed on that front. Uh, anyway, we'll see what happens. You weren't tomorrow. Robinson Crusoe, no. though, were you? <laughs> no, uh, look, uh, Stephen Conroy... Um, managed to interview Chris Bowen, though, so we can't say he did no interviews during the, um, <laughs> during the election campaign. Uh, look, uh, this right now, though, you've got to say is a bit of a shocker here for Labor. The chances of a majority government do seem to have slipped away. The best they can hope for a minority government, and we were just counting there, five, maybe six on the crossbench. Um, look, they pick up Andrew Wilkie and Adam Bant. Uh, I don't know about Zali Stegall. I really don't. Uh, you know, which way she go? She's indicated... Coalition would be her first choice, but climate change is her biggest issue. So uh, I just don't know. E either way, if it's if it's a hung parliament and a minority government led by Bill Shorten, uh, he's going to have to try and negotiate the passage through the House, let alone the Senate, of all these things, franking credits, negative gearing and so on. Good luck with that, given these independents that have made it very clear where they stand on these things. There goes your revenue. So much for the spending measures. I just think, Richo, yes. this is... Um, even if you don't scrape through a minority government, this is going to be game. No, it's, it's, it's tough. And, and you look at Zali Stegall, I mean, look at what she's got to balance. Um, for, she's, she's got the Labor vote on side because it, it was anti-Abbott. Um, she's got the, all these climate change believers um, on board. Um, but if she, if she takes one step in this, this conservative direction that she says, you know, I'm a Liberal, well... Mm. She'll lose all those Labor voters that got her up. Let me just quickly, sorry, Peter, go back to Chisholm, the seat uh, we've been looking at in Melbourne. In the eastern suburbs there, uh, one last time by Julia Banks, but this time around, Gladys Liu has dropped 4.5% of the Liberal primary vote there. A little bit has gone to Labor, a little bit has gone to the Greens, and right now it's looking it's too close. Jennifer Yang for Labor, though, has... That's crept, her nose that's crept in, in from 52 to 50, yeah. 51. Well, Jennifer Yang's with us now. Thanks for your time this evening. Uh, are you feeling confident about picking up this seat? Uh, I think the result looking quite optimistic. Uh, however, still too close to call, so... Uh, I don't know. I'm just waiting for the result. <laughs> no, fair enough. What can you tell us about how some of Labor's policies worked through the campaign for you? Did you struggle to sell things like the franking credit and the negative gearing changes? Uh, certainly, I think we have a lot of people uh, come uh, asking the question about the franking credits and the negative gearings. However, a lot of people who raise this concern, they actually got uh, probably uh, misinformed the information. Uh, so if I get a chance at this, I... I'm able to uh, describe to them what the actual reform Labor proposed, uh, but unfortunately we, not, we are unable to reach to every and each voters who perhaps only believe into the wrong information. And finally, would you say Bill Shorten uh, was a popular leader for you to uh, campaign with? I think Bill is pretty uh, well received when he came down to uh, Box Hill. Uh, I walked around with Bill a few times in Box Hill Central and everyone's crazy, want to take a photo with him and certainly I hope Bill will come, come back. <laughs> All right, Jennifer Yang, thanks for joining us. We'll keep an eye on how things go there in Chisholm for you. Let's go right up to 
The north of the continent, the seat of Lingiari that sprawls across the Northern Territory. And uh, this one we've been, well, seeing the numbers bounce around a little bit, it must be said. We've got more than a third of the count in now. And Jacinta Price, the CLP candidate, is still leading comfortably on that primary vote. After preferences, though, it's still too close to call. And Jacinda Price, I think, is uh, with us now. Thanks for your time tonight. You've got a better read of this seat than most of us. Uh, are you feeling more confident than uh, that, that cliffhanger number is showing right now? Alison Anderson! Oh, I'm, I'm, feeling, I'm feeling really, like, the, the confidence is building, that's for sure. It's been really, really nerve-wracking. And I've got a hell of a lot of very excited people behind me at the moment. And, and um, trying to keep them contained is, being, is a bit of a challenge. But look, um, it, it's, it's, looking, it's looking promising. So I'm, I'm really quite, well, not quietly confident. I'm, I'm confident. <laughs> look, I can understand why, given uh, the swing we're seeing towards you. Uh, what's been the, the biggest issues for you in the campaign? So I think some of the biggest issues for me has been, has been that people want jobs, people want stability, people want to stand on their own two feet. Aboriginal people are sick of being treated like they're second-rate citizens. They want, to, they want the same opportunities as, as other Australians. They want to run businesses. They don't want to rely on Centrelink and those sorts of things. And the wider community are the same. You know, in the Northern Territory, we're about coming from different backgrounds and doing things together, and that's really resonated throughout my campaign. Um, but, you know, it's definitely about... It's about jobs, it's about stability, it's about housing... Um, and, and knowing that we can, you know, we can prosper, we can do all those things together. Well, Jacinda Price, thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, it is a very tight contest there. I'll let you get back to uh, seeing how it all plays out. Appreciate that. Let me go back to Melbourne. Andrew Bolt standing by. You've been watching some of the count as it's been going on here, Andrew. Uh, the general consensus here on the desk is that Labor just cannot get a majority government now. Where do you think this is going to land? Well, it's a minority government, uh, like I said uh, last time. Uh, so we've got a period of instability. It's a minority government that has... Whoever wins has uh, doesn't have the numbers in the lower house, doesn't have the numbers in the Senate. And I think uh, we're in for a period of instability for three years, which is really sad. But I do think I'd rather fancy myself... Uh, the liberal. If I was a Liberal, I'd fancy my chances more than if I was a Labor uh, leader, because uh, one person you forgot to mention is one of the crossbenchers that will decide this is, of, of course, Bob Catter. Uh, so add him, and yeah. the Liberals may need maybe one more, and uh, I think they might be able to get it. Uh, a Labor uh, crossbench support will be much broader and much diffi more difficult, because it'll include a Green, for instance. So um, I'd, I'd fancy the Liberals a little bit ahead of Labor at this stage, but either way, it's going to be in uh, unstable. But I have to say, whatever, Scott Morrison has made himself into an instant Liberal hero. This is a feat bigger than Paul Keating pulled off in winning the election against uh, John Hewson. This is just astonishing. And we have to think, well, if the polls weren't completely wrong, if they were halfway in the ballpark, you know, say, you know, in the, when they were taken three days ago or a week ago, you have to think there was also a last-minute swing in this week. And I'm looking at what might have affected that. Two things uh, occur to me. One is the ludicrous attack on Scott Morrison's faith. And if you have a look, it's uh, in the Bible Belt kind of seats, the outer suburban seats, uh, where Labor didn't get the swing it was counting on. That ludicrous attack on Christianity, uh, that is a real marker for Labor. And the other point was, of course, Bob Hawke's death. A lot of people thought, well, that's going to swing the you know, sympathy vote to Labor. I wonder whether, as I said uh, on my show yesterday, people seeing Bob Hawke there and then Bill Shorten giving eulogy after eulogy there think, thought, well, Bob Sh Bob, uh, Bill Shorten is no Bob Hawke. Uh, I think that really could have come through as well. But fundamentally, I want to go back to the conversation you had before. This was the global warming election. Labor said it. The Greens said it. I think the La Lib uh, Greens vote will probably go down and Labor has been humiliated. The Labor vote went down or it didn't pick up like they'd counted on in exactly the seats like... In, our, in Queensland, where they knew that the cost of Labor's global warming folly was the Adani coal mine. By the way, all those Adani protesters with all their signs over all these years, you lost, suckers. And the other thing is, you look at the other places. They're in poorer suburbs where people can't afford power prices. Labor 
got in thrall to the religion of the upper middle class, a religion that the poor, its natural constituency, cannot afford. It has got to rethink this mad, mad folly. It was a global warming election and they lost. Andrew, well, yeah, hard to argue that um, they've hit the wrong note in so many parts of the country with that. Here's Josh Frydenberg right now, though. He's the Deputy Liberal Leader. He's, of course, not claiming one way or another, I'm sure, which way this has gone. But for his own part, he's held on in Kuyong. Let's just quickly have a listen. And I promise this to the people of Kuyong. Whether they voted for me or not, I will work every single day to make their lives and their family lives better. Yeah. And it was a tight race. And I want to acknowledge the other candidates in the race and particularly Julian Burnside and Jana Stewart. No, no, no. I want to acknowledge... Yeah, and look, Josh Frydenberg there. We'll leave that because we've got to keep moving. But uh, Andrew Bolt, he did face a, a pretty tough contest in his own seat there. Oliver Yates, Julian Burnside. I mean, and yeah, yeah, your pessimism has borne out in, in yeah. the results. Well, I, I, well but, but, but do you I think still... a majority is possible? Oh, I, th I think... I, I, the reality is, I think right now, majority for both sides looks uh, difficult. I mean, I think that's that's the reality of where we're at. But we've got to see more of WA. Yeah, these uh, are the cliffhangers right now, and then of course WA on top of that. So Bass in Tasmania, these are the ones we may not know tonight. Blair in Queensland, Boothby in South Australia. You got Bert, you got Chisholm. Uh, are there more on this cliffhanger list? There probably are because yeah, Karangamite uh, is still up in the air. Cowan. So Bell, Eden Monaro and Hunter. Hunter. Let's have a look at Hunter. I haven't checked in on Hunter. Can we go to the seat of Hunter? And on that list goes of cliffhangers. There's just so many of them. So um, Hunter, Joel Fitzgibbon's seat. Look at the swing against him in the uh, coal mining heartland of New South Wales. 14.5%. Yeah. Wow. Look, at the, look like. at the green swing too. The green's, yeah, down a, down a touch it's there. A but bit... that One Nation vote at 21.5%. 21.5% One Nation vote there in Hunter. So it's basically gone, that uh, Labor vote. It's gone straight to One Nation. Richo, are you amazed That's, at that? Yeah, and I'm, I'm being amazed that that was the result too. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I think some of the computer numbers at the moment are looking a little odd. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, Joel's in some strife there, which is pretty amazing. But, of course, coal is a big issue. Yeah. And Labor has not been exactly pro-coal. So what does this do... For Labor, win or lose here, Richo. Looking at what's happening in Queensland and in coal seats like Hunter, how do they reposition? Well, after every election, you, you attempt to do that, um, but uh, it's hard to reposition on on renewables and all the rest of it because we've we've gone down that track so far, so long. Um, I think that uh, turning around and reversing would look pretty strange, um, mind you. I think I'd do a bit of it if I was. Uh, in the leadership position, because I, I think we've gone too far. I think we're better off admitting it. Too far too quickly. It. That's been your argument for yeah. a long time. Too far too quickly. And the danger out of this is that people will look at the result in, say, a Warringah and read it through the prism of climate change, when, in fact, there's a lot of factors in, in mm. there, least of all the demonisation and a 25-year career and all of that. But if you look at the seats in Queensland, if you look at the seats on the central coast and you look at Hunter and places like that, you go over into the west... Um, People support doing the right thing by the environment, David, but they want it in a way that doesn't cost them jobs and a livelihood for their kids. And I think that's, that was part of the fear in Queensland, I, w I would say... Or higher this, power prices. At this early stage, yeah. Yeah, look, this is, uh, this is going to have a fascinating impact on that debate around climate change, energy prices, you name it. Um, look, Australia is divided. That's what we're seeing tonight. It really is divided on these issues and uh, no doubt on these tax issues that have been debated through the campaign as well. Um, you know, whether we do need to wind back negative gearing and franking credit tax breaks and all these sorts of things. Uh, it's, it's been a stark choice for voters at this election and right now we're seeing a torn electorate. Anyway, the gains for Labor, as you can see there, uh, Dunkley, <coughs> uh, 
uh, Gilmore as well. Perhaps we should uh, just... But, and Dunkley was already a Labour seat notionally. Yeah, notionally was, you're right, a 1%. Yeah. And, and we're not giving up on Gilmore yet. Let's have a look at Gilmore. Can we go to that south coast of New South Wales, see how Warren Mundine is going? Or will it be? Fiona Phillips, she's at the top of the primary vote count there, as you can see. So we're nearly half the votes counted in Gilmore, and she's sitting on... 38.5% primary. The Green vote right? and the ALP vote. Yeah, yeah. I reckon it's very hard to see, uh, a, to see a, Phillips getting beaten, yeah. seriously. Yeah, there's it's a lot of pre poll and postals uh, to come in that seat. That's true. But, but it's still going to be very hard to see us getting beaten. Yeah, <clears throat> I think so. Anyway, be needing a big change in the. So, do we, we think we've edged ahead in Boothby? Let's have a look at Boothby. This is in South Australia. Nicole Flint, we spoke to earlier, it was looking very, very close indeed. We've now got 62% of the vote count there. She's sitting on 44.7% primary vote. That's not bad. Uh, and she'd pick up, I don't know, there's not a... Yeah, but then when you put the Greens and the Labor Party yeah. together, that's what's happening there. So I don't know if we'll know that one tonight, will we? Can't no, possibly yeah. pick that. Mac Macquarie, we, we need to look at, see if it's another potential loss right, This is in Labor. the Blue Mountains to the west of Sydney. Uh, the seat of Macquarie, a Labor-held seat. We saw Lindsay go earlier for Labor, the neighbouring seat uh, down at the plains at Penrith, but Macquarie up in the mountains. Susan, Susan Templeman uh, sitting on 39% of the primary vote. I don't know if we'll know that one tonight either, but she's clinging on there. And we should check Bass and see how Bass is going. Yeah. All right. Well, let's go back down to Tasmania. Labor's lost the seat of Braddon in the west coast, but of the northeast of Tasmania, Bass now with 80% of the vote count. Ross Hart has uh, lost 5.5% of the primary vote there. He's now sitting on just under 35%. The Liberal vote has gone up 4% to 42 and We're narrowly ahead. Very tight. And uh, can we have another look at Wentworth? That's a good idea. Let's go back up to the eastern suburbs of Sydney. Wentworth, Karen Phelps v Dave Sharma. So has that come down a touch there for just Dave a Sharma? Down a, down a percent. 46.7%. And Karen Phelps sitting on 34 again. I don't know if we'll find out this one tonight. That doesn't get much closer than that. Yeah, still hanging in there. Uh, Some of the Victorian ones. Higgins. Yep. OK, well, let's go back to Victoria while we... Uh, where are we? OK, Victoria. We want to see Chisholm, we want to see Casey, mm. and we want to see Flinders and Higgins. So starting with Higgins, now. we've now got... Getting up to nearly half the votes counted. Katie Allen holding up 45% primary vote there, but a big swing for Fiona McLeod. I don't know if we'll find that one out tonight. No. Uh, let's have a look at... Casey? Chisholm first. Okay. Chisholm, held by the Liberals 2.9% when Julia Banks won it last time around. Gladys Liu now <coughs> down 4.5%, and that's looking better, more comfortable for Labor, you'd think. Yep. I need, you, you need to win that one, eh? We definitely need to win that one. Uh, Casey... Tony Smith's seat, the Speaker of the House. I think he's... Uh... Swing against him, only 3%. He's got a margin of, what is it, 4.5%. And how does that look now? He's clinging on there. Mm -hmm. It says a Liberal hold. Yeah. And Flinders for Greg Hunt. A bigger margin there, 7% for him. And right now you can see the swing against him on the primary votes, about 7%. Gee, I don't know if we'll find that one out tonight either. That's Well, it says Liberal hold. And... Would like you, I'm just uh, looking at seats in Western Australia, Swan, Hazlack, Sterling, yeah. they're all looking good for us. Yeah, okay. we're, we're not at that trend we talked about, possibly. So what are you winning in Victoria there, Stephen Connor? Are you winning Dunkley? Uh, well, depending on your, your definition, but Dunkley was in our column, uh, Karangamite in our column. Is that Karangamite? Uh, Karangamite, well, people, well, people have argued it's, it's 0. 0.0 or 0. Yeah, yeah, 0.001, yeah. but... Uh, and Chisholm seemed to be there, Latrobe... Uh, I don't think yeah, I think it's being called the other way. Uh, and Casey, as you saw, is none, close. None of them are a clear win, though. No, no, no. We're no, all no, going to go down that. to the wire. Yep. No, yeah, this and this was a... Latrobe. Yeah, Jason Wood um, has increased his primary vote there. Yep. Yeah, so, right. but both One Nation can. preferences as well. Let's see what that looks like after preferences. And uh, it doesn't look great. Hill, do you think he'll hold that? I think he'll hold it. I, I would want to be ahead uh, say. before before pre-polls and postals. Which means at the moment you're only gaining two in Victoria, is that right? And then there's a few that are on, on the ninth. And then Chisholm and then you've got Higgins and Flinders are both yeah, no, we've got very close. Potentially a couple. I think we'll win three. But anyway, we'll see. 
But it's not enough. That's not going to work. I'm getting in WA. I'm getting intel out of WA agreeing with Cormann. Uh, so yes, Conroy. <laughs> at the moment, that at, moment happen, uh, <laughs> at the moment, it's both sides. Neither side is likely to have a majority tonight that they can claim confidently. That's right. But I think that's right. Uh, but we. Uh, it means that we the Charlie Stingles have got world a lot more power, doesn't it? it means oh, that. God help us. So no, we got they, Bob Catter. Maybe Catter. God help us, but it's a fact. Yeah, you're right, you're right. So who have we got on the cross we bench? Bob yeah. Catter. Bob Catter, Andrew Wilkie. Bant. Zali Stegall, Adam Bant. Bant. Uh, uh, the girl Rebecca in South Sharkey. Australia. Or, um, uh, Rebecca, 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 Rebecca Sharkey. And then um, Indai. What's the latest in Indai? Let's have a look at Indai. Too close to call last time I think we looked at it. Yeah, I think Steve might be. Yeah, look at his vote's yeah. gone up 7%, the primary vote. 35% uh, he's sitting on there, and the Nationals' preferences will help him. <clears throat> Let's see after preferences how in diet looks. Well, back ahead. OK, well, maybe another crossbench. No, I, I'm I just make a point, because yeah. I've been given a note, um, uh, and this is from uh, Kayla Manane, a party secretary, who's... Knows a bit about these things. Um, she says there are double digit swings in booths that have high 65 plus voters. They've just left the ALP. So obviously, um, franking, franking credits has hurt us badly. And uh, it means that uh, we lost Woi Woi for the first time pre poll. I mean, people are doing what wow. Chris Bowen told them to do, though. I mean, Chris Bowen said, if you don't like it, don't vote for us. Yeah, well, we've, we're losing all those. Powered battlers, the, the tradies but, and the... But you, you've allowed a coalition, this is the problem with that, that raft of policies, you've allowed a coalition of people to band together, whether it was negative gearing, whether it was franking credits, um, whether it was young people being told the other day, don't worry if you go into negative equity. Um, they've all sort of coalesced. There was plenty of reasons to find vote away from Labor in this election. It wasn't one single issue. No, well, I would have thought that the negative gearing decision was... Courageous. Sir Humphrey. Um, yeah, maybe Chris Bowen better stay under the table for tomorrow and the next day as well. Like he was absent <laughs> most of the campaign. Did you get him one, David? Uh, I did not succeed on that front. Uh, anyway, we'll see what happens. You weren't now. Robinson Crusoe, no. though, were you? <laughs> no. Uh, look, uh, Stephen Conroy um, managed to interview Chris Bowen, though, so we can't say he did no interviews during the... Um, <laughs> During the election campaign, uh, look, uh, this right now, though, you've got to say is a bit of a shocker here for Labor. The chances of a majority government do seem to have slipped away. The best they can hope for a minority government, and we were just counting there, five, maybe six on the crossbench. Um, look, they pick up Andrew Wilkie and Adam Bant. Uh, I don't know about Zali Stegall. I really don't uh, You know which way she'd go. She's indicated coalition would be her first choice, but climate change is her biggest issue. So... Uh, I just don't know. Either way, if it's, if it's a hung parliament and a minority government led by Bill Shorten, uh, he's going to have to try and negotiate the passage through the House, let alone the Senate, of all these things, franking credits, negative gearing and so on. Good luck with that, given these independents that have made it very clear where they stand on these things. There goes your revenue, so much for the spending measures. I just think, Richard, yes. this is... Um, even if he does scrape through a minority government, this is going to be game... No, it's, it's, it's tough. And, and you look at Zali Stegall, I mean... Look at what she's got to balance. Um, for, she's, she's got the Labor vote on side because it, it was anti-Abbott. Um, she's got the, all these climate change believers um, on board. Um, but if she, if she takes one step in this, this conservative direction that she says, you know, I'm a Liberal, well, mm. she'll lose all those Labor voters that got her up. Let me just quickly, sorry, Peter, go back to Chisholm, the seat uh, we've been looking at in Melbourne. In the eastern suburbs there, uh, one last time by Julia Banks, this time around, Gladys Liu has dropped 4.5% of the Liberal primary vote there. A little bit has gone to Labor, a little bit has gone to the Greens, and right now it's looking it's too close. Jennifer Yang for Labor, though, has... That's crept, no, that's crept in, in from 52 to 50, yeah. 51. Look, Jennifer Yang's with us now. Thanks for your time this evening. Uh, are you feeling confident about picking up this seat? Uh, I think the result looking quite optimistic. Uh, however, still too close to call, so uh, I don't know. I'm just waiting for the result. <laughs> no, fair enough. What can you tell us about how some of Labor's policies 
worked through the campaign for you? Did you struggle to sell things like the franking credit and the negative gearing changes? Uh, certainly, I think we have a lot of people uh, come uh, asking the question about the franking credit and the negative gearings. However, a lot of people who raise this concern, they actually got uh, probably uh, misinformed information. Uh, so if I get a chance, at least I... I'm able to uh, describe to them what the actual reform labor propose, uh, but unfortunately we, not, we are unable to reach to every and each voters who perhaps only believe into the wrong information. And finally, would you say Bill Shorten uh, was a popular leader for you to uh, campaign with? I think Bill is pretty uh, well received when he came down to uh, Box Hill. Uh, I walk around with a Bill a few times in Box Hill Central and everyone's crazy, want to take a photo with him and certainly I hope Bill come come back. <laughs> All right, Jennifer Yang, thanks for joining us. We'll keep an eye on how things go there in Chisholm for you. Let's go right up to the north of the continent, the seat of Lingiari that sprawls across the Northern Territory. And uh, this one we've been, well, seeing the numbers bounce around a little bit, it must be said. We've got more than a third of the count in now. And Jacinta Price, the CLP candidate, is still leading comfortably on that primary vote. After preferences, though, it's still too close to call. And Jacinta Price, I think, is uh, with us now. Thanks for your time tonight. You've got a better read of this seat than most of us. Uh, are you feeling more confident than uh, that... That cliffhanger number is showing right now. Alison Anderson. Oh, I'm, I'm feeling, I'm feeling really like the, the confidence is building. That's for sure. It's been really, really nerve-wracking, and I've got a hell of a lot of very excited people behind me at the moment, and, and I'm trying to keep them contained as being as a bit of a challenge. But look, um, it, it's it's looking, it's looking promising. So I'm, I'm really quite well, not quietly confident. I'm, I'm confident. <laughs> Look, I can understand why, given uh, the swing we're seeing towards you, uh, what's been the, the biggest issues for you in the campaign? So, I think some of the biggest issues for me has been, has been that people want jobs, people want stability, people want to stand on their own two feet. Aboriginal people are sick of being treated like they're second-rate citizens. They want, to, they want the same opportunities as, as other Australians. They want to run businesses. They don't want to rely on Centrelink and those sorts of things. And the wider community are the same. You know, in the Northern Territory, we're about coming from different backgrounds and doing things together, and that's really resonated throughout my campaign. Um, but, you know, it's definitely about... It's about jobs, it's about stability, it's about housing... Um, and, and knowing that we can, you know, we can prosper, we can do all those things together. Well, Jacinda Price, thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, it is a very tight contest there. I'll let you get back to uh, seeing how it all plays out. Appreciate that. Let me go back to Melbourne. Andrew Bolt standing by. You've been watching some of the count as it's been going on here, Andrew. Uh, the general consensus here on the desk is that Labor just cannot get a majority government now. Where do you think this is going to land? Well, it's a minority government, uh, like I said uh, last time. Uh, so we've got a period of instability. It's a minority government that has... Whoever wins has, uh, doesn't have the numbers in the lower house, doesn't have the numbers in the Senate. And I think uh, we're in for a period of instability for three years, which is really sad. But I do think... I'd rather fancy myself... Uh, the Liber if I was a Liberal, I'd fancy my chances more than if I was a Labor uh, leader. Because uh, one person you forgot to mention is one of the crossbenchers that will decide this is, of, of course, Bob Catter. Uh, so add him and yeah. the Liberals may need maybe one more and uh, I think they might be able to get it. Uh, a Labor uh, crossbench support will be much broader and much diff more difficult because it will include a Green, for instance. So um, I'd, I'd fancy the Liberals a little bit ahead of Labor at this stage, but either way it's going to be unstable. But I have to say, whatever, Scott Morrison has made himself into an instant Liberal hero. This is a feat bigger than Paul Keating pulled off in winning the election against uh, John Hewson. This is just astonishing. And we have to think, well, if the polls weren't completely wrong, if they were halfway in the ballpark, you know, say, you know, in the, when they were taken three days ago or a week ago, you have to think there was also a last-minute swing in this week. And I'm looking at what might have affected that. Two things uh, occur to me. 
One is the ludicrous attack on Scott Morrison's faith. And if you have a look, it's uh, in the Bible Belt kind of seats, the outer suburban seats, uh, where Labor didn't get the swing it was counting on. That ludicrous attack on Christianity, uh, that is a real marker for Labor. And the other point was, of course, Bob Hawke's death. A lot of people thought, well, that's going to swing the you know, sympathy vote to Labor. I wonder whether, as I said uh, on my show yesterday, people seeing Bob Hawke there and then Bill Shorten giving eulogy after eulogy there think, thought, well, Bob Sh uh, Bob, uh, Bill Shorten is no Bob Hawke. Uh, I think that really could have come through as well. But fundamentally, I want to go back to the conversation you had before. This was the global warming election. Labor said it, the Greens said it. I think the La uh, Greens vote will probably go down and Labor has been <coughs> humiliated. The Labor vote went down or it didn't pick up like they'd counted on in exactly the seats like in, our, in Queensland, where they knew that the cost of Labor's global warming folly was the Adani coal mine. By the way, all those Adani protesters with all their signs over all these years, you lost, suckers. And the other thing is, you look at the other places. They're in poorer suburbs where people can't afford power prices. Labor got in thrall to the religion of the upper middle class, a religion that the poor, its natural constituency, cannot afford. It has got to rethink this mad mad folly. It was a global warming election and they lost. Andrew, well, yeah, hard to argue that um, they've hit the wrong note in so many parts of the country with that. Here's Josh Frydenberg right now, though. He's the Deputy Liberal Leader. He's, of course, not claiming one way or another, I'm sure, which way this has gone. But for his own part, he's held on in Kuyong. Let's just quickly have a listen. And I promise this to the people of Kuyong. Whether they voted for me or not, I will work every single day to make their lives and their family lives better. Yeah. And it was a tight race. And I want to acknowledge the other candidates in the race, and particularly Julian Burnside and Jana Stewart. No, no, no. I want to acknowledge... Yeah, and look, Julian Josh Frydenberg there. We'll leave that because we've got to keep moving. But uh, Andrew Bolt, he did face a, a pretty tough contest in his own seat there. Oliver Yates, Julian Burnside. I know the Libs spent a hell of a lot there as well, but this was a pretty uh, tough fight for, you know, someone who's used to holding a blue ribbon seat. Yeah, but uh, this goes to my point, David, too. It was a global warming election. Don't forget also uh, you had Malcolm Turnbull and his son Alex uh, white anting the government on global warming all through this campaign, right? All through... Th to the point where Alex, in the name of Malcolm Turnbull... Hi, I'm Alex, Malcolm Turnbull's son, was giving robocalls uh, in, in Greg Hunt's seat of Flinders to, to try and turf him out and also in, in uh, Menzies, uh, Kevin Andrews. Every one of those candidates that they backed except for... Uh, uh, Tony Abbott, maybe Nicole Flint, we'll still see. Every one of them won. Peter Dutton in particular. Think of the resources that get up devoted to defeating him. He won. This, this is actually culturally a huge moment. It's not just that Labor lost. It's global warming. The activists, they lost. Now, the Zali Stegall thing, that'll be interpreted, oh, well, you know, the Liberals have got to go and get, treat global warming more seriously because they lost Warringah. But look... They actually pulled an absolute roll gold certain defeat out of the fire in large part because Labor overplayed the global warming scare. And if the Liberals don't realise that, they're in for some hell. If they do realise that, Labor is going to be on the rack. Well, Andrew, thank you. Uh, we'll talk to you a little later on. Appreciate that. In Dixon, uh, I just want to show you Peter Dutton right now. He's claiming victory in his seat uh, in the northwest of Brisbane there. Let's have a quick listen into this. We have, we have an amazing team on the ground. Many of you are here tonight. People are still pre-polling and people are still involved in the scrutineering process, which will go on for some time. But there is... An amazing mood across Queensland and across the country in support of the Prime Minister. And I want to pay tribute to Scott Morrison tonight for his leadership. Yeah. 
I think he's, I think he's provided amazing leadership. He's distilled our message down to one which the Australian people understand. He's been able to campaign in marginal seats. He's been able to put pressure on Bill Shorten, which is what Bill Shorten deserved. He needed to be <laughs> He needed to be called out, and he was. And to Scott Morrison's great credit, right across this great country, he's been able to spread a message of our vision for the future of this country, and people have overwhelmingly accepted that. And it's a great credit to him, to our leadership team, to everybody involved in this campaign. Got to say, that's a very relieved-looking Peter Dutton there, but cheering what appears to be the, well, mood of the nation, uh, particularly there in Queensland. Alan Jones, let me bring you back in there as to where we're at right now. You've got to say the signs are pointing more towards the coalition being back in government right now. I know there's a bit to go in the West, but it's just looking increasingly difficult for Labor. Well, we are where I said we'd be. Um, I said that they couldn't win 76 seats, and they won't. I also have said for two years that no party in the Western world can win an election with a 50% renewable energy target. And Andrew Bolt's point is perfectly correct, and they persisted with this religion, and Peter and I have been involved in election campaigns at the very heart and centre of them. We fought the kind of thing that's being fought tonight. And in the last week of a campaign, the election always turns towards the economy. And in this last week, the focus was on the economic damage that people would suffer under a Labor government. And I made the point early tonight, and I made it last week and the week before, that this election was, was going to be fought on money. Not Clive Palmer's money, not the union money, not the money of advertising, but Joe Average's money in his pocket. And he, Joe Average, felt that the Labor Party was in every pocket and ready to take everything <laughs> that Joe Average had saved. Now, there's a lesson here for the Labor Party. They cannot form government. It's to be hoped that Scott Morrison can. But I will say one thing here, which is a note of caution, I guess, and that is, given that the focus in the last week of the campaign is in, on the economy, the pre-polling does become fairly significant. Many of these people voted before the focus was directed towards the major economic concerns. For example, Christian Porter seat in the Swan Valley, that's a housing estate, they just thrashed uh, the Labor Party in the Swan Valley because of the whole standing of negative gearing on its head uh, the doubling of 50% increase in capital gains tax. People just weren't going to cop this. So given that people pre-polled before the focus was on those issues, the pre-polling, I think, will be significant. Not so much the postal voting. It normally favours the coalition side. But, look, it is, it is... It was obvious. I mean, the exit polls are wrong, the pollsters are wrong, the media experts are wrong. I hope, with egg on their face, they'll actually acknowledge on Monday that they were wrong. The public have been misled for the last God knows how long it was going to be a whitewash. Well, I'm sorry, there's only one out being whitewashed, and that's the Labor Party. Well, it certainly appears that way right now. Let's bring up the uh, state of the House, if we can, and see what the count is showing from our computer. Our scrutineers uh, here as well are saying that the Coalition is going to win this, either in minority or majority status. We've now got on our computer the Coalition at 70 seats, 76 being the target, Labor stuck on only 58, 18 undecided. Uh, can we just um, uh, have a look at how the primary votes perhaps are looking across the country right now? Richo, this, we were saying about half an hour ago, impossible for Labor to form a minor uh, majority government. Is it now looking impossible for Labor to form a minority government? Uh, I think the most likely result is a majority Liberal government. A majority Liberal coalition That's what I said. Government. A majority Liberal government. Narrow. I'm not talking about... Uh, big numbers, but I think they can get to 76. Well, this primary vote's crept up to nearly 41% now for the Coalition. I assume more West yeah, Australian votes. Really you've got to remember, Labor. like, after the 2016 election, we won by one seat. So, you know, as long as we have a one-seat majority or more or better, we're doing better you than You have us. better. And 53-47 on those free polls. I have to say at this point, um, I want to pay enormous tribute to Andrew Hurst, uh, to be where we are, first time ever running a state or federal campaign. Uh, he took on this job. It's, you know, I was married to a federal director. It's the hardest job in the country if you're on the left or if you're on the right. And uh, this is an extraordinary effort. Uh, an extraordinary change in the tack, you know, team, yes, all credit to Scott Morrison, but I, I'm a staffer, former staffer. I pay tribute to the staff as well. Oh, look, I worked with uh, Andrew Hurst uh, at uh, campaign headquarters in Brisbane, and I've got to uh, very much endorse what 
Peter has just said he built uh, an amazing team. He led an amazing team. He's got you know, obviously great skills and experience, but he's got a, an amazing temperament. Um, and you know the uh, team atmosphere and the focus during the campaign, working in with obviously the prime minister and his team on the road was uh, the best that I've ever seen. Well, Richard Miles, you're going to be quiet here for a while. Uh, <laughs> let me bring you in. This is not where you thought... Well, I know you were pessimistic. No, it's... It it's not where Labor thought you would be at this point of the night. Uh, it now looks like the chances of forming government are slipping away, if not gone altogether. How much responsibility does Bill Shorten shoulder to this? Well, I, I, don't, I don't think that we know that uh, we're in a position where we can't form government. Um, I think right now there are still a number of seats in doubt um, and this has a little way to go. Um, it, it is a... Um, it's what I said, it's a contest. And, 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 I mean, Alan Jones isn't right that it's a whitewash. I mean, if you look at the vote share, um, it's within about 0.4% of each other. Um, and so this is a very close election. Um, and that's all you can say, and that's, that's what we thought it would be. I mean, I think one of the things here is that the expectations on Labor, for me, felt way out of kilter in the lead-up to the election compared to um, the, what was inevitably going to be the reality of, of, of a contest. You mean um, Bill Shorten saying yesterday he was confident you would win a majority government? Oh, I think... Uh, uh, no, I don't mean that at all. I mean, the, 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 uh, what I actually mean is the um, commentators during the first part of this year feeling like the election had already happened, which was definitely not our view. I mean, we knew that once we, were, we found ourselves in an election campaign, there was going to be a contest. We knew that uh, Scott Morrison has a prodigious self-belief, which is, you know, I'd say as a compliment, and it was going to be... Um, we, we were going to have a fight. Why, why, why did Bill tell Arnold Schwarzenegger that he was going to be the next Prime Minister of Australia? <laughs> if, uh, I mean, that, that was... Well, well he couldn't I, I tell thought, him he wasn't. Well, I mean... <laughs> Uh, yeah, he, he volunteered it. It sounded, I've got to say, I, it, it always seemed to but, us but like he was very Just on confident. that point, the, the weight of the expectations, I get it, three years of news poll heading your way, mm. that's not dissimilar to, to where the coalition was in 2013. I think this campaign has played such a huge determinant in the result tonight. That's what's probably a little different. Last recent campaigns have been foregone conclusions. Uh, it was... Malcolm well, Turnbull thought, it's, it's a, and it yeah. showed very much, you know... It's a good point. We, we started out talking about the impact campaigns can have. Clearly, it's had a big one. Let me go to Tanya Plibersek, the Deputy Labor Leader, joining us now. Thanks for your time. Are you disappointed with uh, where things are at right now? Oh, look, I think we'd certainly like to have um, clearly picked up a few more seats than we have so far. Uh, the result in Queensland's not quite what we'd hoped, but... You know, there's still a long night ahead of us. We've still got uh, a lot of pre-poll votes to count. Um, in Western Australia, we've only just started the counting. So uh, there's still a, a, a long night ahead of us, I think. So you still think Labor can win? Do you think that's realistic? Uh, well, we would have liked to have picked up more seats in Queensland. That would have uh, really helped. It, it is... I think still um, an uncertain outcome tonight. We've still got uh, quite a few seats where the count is very, very close indeed, and we'll be watching them with a great deal of interest. One thing we have really observed is that uh, the seats in Queensland, for example, um, where the, the LNP have done well, have done well on the back of very strong preference flows from One Nation and from Clive Palmer. Uh, it, it does seem like um, those uh, uh, $80 million that Clive Palmer spent um, might help the coalition get uh, a few, few more seats in Queensland than they imagined. All right, but, but do you acknowledge there may have been something wrong with Labor's message as well, particularly in Queensland? Look, I think uh, we had a very big and bold plan for government and... Uh, I'm confident that if people uh, had more time to look at some of our plans, like our pension and dental scheme and our cancer care package, um, we would have won them over with those elements of the plan. Uh, I think, you know, with the, the number of policies and the detail of the policies that we announced, I'm proud of those policies, but I think uh, for some people it was a little bit overwhelming and... Uh, they didn't really um, well, you should have, get to understand you should have gotten these the details out earlier. of Is that what you're saying? policies. And so, so I'm, should, should these look, have been I, released I a bit earlier very, in the piece? 
Look, it was a very big and bold agenda, and I think um, I, I'm, I'm not sure that everybody who is benefiting, for example, from our uh, free and much cheaper childcare or our pension or dental or some of our other policies got to, to know all of the details of those policies. But look, you know, as I say, in many respects it's still early in the night. We still have a lot of votes to count and we'll be watching some of those very, very close <coughs> contests very carefully. I no, am indeed. very proud me, uh, of the campaign yeah. we ran. I'm very proud of the campaign that Bill ran and the disciplined and united team that he led. <coughs> Finally, Tanya Plibersek, if you don't win tonight, there's really no way Bill Shorten stays as leader. Would you like to be the Labor leader? Well, Bill's run a fantastic campaign and I'm not going to start speculating about that sort of stuff yet. We still have um, hopes of winning. We're picking up seats in Western Australia. We're looking good in seats like Boothby in South Australia. We've obviously picked up Dunkley, uh, Karangamite in Victoria. We're looking good in Chisholm. We're looking good in Gilmore. I think people are pronouncing the outcome of this just a little too soon. A little bit too early to call that. All right. Tanya Plibersek, Deputy Labor Leader, thank you very much for joining us this evening. We'll get back to the count it's here. A uh, and I want to go to Hasluck in the West, of course, uh, a lot of attention now on what happens. This seat in particular, the margin, I think, 2.1% for Ken White coming into this tonight. Where is it at right now? He looks to be holding the seat. He is holding the seat. And Ken White is with us. Uh, Ken White, thanks for your time tonight. Our projection right now is that you've won the seat. So congratulations. Are you declaring victory there? No, not yet. I want to uh, see more numbers come in and look at the actual count that occurs. But I'm quietly confident, and based on what people said to me today and during pre-poll, uh, then it's a great outcome for the work that I do for them. And generally in WA, uh, do you think Labor will make any gains there at all in the state? Look, I'm not sure. Uh, I'd, I'd like to say no, uh, because I think that we will retain all of the seats that were considered marginal through both polling and through media. Uh, but as I've done each campaign, I've just said I'm quietly uh, hoping that the people of Hasluck give me the opportunity of being returned. And this is my fourth term now in a seat that used to change hands frequently. And for my colleagues, I'm pleased to see Steve Irons and Christian Porter uh, and Chris Connolly. Uh, their hard work is paid off. People have put their faith and commitment in them. Ken Wyatt, thanks very much for that. And I know you're not claiming it just yet, but uh, look, our system certainly is. So well done to you there in Hasluck. Over at the Liberal HQ in Sydney, John Howard has just arrived there. He's just Access making some remarks to reporters. something that the Australian people will reject. Mr Howard, how does this compare to other <coughs> great coalition victories? Oh, that is for the um, um, experts to talk about, but it is not for me to declare victory or defeat. That is a matter for the party leader to address. How do you think it'll yes. stack up, though? Well, I am very proud of the fact that I was able to help in a small way Scott Morrison during the campaign. Does he deserve a statue if he's successful? To well, 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 look, oh, look, don't don't try and prod me. Scott if. will use his own language. But I just want to say that I... I believe John Howard there, he's not going to declare victory. No, and uh, no, look, I, I think, yeah. <laughs> But um, it is also still a little bit up in the air as to uh, where these final seats are going to land. There's a bunch we won't know tonight. But Stephen Conroy, what's your... I mean, Tanya Plibersek was being cautious. No, look, I'd make, make a couple of points. I mean, we've actually only got... Normally at this stage of the night, we're heading towards 65 70% of the seats counted. But because of the, mag the magnitude of the... Uh, pre-polls, we've actually only got 53.6% of the vote counted. So those pre-poll booths are all still to come in. Uh, now, they probably favoured the Liberal Party in the Victorian election, uh, and Ipsos suggested that they uh, could favour the Liberal Party, but the, the size of that vote means we should just have a fraction of caution. I think what I'm still trying to come to terms with is... Uh, I mean, we've considered news poll the gold standard poll. And it, at this point, has got Labor's primary vote 4% higher than it was. We're 4% down. And the Liberal Party are 
the coalition are 3% up. So something has, has gone badly wrong mm. with the polling uh, publicly. Ipsos have got the, the size of Labor's vote right, but I think it's got the coalition vote pretty wrong too. Uh, so, sorry. We'll come back to that. Let me no, just go to Flinders to in, uh, in, in Melbourne, uh, where Greg Hunt has held on there. He suffered a swing on the primary vote, as you can see, right now, of nearly 6%. <coughs> but Julia Banks, running as an independent there, she secured only 15% of the primary vote, and after preferences, well, it's uh, going to say there, I'm sure, that it's too... Well, it is saying Liberal hold. There you go, even though it's just 51%, but enough there to say that Greg Hunt has won it. He's with us now, the Health Minister. Greg Hunt, thanks for joining us tonight. Our system says you've won it. Are you uh, declaring victory? No, we're not doing that yet. We've had a, a very, very good result because uh, with all of the projections, they're showing uh, 53 to 54%. 50% uh, uh, of the votes were cast before the, uh, the night. Uh, we have one of the highest pre-polls in the country, an older population. Uh, we have 10,000 postal votes, so we'll wait until they come in. But the, uh, some of the uh, projections are showing between 53 and 54 per cent. And we've had an amazing team on the ground. I've got my magnificent wife, Paula, with me, who's been our secret weapon on the, on the pre-poll. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and nationally... Uh, Literally just so, spoken with Scott Morrison whilst uh, we were uh, waiting for you. I had to tell him, I'm sorry, Scott, I'm waiting for Sky. And uh, he sort of said, oh, OK. Good man. Uh, but uh, he, has been, he has been incredible. And he has connected with the Australian people. But above all else, he's given them this sense that their lives matter, that each life can be something special, and that if you can do that for each individ individual, then you build a society from the bottom up rather than top-down, and this has been the biggest, biggest difference in terms of the two approaches of a bottom-up, individual-based belie uh, belief in the, the worth of every human being, as opposed to a top-down approach uh, of any election since 1972. And uh, I, I'm just in absolute uh, awe and respect of what Scott's done, yeah, yeah. but yeah. Uh, there's more to go. We're not calling it yet. The uh, election uh, is still in the ballot boxes and still being counted, but we're immensely grateful to the people of Flinders and the people of Australia. <laughs> Greg Hunt, thank you for joining us. I'll let you get back to it, and yeah, I know you've got to keep watching that count, but our system is showing things are looking pretty good for you. And interesting there, cheering uh, Scott Morrison. I think there's going to be a lot of praise from a lot of candidates and members and even ministers there for the, the job the Prime Minister's done. Uh, no, let's go, in fact, to, uh, yeah, let's go to Josh Frydenberg, the Treasurer, the Deputy Jordan. Liberal Leader. He's joining us now in Kooyong. He's held on as well. Uh, look, uh, Josh Frydenberg, good to see you. Thanks for joining us tonight. And uh, well done there in Kooyong. It was a tough fight for you, perhaps Thanks, tougher than you've had to face yeah. there in that seat before. You must be relieved this evening. Yeah, we were fighting uh, not only against the, uh, the traditional rivals of the Labor Party, but also a strong Greens race, as well as independents. But the people of Kuyong rallied. Uh, they know that I've worked uh, as hard as I could for them since I was elected back in 2010. And from here on, I'll continue to listen to them, work with them and work for them. And I'm just so grateful to the many, many volunteers who have helped us. But I'm also grateful to the Liberal Party uh, organisation, and particularly Andrew Hurst and Simon Frost uh, and the whole team, as well as, of course, the Prime Minister, who's shown brilliant leadership. But this is not about us. This is about the people of Kuyong, and I'm very, very humbled by um, their re-endorsement for my fourth election. And, Josh Frydenberg, do you think the Coalition can hold on to government, will hold on to government? Well, I spoke to the Prime Minister not that long ago and we're definitely in the game, but there's still obviously plenty of votes to be counted in the west and in the north of our country, but of course uh, we've you know, been buoyed by what we've seen so far uh, and uh, there seems to be a very strong showing across the country and our economic narrative, our economic story, the economic choice for the Australian people has been very clear at this election and that clearly uh, has been heard by the Australian people. Well, uh, Josh Frydenberg, uh, I suppose the budget that came just before the election campaign and then targeting Labor over franking credits and negative gearing, it looks like franking credits, particularly 
uh, has, has kept the, um, the over 65 demographic well in your column through this campaign. Is that what you put this down to so far? Oh, look, there's always lots of issues at play, but certainly our economic plan was set out in the budget, uh, principally paying back Labor's debt uh, with responsible economic management, growing the economy in the face of domestic and international economic headwinds, uh, with the uh, tax cuts, with the 80,000 apprentices, with the $100 billion of infrastructure, and then, of course, the guaranteed record funding for hospitals and schools, all done without increasing taxes. And we know how damaging Labor's negative gearing and capital gains tax changes would be. We also know how uh, damaging their retirees' tax were to people who, would have done, who have done nothing wrong except diligently save for their own retirement. Uh, and these, uh, these messages uh, have been heard by the Australian people, and the Australian people vote for lower taxes, not Labor's higher taxes. Josh Frydenberg, Deputy Liberal Leader and Treasurer, thank you very much for that. The Finance Minister on our panel, I'm sure, won't disagree with much of what you've just said there. All right, now it is, uh, I think, just gone 10 o'clock on the East Coast, four hours since the close of polls, the counting began. And, boy, it's not the result Labor was expecting or indeed hoping for. We can perhaps just bring up quickly for you what the state of the House now looks like. 76 is the target to form a majority government. Right now, our computer is saying the coalition is on 72 seats. Labor back on 59, 15 undecided. Now, we may be headed for hung parliament territory, but it's not out of the question that the coalition manages a, a majority government here. Based on those numbers, a lot would have to break Labor's way to stop that happening. And you can hear from the Treasurer, from the Health Minister, Greg Hunt, as well, this tone of, well, celebration almost there, and a lot of credit being given to Scott Morrison, who we'll see later tonight. Right now, let's go to the Labor headquarters down in Melbourne. Nick Rees and Kieran Gilbert are standing by. And, uh, Kieran, as, uh, you know, each time we cross to you, the news only seems to get worse there for Labor. What's the mood like now? Well, awful. Uh, the mood is awful, David. They are uh, upset. They got here tonight optimistic, uh, hopeful of a win, and a clear win. That's not eventuated. Uh, what went wrong? Well, a couple of the people I've been speaking to, uh, uh, you know, you, the recriminations have begun. The analysis of, you know, in Queensland, Nick, Adani obviously won. The tax campaign that Matthias Cormann, Josh Frydenberg and the Prime Minister ran so effectively, number two. But the other one was Bill Shorten, that he was never someone that resonated north of the Tweed. How did the polls, though, nationally get it so wrong? Look, I don't have a particularly convincing answer to that. I think part of the answer lies in the fact that uh, pollsters did not predict how strongly the One Nation and UAP vote would vote flow through to, to LNP in Queensland. Uh, the split that they were assuming on that vote uh, clearly didn't come to pass. And I think also, I think the polls probably didn't pick up uh, how much late voters have swung towards the coalition. Uh, clearly, the message around don't vote for Bill's new taxes was something that was very persuasive with those undecided, late-deciding voters. It's not even the published polls alone. It's the internal polling as well that was wrong because whenever I was told information from either side, it was nothing as clear-cut as this in terms of you know, this strong performance from the Liberal Party. Certainly Labor's polling was showing the result tightening over that last week. Uh, with Bob Hawke's passing, it was not expected that that was going to give Labor's vote uh, a substantial boost, but it did... There was... The, the thinking was that it would help nullify some of the attack that was coming on Labor <laughs> with its tax program, with its big reform uh, agenda. And uh, clearly that wasn't the case. When yeah. people woke up today, those undecided voters, they decided to vote against Labor's tax plans. Well, Bill Shorten's watching the coverage from uh, the Hyatt Hotel in the city. We are up in Essendon. But uh, quite frankly, the rise and rise of Bill Shorten's hit a brick wall tonight, David. Well, it certainly has. Uh, very hard to see him surviving this. Uh, look, the chances of scraping even minority government now looking very, very tough indeed for Labor. <coughs> All signs pointing to a return of the coalition. Kieran, Nick, thank you. A number of reasons for this, as we've heard from a number of Labor people so far, it's because they no one estimated the preference flow from uh, the Clive Palmer and Pauline Hanson parties, but clearly there's a rejection here of Labor's policy offering across Queensland. And look, you know, what we're seeing in these swings in uh, WA, Northern Territory and so on as well, Laura Jays, 
And Paul Murray are at the Liberal Party headquarters tonight, where I'm sure it's a very different vibe there in Sydney right now. Uh, what do you guys think about where we're at? Well, it's not just about the preference flows in, in Queensland from One Nation and Clive Palmer. Look at Joel Fitzgibbon's seat in the seat of Hunter. That is one word, coal there, 21% One Nation vote there. But last hour, David and Paul, I told you there was a, a path to victory. This is what Labor was telling me through getting picking up uh, Boothby in South Australia, maybe one or two in Victoria, and it all depended on WA. Well, that WA vote uh, is holding up for the Liberals, I'm told, even early counts in Sterling, booze that don't normally go uh, Sterling's way certainly are, uh, so you know, the only real chance there for the La Labor Party picking up a seat was uh, Swan, that is on a nice edge and I think it'll probably uh, stay with the Liberals um, and uh, and also they're not giving up on Karangamai, so that tells you where it's at, but Paul, the absolute big story, Clive Palmer has spent 60 million bucks is he going to get a Senate spot? Well, it's at the where uh, there's a celebration as the uh, reality is hitting the room that the Morrison government is most likely to be returned this evening, creating an entire new political playbook. But, Laura, the Senate is what matters here. One nation have grossly overperformed any public polling. Clive Palmer, on the current numbers, will not win a seat, a Senate seat in Queensland. Let me explain good why. good thing that you can't buy your way into Parliament. Correct. Uh, right now, in the, uh, the Senate voting, uh, Pauline Hanson's party has about 9% of the vote in Queensland. There is uh, just about 3% for the United Australia Party. So even in a preference situation, the problem is, is that the Libs are now starting to race towards 2.8, almost 3.1 quota which means those preferences won't be enough to help. And uh, this is a very big story about Palmer's underperformance as well in the lower house. He is sitting somewhere at about three, three and a bit percent everywhere. But One Nation nationally may be similar, but in Queensland is at 10%. In New South Wales is running way above and in Western Australia. And the story of this victory is going to be about preference discipline from the right minor parties. Yeah, but also, Paul, that you cannot buy your way into a Senate spot. It's a, a little bit uh, more complicated than just spending 60 million bucks. And you and I have talked about uh, starting our own polling company. Why not? I Why mean, not? Yeah, let's <laughs> every, go. I'll go yeah. with my gut. It's big enough. Let's see what happens. <laughs> David. All right, Laura, Paul, thank you very much. There is a lot to take out of what's been happening here tonight. Always many reasons as to why voters go the way they do, but clearly we are seeing a rejection of Labor's policy offering on the tax front, whether it's the franking credits in particular for those uh, re retirees, whether it's the negative gearing policy spooking other uh, uh, younger uh, homeowners as well. And maybe the climate change issue is clearly not played as strongly as they hoped it would and thought it would, according to their internal polling in the last couple of weeks. I would note the government also backed off the attack on climate change at the end of the campaign too. But... What we're seeing in Queensland is clearly, and Hunter is a, a terrific example there, of nervousness around going with a big emissions reduction plan. Anyway, where we are right now, perhaps we just bring up that state of the house once more. Last I checked, it had, a, had the coalition on 72, four short of the majority they need. There it is still. Richo, do you think they'll get a majority, the coalition? I think it's possible. Uh, and it's, you know, I, I don't know the answer to it. No one does. But it could happen. What can't happen is Labor getting one. <laughs> that's for sure. A majority or a minority? Um, I think that's even pretty remote now. I'm not even hopeful of that. So you think the coalition's won? Yep. Uh, on no accounts, I think that the Libs are pretty much got 74. Uh, with... Uh, a nose in front in Longman, Bass and Macquarie, which would take them to 77. Uh, not conceding them, but uh, our numbers, people can see it uh, getting there on the current trends. Coalition getting to 77. Well, they're, we think they're sitting on about 74 and a reasonable chance of getting to 77 at this stage. Well, Matthias Corman, what do you think? Is it um, looking that good, do you think, for the, well, for I'm, the government? Well, I'm, I'm not going to declare it for the government, but, uh, you know, obviously, you know, we, we always thought that there was a pathway to victory. We always knew it was a narrow pathway to victory. 
uh, Scott Morrison has uh, run an amazing uh, campaign supported by a, a very strong and effective team effort. And you know, in the end, we always felt that people across Australia were receptive to our argument that uh, we didn't, that this was not the time uh, to go back uh, to the approaches of the past of high taxing, high spending agendas, that this was the time to start a course, that we had been successful in building a stronger economy and that this was the time to keep uh, tracking down in the same direction, that there are uh, global economic headwinds, there are downside risks in the domestic economy and, and that our, our approach and our plan was working, that this wasn't the time to take risks with a high taxing, uh, risky experiment. Peter Credlin, um, I mean, we'll see where these final undecided seats end up and we may not know for a little while, a few days, some of them, but from where that count looks right now, you'd have to say the Coalition's back. Yeah, I'd say the Coalition's back in a majority government. Um, a majority government? A majority government. Um, and I think a couple of things are there. Um, at a time when people are feeling income pressures, I think Labor's agenda was just too big and too broad. I also think there's a lot to be said um, for everyday people wanting a steady as she goes, uh, no frills, no surprises, a uh, leader that they can look to with a bit of confidence that looks and sounds like them and that the agenda is something that they can see as credible without being so bold it puts at risk their prosperity, their jobs. Things are so tight in household budgets. I mean, both sides of politics will say right across the board the number one issue. Uh, but and, and for this, a couple of seats yeah. was cost of living, David. Now, can I just go to the point about polling? Uh, when in this country we denigrate the right of ordinary people to worry about things like their right to profess faith, uh, their right to have a job, the right of their kids to have a trade if they want to trade or go to university, the money coming in uh, each week meaning something. I know Labor's tried to own that ground and it has been their history to own that ground. But the shift to the left, the further encroachment of the Greens into what was old Labor, has put this at risk, I think. So when you laugh and sneer, and I'm not this channel, the ABC's good at it, and, and people get a call from a pollster, they're not going to put their hand up. They're not going to tell the pollster honestly where their vote's going to go. And this has proven out tonight. This happened in Brexit. This happened with Trump. It's a new phenomenon, sadly, uh, in the way we treat, we treat the everyday voter. But this... I tell you, the old phenomenon is, is you can't go too hard at the hip pocket nerve. And if you have franking credits and then you top it up with negative gearing, you've got two hits. One hit you might have gotten away with, but you can't get away with two. I think uh, Labor just got too greedy in the tax grab and I think the punters have punished them for it. Does Bowen wear responsibility for this, Richard? Does Bowen have to wear some responsibility? Well, don't see how he doesn't. Um, he has well, to well, wear well, he sees himself as a leader, doesn't he? Or Labor people talk to him I mean, as a, a leader. That's a fair point. Look, there's two things to say here. Uh, one, Scott Morrison winning this tonight... Brilliant. ..is invested with enormous authority. Yep. You know, I take what Matthias Cormann's saying about the team effort. It's always a team effort. This was a particularly solo-style campaign. Um, I think that gives him... Enormous. Enormous and, and authority. He gets a, he, Scott Morrison ran an outstanding campaign, there's no question. I mean, he... Uh, after the uh, you know, leadership change in August last year, he uh, united the team, uh, he uh, inspired the team uh, to take on this battle, and, and he, he did an amazing job, there's no question. He, I, I, can, I, I would reveal for our viewers too that you from that moment still thought you could win, <laughs> even in those dark moments when a lot of your colleagues did not. You were one of those very few who argued right throughout the last six or eight months that you could come back. Uh, but, you know... I, I'd, I'd be amongst them who doubted for a long time there whether you did have much chance. But, uh, you know, the campaign really did turn things around. Morrison winning uh, means as a leader, Peter... This is my point. What look, can he do with look that? Look at his leadership group now. He, he doesn't have Tony Abbott and the potential that Tony Abbott could return to the leadership. That's, that's gone. He doesn't have Julie Bishop, who was shaking her tail feather everywhere around uh, the place in order to, to plump for the leadership. He doesn't have Christopher Pine, never a leadership contender, but, you know, right up there with the undermining campaigns of the past. Malcolm Turnbull is removed out of the whole debate. This was very clear tonight. There was not a hankering for Malcolm Turnbull. Uh, likely that you won't see Karen Phelps. You certainly won't see Julia Banks. He will have enormous authority. Will he reshape the government now with this new authority? Um, 
I suspect he probably will. And then the other um, flip side to this is Bill Shorten. Now, Richard Miles, he can't survive. Well, look, we've, uh, uh, we haven't even got to a point where people are claiming or conceding the election. So we're having a conversation here way ahead of where it's at, and it's certainly not for me to be uh, saying where we're at there. I, I think what we know is we certainly put forward an ambitious uh, policy agenda into this election campaign. Um, it was, uh, as, as I said at the beginning of this broadcast, I think we were trying to do something... Uh, we were trying to do a hard thing. Um, and we ran into a very negative campaign, and, and this election was characterised by what Labor had to say about the future of Australia and uh, the Liberals campaigning in effect against Were that. you too ambitious, though? I mean, to Richard's well, it, point, it, it, this is it, politics, this is what campaigns do. I mean, you've got to be eyes wide open about what's coming. If you lead with your chin on the sort of policy agenda, um, uh, was it too much? Look, I, I, we, we don't even know where the election has, has, has landed yet. We've got, so, we we got, got a pretty, pretty fair idea, mate. Yeah, OK, but, but we, we, let, let's, let's, let's just see that play out first. Um, I, I, I think that, that it, it, I think it was always going to be a situation where there was going to be uh, a contest here, um, and and none of this surprises me. Well, there's the either the policy, the campaign, or the leader, yeah. or a combination of the three, right, Richard? I mean, it's pretty simple. Yeah, I, I I think there's no doubt about that. You you can't lose like this when you're expected to win, and then say that everybody's wonderful that everybody did their job and it was all terrific. Clearly, it wasn't. Clearly, we didn't get the message across. We failed. And when you fail, you have to look at those who are in the positions who failed. And, and, and no leader can lose twice. No, I, I, I think Bill knows that. I don't think this will be coming as any great shock of his listening. Um, uh, I, there's never been one that survived two and he, wa he won't be the first. No one does. You know, Richard might be the leader in a few days' time. We might be sitting next to greatness here. <laughs> Please. This is, not a, this is not a stupid point. Um, you know, when you look uh, uh, at the offerings in the Labor Party, let's just... Uh, I'll bring you in in a moment here. But others who perhaps can speak a bit more freely about this, the options are Anthony Albanese, Tanya Plibersek of the left, Chris Bowen, damaged oh, nah, after this campaign... Where do they go, Peter? Immigration Minister, worst ever record in terms of boats coming to Australia's shores under Chris Bowen. And now this fiscal slash economic campaign catastrophe, he is gone for all money. Actually, no, Labor, make him your leader. Make him your leader. <laughs> Give Scott Morrison two decades. But what would, what would you, where do you think Labor should go? Admittedly, they may not take your advice on this. No, I don't think they will. <laughs> um, I certainly don't think they should go to the left. And that's as, what I'm saying. Popular, Who's as, on the right? As popular as Anthony Albanese will be to Labor's brethren, their problem is abandoning their people, abandoning the people that used to be on the tools, who worked for Labor, who could trust in the everyman Labor vote. And that's disappearing because their heads turned by inner-city green trendies, just like the Liberals' vote is, and their heads are turned in some of our key seats, particularly in Victoria. Stephen, I note you're making yourself kind of busy <laughs> while we're having this discussion, <laughs> head buried in your iPad there, that this is, this is a conversation that you would have been involved in where you're still in the Parliament. Where, where do you think Labor should go? Well, look, I, I'm with Richard. At the moment, the government haven't actually claimed victory. Uh, there's still a significant amount of vote in pre-poll to come in. I'm not expecting that to be a significant uh, departure. Uh, and I think that... I think the point Richo made, that in terms of the policy settings, the campaign, uh, the approach, all of that will be under scrutiny yeah, if it goes as it seems at the moment. And then the party would need to reflect. And that's what I want to get from you. I'll come back to that in a moment, what you think they should do and all of those things you, you point to. Just quickly to Braddon, uh, this, uh, the northwest of Tasmania. We've been looking at this throughout the night. And as you can see there, with 83% of the vote count, and that Labor vote's just crashed, hasn't it? The primary vote down 8%. Uh, and a lot of that would have seemed to have gone to the independent candidate there. What's it meant after preferences, though? It's meant uh, a pick-up for the Liberals there in Tasmania for Gavin Pearce. Sitting now on 53.5% of the two-party preferred result. And Gavin Pearce is uh, with us now. We're just going to quickly check in. Gavin, um, are you declaring victory there in Braddon? 
Uh, that's right, David. Just just received a call from uh, from the incumbent member. So uh, yes, yeah, she's uh, conceded and and uh, and we've made our announcement. So. Oh, well, congratulations uh, to you on that. When did you think you'd won it, or was it a surprise tonight? Uh, I missed that. Say again. Did you think you would win this, or was this a bit of a surprise tonight? Uh, we were uh, we were positive. Uh, we've we've been positive right up until the wire. Uh, campaign hard on a positive platform. Uh, we've just said that. Uh, we're concentrating on jobs, on, on a better health system and, and our way of life that we've got, uh, we've got down here that we hold so close to our hearts here in the northwest coast of Tasmania. Uh, that's what the people of Braddon have, have, have voted for. We, we've, we've also prioritised Braddon rather than the spend down south on, on, a, on a football team, an AFL team and, and $50 million that the opposition were, were promising Mona, which is a, a five-star luxury resort down, down the southern end of the state. Uh, we've prioritised Braddon and uh, its economy, its health system, uh, and making it a better place rather than down south. Well, that's paid off, uh, paid off for you there. Thank you very much for your time this evening and well done once again. Breaking news there that uh, Labor's Justin Key has conceded defeat uh, to Gavin Pearce there in Braddon, a gain for the Liberal Party in Tasmania. One of the few gains we've seen for the Labor Party, let's check in on Gilmore in uh, the south coast of New South Wales, where you can see on the primary vote result, the Liberal vote down, well, a lot, but the Nats have come into the contest and picked that up 12.5% there. But after preferences, as you can see, Warren Mundine unsuccessful. Fiona Phillips taking that seat for Labor She's with us now. Fiona Phillips, thanks for joining us. Congratulations to you. Uh, have you been declaring or have you declared victory there yet? Uh, yes, yes, definitely. Yeah, we're so excited here uh, to claim victory for Labor in the seat of Gilmore. Uh, look, this seat hasn't been held by Labor for over 23 years. Um, it's an amazing achievement. We've seen a, around a 17% drop in the Liberal vote. Uh, couldn't be more proud of our incredible team here. Uh, and thank you to every voter uh, that has put their confidence uh, in myself and Labor. Look, it's an interesting uh, win there, given we are seeing swings against Labor and losses for Labor, particularly on the issue of uh, franking credits. You, a lot of retirees in that seat of Gilmore, I know. Um, why do you think you've succeeded there? Well, I think we, uh, we have a lot of uh, aged pensioners in Gilmore that are protected under Labor's pensioner guarantee. Um, the Liberals have been trying to run a, a really strong scare, uh, scare campaign uh, and it hasn't worked. It hasn't worked here because we've stood up against their scare campaign. Uh, people here want better hospitals, better, more funding for their schools. There's a whole range of things. People in Gilmore are doing it really tough. Um, and we're sending a, a strong message um, to the coalition, and I'm just really proud. We've been out door knocking. We've uh, made over, around 50,000 door knocks and phone calls into the electorate, talking with people about the issues that are important to them. I couldn't be more proud uh, and more excited to represent uh, people in Gilmore. I've been part of this community. <laughs> Community. Uh, yeah. Yep. I was just going to say, all my life. Yeah, all okay, my life. Well, congratulations um, you know, to you once again. A... Look, yeah, sorry about <laughs> the delay you. here. We'll let you get back to the celebrations there. We appreciate you joining us. Great. Thanks for that. And uh, one of the Labor gains there tonight. Perhaps we can bring up again the state of the House right now and get an update, see if there is any movement there. Uh, but Gilmore, uh, one they've picked up. In fact, that Labor count has ticked up to 60 now from. 59 and the undersiders have dropped down to 14 so another one has entered the Labor column but uh, of those 14 undecided you'd have to have well all of them go Labor's way Richo at this point. Well Labor can't, uh, Labor can't win I, mean, I don't think anyone's sitting here suggesting that Labor can't win yeah. it's just a matter of how close they get to next time yeah. and uh, I, uh, I'm hoping it's a lot closer than that. Look, there, there, there is an equation which can still see the coalition with 73 uh, and Labor 
around 70. Uh, Higgins is still one we're not uh, absolutely writing off. The, mm. the pre-poll in Higgins we think we'll be competitive in uh, because there's no sitting member. So we think we'll do better than average in Higgins. Uh, in Boothby uh, and Chisholm, we're ahead. And in Cowan, I, I've never really uh, been overly worried about that one. Uh, and Wentworth, Dave Sharma's again in, in what can only be described as a complete seesawing. Uh, he's, he's under serious pressure in Wentworth. Uh, and all of that could still see the coalition not forming majority government. No, not that Labor can uh, from 70 or 71, which is you know, probably its absolute maximum optimistic position. Uh, but Sorry, you don't think even at its best? I think, uh, I think 70, 71, it's hard for Labor to pull those independents. Yeah. Uh, so the coalition's, but, the coalition's won, either minority or majority government. Well, you know, yes. the, country, the country probably doesn't need a minority government. We've had but we, uh, it's a fair bit, likely, but we're, we're most likely to, to do that. There is still an equation you can see, as I said earlier, the coalition getting to majority, mm. but... Equally, that's probably 50-50 at the moment. Yeah, well... OK, some uh, pictures now. We're just uh, turning around for you here of the Prime Minister leaving... That looks like Kirribilli House to me, and he'll be... Yep. This was just a few minutes ago, heading over to the Wentworth Sofitel where uh, Laura and uh, Paul have been in the Liberal Party headquarters tonight. So... <clears throat> I don't think he's had a call yet from Bill Shorten. Uh, not surprised by that at this point. Um, but at some point, the leaders will address uh, the nation tonight. I'm not sure whether there'll be a victory and concession speech at this point, given the way things are. But I don't think there's any doubt about the coalition winning this uh, now, Peter, either minority or majority government. I think they'll have the speeches that we saw in 2010. Um, you know, they'll thank their troops, they'll thank their supporters, they'll, they'll talk about their platforms... I have no doubt both of them will have uh, already started reaching out to the would-be independents that are likely to get over the line. Uh, that would be smart. That certainly would happen again in 2010. So um, I think they'll both try and appeal to, to their people tonight and argue um, pretty much as they did through the campaign why their various platforms were right. But I think the mood very much will be a more buoyant mood in the Liberals' camp than it will be for Labor. Yeah, no doubt about that. Um, more buoyant, if not celebratory, I'm sure, at the, uh, the hotel when Scott Morrison walks in the door. I think you'll go to a private room first before we see him uh, come downstairs and uh, talk to the crowd there. But they are going to be um, uh, more than jubilant. I mean, this is not something a few months ago that was even on the cards no, for no. the coalition. It's extraordinary. Uh, the campaign was a strong one. Things tightened up. We saw in the early part of the campaign in particular. But... How many dared dream, even yesterday, Peter, that the coalition would win this? No one did. And, and it look, go back to Gladys Berejiklian. It got so tight for her, and she did not make, a, you know, a misstep. She just kept her eye uh, on it. She didn't believe the polls. She didn't get caught up in the <coughs> election. She just went right down to the line. That's a real credit here to, to Scott Morrison. It would have been so easy to drop your bundle all the way through the last few days. Um, and, and, you, and you too, Matisse, for the whole front bench. Uh, no, I've got to no say, we, we did, we did no believe breakouts. that there was a pathway all the way through because, I mean, you know... Not this one. In, in, in the end, like, you know, we, we stood for a stronger economy and we thought we had a credible argument that, you know, the shortened Labor agenda would make our economy weaker. We thought that, you know, the uh, taxes, the, the, high, the taxing agenda, whether it is in relation to retirees, housing but also investment income um, and so on, you name it. We thought that there was... I mean, they picked a lot of fights with a lot of people. I mean, if, if it moved across the Australian community, uh, Labor essentially was sending a message, we will tax you. And, and we, we, we thought that there was a lot of concern across the community about uh, the, the perception that there was a lot of spending going on that the country couldn't afford. So, I mean, and, and all the way through, I mean, Bill Shorten was pursuing an agenda with an edge of turning Australian against Australian. There was this class war edge to it, whereas uh, Scott Morrison was very much focused on uh, bringing the country together, making the economy stronger, uh, making the economy stronger for all Australians, whereas, of course, I mean, we, we, we always believed that there was a, a message here for aspirational Australians, for working-class aspirational uh, Australians that, that would be much more compelling uh, than, what, uh, than what Bill Shorten was putting forward. Speaking of uh, predictions and... 
Getting it wrong. Richo, you know. Rowan Dean has helpfully texted me I put to my remind hand me. Up. <laughs> oh, yes. I got it wrong. Uh, I did not think there was any way Scott Morrison could win tonight. Um, and um, I said so. As the first one I got wrong, there had to be a first. Uh, and tonight's it. And um, I'll, I'll and give, if, if, if there's going to be a first, I'm glad it was a mate of mine that won because I've been a mate of Scott's for a long time. So good luck to him. Uh, uh, he's indeed. a good man and uh, I wish him well. And look, well done to Rowan. He was six months ago calling yeah, it, it's uh, that, that, that the government would win. Even and, and last here night. We are. I can't. Outside. How am I going to live with a bugger from now on, though? I mean, I mean, <laughs> you will. No, All right, I want to go back to the, uh, to the Liberal headquarters. <laughs> uh, Paul Murray and Laura Jays are joined now by the former Prime Minister, John Howard. Mr Howard, uh, what a night for the Liberal Party, but more importantly, how do you feel for the nation? Well, I, it is not for me to make declarations of victory or final outcomes. That's a matter for the Prime Minister, but it does seem to have gone rather well. And... Uh, <laughs> Uh, if it turns out that the coalition forms the government, that'll be better for the nation. There's a lesson to be learned from this campaign is that Australians reject the politics of class division. This attempt by the Labor Party to divide us into classes, to denigrate anybody who worked hard and made a few bob, to call all of us the big end of town, that has been rejected by the Australian people. What message do you think there is there on climate change in particular? Because this was, you know, lauded as the big vote changer in this campaign. So what message do you take? Well, I think the climate change issue resonated differently in different parts of the country. There's no doubt that in Queensland, the antipathy of the Labor Party to the Adani mine cost that party dearly because the people of Queensland saw it in terms of jobs and employment opportunities. And it, it, it's an important issue, but this idea that you have to uh, wreck the economy in the process of achieving some kind of target is not something that appeals to the common sense of Australians, whether they live in Queensland or in other parts of the nation. Well, Mr Howard, of course, you referred famously to uh, Victoria as Massachusetts. Queensland was very good for the Liberal Party. Does that mean Texas came good for you tonight? <laughs> well, Queensland was fairly kind to me when I was Prime Minister. And, uh, but look, we're all Australians together. And, 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 and that brings me back to my central point, and that is you don't try and divide the country on class lines. I think the Prime Minister's coming. What is your message to uh, Scott Morrison uh, yeah, if he does I, form I a government? I don't think he needs any messages from me. <laughs> except I am full of admiration for him. I admire the campaign he's waged, and I think he deserves the, the heartfelt gratitude of coalition supporters all around Australia. Well, just finally, Mr Howard, we have seen some losses for your party tonight, notably the seat of Warringah, Tony Abbott. Well, I'm sad about Tony. I worked for Tony uh, in his electorate this afternoon. I went and handed out how to vote cards in Manly for him for a couple of hours, and... I'm just very sad that it's happened, and I thank him for his contribution to the nation, and I salute the gracious way in which he conceded defeat. Mr Howard, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, John Howard there, the uh, Liberal Party HQ. Uh, as you can see on screen right now, the Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, is entering the parking area of this hotel. As we speak, it is... Uh, as full as it could ever be on any other great night for the Liberal Party at state or federal elections, already here apart from party officials, Gladys Berejiklian. Her win here in March began to give Liberal supporters hope that there may well be something that could happen if they crossed their fingers, counted their toes and see what happens. It seems like that feeling is happening again tonight, David. Yeah, it certainly does, and you can hear that... Uh electricity, that vibe in the room only picking up. We're seeing in the car park downstairs the Prime Minister's car. Uh, now, um, the fact he's there uh, doesn't mean we'll necessarily see him right away, uh, but his arrival there indicates that he's getting ready to perhaps declare victory tonight because it's there for him to declare victory. This is uh, not the result that Labor was expecting, hoping for by any stretch. Scott Morrison tonight will no doubt be sending a unifying message because, look, in many parts of the country, uh, this is not a big win for the Coalition. Sure, it's a hell of a lot better than they were expecting even yesterday, uh, but we are seeing great division in uh, many parts of the country. Here's what the State of the Party shows right now. Uh, the Coalition on 72 seats. 
Still short of the 76 majority target they need. Labor's crept up another one there to 61. 13 still undecided. But to think that uh, they're all going to break Labor's way is uh, fanciful. So um, uh, it's either minority or... I think it's looking more likely majority government now for the coalition, uh, Stephen Conroy. Uh, look, it's... Uh... They're certainly very close. A primary vote. Look at that. Priority. It's just crept up even a little bit further, 41.1%. That's now. a tremendous primary vote. That, that's, uh, that's tremendous. Given that there's one nation, given that there's one nation and Palmer United to the right as well, well that is, exactly. that is and a they not, very, that very... That Palmer vote sitting at 3% nationally, or 3.3% nationally, and one nation at 3% nationally, obviously a lot stronger in the seats in Queensland where it counts, but... That has not eaten into the coalition vote. Yep. Yeah, there's a lot of no, commentary around no, that's, how, yeah. how the, the fracturing of the conservative vote, the rights splitting and how the Liberals need to deal with this and so on. It's come off the Labor vote, if anything. Is that well, right? Well, I've always argued that there's a lot of one nation, a lot of Labor vote in one nation. I mean, it, it depends, obviously, what seat you're talking about. Um, but, you know, as I keep saying, when Labor keeps going further and further to, to the left, to the Green left, um, they don't necessarily want to vote with the Liberal Party. They don't necessarily, we've seen, go to the National Party. Uh, they're parking their vote with uh, people who are arguing for the outsider. I think um, what Paul said was right before. There's a discipline amongst those uh, right uh, fringe parties in terms of their preferences that didn't exist during the Super Saturday by-election. Well, it hasn't really existed at all, Richard. I mean, it's been uh, actually quite patchy. Some of them have gone sort of 45, 55. Some of them have been 70, 30 in, in previous elections. So but it's maybe... It's a function of the preference deal. Well, but we know that there wasn't a lot of people handing out for Clive Palmer. Yeah, so, but he's still got a vote. Uh, may, maybe, maybe, the th maybe this time round, the threat of what the alternative was, Shorten's reform agenda, was enough to drive individual discipline. Yeah, quite possibly. Uh, quite possibly. OK, we're just seeing some more of the uh, cliffhanger seats there at the moment. There is still a string of them, about a dozen or 13 of them that are still up in the air. And, uh, you know, probably given that we're at 10.30 at night on the East Coast, we may not know tonight. Um, but, uh, you know, Bass, look at that, in Tasmania, where the Liberals are um, ahead... The Tasmanians are telling me they, are they're quite comfortable that they'll have Bass and Braddon, obviously. They've got Braddon, but Bass as well. Yeah. But Labor not picking up Chisholm in a canter tonight. I mean, that's a surprise right there, isn't it, Richard Mark? Well, um, we certainly hope to pick up Chisholm, that's right. And, I mean, obviously we're still um, in the hunt there. Um, and, um, yeah, but that was certainly a target that we yeah. were hoping to get. Yeah. And I see Ed Monero's now on the cliffhanger list there too. That wasn't one that... Labor was uh, expecting to lose tonight, but it's come right in now and is uh, in the cliffhanger pile. Let's have a look at that, because that's got a lot of retirees, as we know, yeah. on the coast. Can we go to Eden Monero? Uh, let's have a look at this, uh, if we can. So this is just outside uh, Canberra and Queanbeyan and beyond, running south from there. So Mike Kelly, who's held the seat now for two terms, am I right? And uh, his... Well. So he, he, he got re-elected at the last at the election. Last he, he, he got... He, yeah, that's right. He was elected in 2007, yeah. lost, and then... Yeah. Yep. Uh, OK, look... Yeah, he's, he's... It's saying too close, but you'd rather be Mike Kelly, obviously, uh, yeah, on, those, think, yeah. on those numbers. He'd probably be all right. Um, but, you know, at your point, Peter, that it's a retiree's electorate... But for Queen Bien, that's right. Queen Bien's got a lot of public service officials and workers... But beyond that area, you're absolutely right, there's a lot of retirees, little pockets all the way along the coast there. I mean, can you keep this policy, Richard Miles? The... Uh, look, I I'm not about to go through all that tonight. I mean, uh, uh, we've got to still let this play out, but it's obviously been... But do you believe like... in it passionately? Oh, the I, franking credit policy? Oh, I, I absolutely think we, it, we're, we're on the side of the angels with that policy. Um, oh, so? I, well, pretty dark but, angels. <laughs> but, I but, mean, it's a tax refund. Yeah, like, but, I mean... But, but, um, but you know, the, the, this is obviously a difficult night. Um, and there'll be a lot of um, uh, thinking that we need to go through. Um, but, you know, the, the night hasn't finished yet and, yeah. uh, and it's not for me to call it. I think you could have gotten away with one of negative gearing and franking credits. Spot on. But I think both was just a bridge too far. Um, so I think you just... 
Just push the envelope, mate. But, I mean, not but you. Oh, not you. I would never blame you. The politics of negative gearing were also very different this time around to 2016. Yeah. And I, I was surprised... That, or even, uh, even that, a year or two. But, ago, right? but I, I was surprised that Labor... I mean, they essentially on this tried to rerun the 2016 campaign when, you know, at a time when property prices in Melbourne and Sydney are, you know, seem to be overheating. It's a very different circumstance to uh, having a softening property market. And I, I, I was amazed that Labor didn't recalibrate their approach in those areas. And, and quite frankly, I think that that is partly what they're paying the price for. I mean, the economic context uh, is different and, uh, you know, people are concerned about what happens to property prices. Uh, as much as Chris Bowen might want to tell them not to worry about negative equity, well, people do worry about negative equity when they have a loan, uh, and, and rightly so. They should worry about what happens uh, to, you know, obviously the most important investment that many Australians will ever hold. I mean, this is the thing. We need to remind people that not only is it the personalities and the parties, but negative gearing will now, from tonight, remain in place as is. Franking credit cash refunds will remain in place as they are for the foreseeable future. I would predict Labor is uh, going to have to walk away from one, if not both, of those policies. Uh, At least one. Yeah, exactly. So this result has a big impact on our tax mix. It doesn't it, change. It does. It, it has a very big impact. Uh, and I, um, I wonder exactly where Labor is going to go on this because um, it's going to be very hard for Bowen to let go because they're, they're his babies, so to speak. He, he doesn't want to let go. He wants to hang on. Um, I'll be fascinated to see what Chalmers does because uh, he's the other money man, and um, if, uh, if he sticks with Bowen, then, then it's going to be very hard to overturn it. So we'll see. Well, Jim Chalmers, too, is someone, though, that's a, a future leader for the Labor he's Party. He's got to be a future leader, this bloke. I think he's a star. So whoever emerges as the leader. And if he goes the wrong way in this, he's a deal. So, <laughs> oh, oh, oh. But he won't. I, I, I have confidence in him. Do you suspect he could emerge, if not as leader, then perhaps as uh, a treasurer, a shadow treasurer? Well, I think there's, there's got to be a chance of that, yeah. I tell you what, you wouldn't hope everyone's done their Section 44s if it gets tight. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Uh, uh, Conroy's a problem. Oh, oh my God, no. Well, Stephen, well, Stephen, you know, Stephen, Stephen Conroy, Conroy, I renounce. Back to you. Oh, you I renounce. paid money to renounce, sir. Let me come back to you, Stephen Conroy, on this leadership question. Mm. Where does Labor go? Well, in the worst of worlds, we have a number of very good candidates. Come on. I mean, there's Tanya, there's Jim, there's Richard, without wanting to make him blush more than I normally do, uh, and Albo, I'm sure, will be thinking about it. So, I mean, I think we've got a very strong uh, backup team. I think, as you've seen from our team in this campaign, they have been united. Uh, they've all been out there uh, doing well. Uh, so... If, uh, if what Morrison's be, able to claim what victory tonight... Advice? Yeah, what would be your advice right now as to all those options? Oh, look, I think all of them are good. Like, genuinely, all four of those are very good choices. You can't have four or five leaders. Uh, you can have a contest uh, between, uh, between... What would you pick? Sorry for uh, I don't, I don't get, a, I get a vote in the broader party. You can, you can have a say. Uh, commentators I think the first rule we should do is get rid of that stupid rule. I've never been a fan of it. <laughs> no, neither have uh, I. I have the, opposed uh, it longly and loudly to Kevin Rudd's face and every leader since then. The parliamentary party should be the dumb idea. master of its own destiny. Uh, but uh, the Labor Party, uh, in its wisdom, has gone down this path. Uh, See, I, look, I slightly disagree. I think in opposition it's a bit more relaxed anyway, isn't it, the rule? You can change leaders a bit easier in opposition. But as Prime Minister, the voters are sick and tired of Prime Ministers being... Dumb. No, he's not well, talking about the rule. He, he's talking clearly about they're not. the involvement of the I mean, they've just the elected... <laughs> I'm sorry, but clearly they aren't. Uh, we've just had three Prime Ministers in one term, uh, or in, in four years, and, uh, and clearly they're not... They don't care about a rotating Prime Minister. Uh, it's an interesting take. They, they, didn't, interesting take. they didn't care about... Paul Keating knocking off Bob Hawke. Paul right. Keating won an election. Now, I'm told Bill Shorten's about 30 minutes away from uh, uh, appearing at the um, uh, Essendon Fields venue there in Melbourne. So I assume, I assume, I don't know, that uh, he will be offering some sort of concession, if not holding pattern type speech. But they'll obviously you have to You can't offer a holding pattern at this stage of the game. You can't really. Right? Can't really well, Labor's got Barclays. Everyone know, around this table knows that and everybody watching knows it. So you, you offer no, some sort of we're clinging to hope that everything will... No, I don't, if he does that, he's crazy, I mean, and he'll look silly. Yeah. You know, it, it's about also always about the way you look, the way you appear. 
And, and, and like you can't Abbott. appear to be a dill. Like right? Abbott. You've yeah. got to take it. You've got to, you've got to be able to take one on the chin. And, uh, and Bill has to stand up there, take it, and, uh, and concede defeat properly. Um, all right, Michael Kroger, let me just go to you before I come back to Richard Miles for his thoughts on uh, all of this. Uh, and he is in Keyong, where we spoke to Josh Frydenberg a little earlier. Michael, this is, I reckon, probably a better result than you were expecting too. David, it was a better result than the whole nation was expecting. Uh, no one predicted this result, quite frankly. You have the odd person that sends me a text during the night saying, I told you we were going to win, but quite frankly, every poll was wrong. Uh, you know, the path to victory for the coalition, as we always said, uh, was uh, the shy Trump voter. And that's what happened. Not 48, not 48 and a half, not 49, over 50. No one predicted this uh, in Victoria. We've lost Dunkley, it looks as if we've lost Parangamite. Chisholm looks as if we've lost, but we're still in there in Parangamite. And Chisholm held all the others against this surge of the Greens and Get Up and Labor. A bad night for Get Up, by the way, and a bad night for the Greens. And uh, very, you know, commiserations to the great Tony Abbott. And a special shout out to Peter Dixon, uh, Peter uh, Dutton in Dixon. What a hero. They threw everything at Peter Dutton and he withstood all of that. So um, we're all very pleased for him. But uh, the Victorian MPs, who are under, many of them under threat in Flinders, Julian Banks, flopped badly, 15% uh, of the vote. Um, Suka held, Jason Wood, all of those seats. So a remarkable result, David. I'm not sure I can think of a more remarkable result in my lifetime in, in Liberal Party history. We lost the unlosable in 93 and we've won the unwinnable in 2019. And Scott Morrison will ever, forever go down as a Liberal legend, as will his deputy, Josh Frydenberg. Well, that's an interesting historical perspective there, Michael. This goes down in history as, are you saying, the most impressive election win? The most impressive, and we expected to win in 75, 77, 80, 96, etc. There were doubts about 2001, um, you know, 2010 and 13, the results were reasonably as predicted. 2016 was disappointing, but quite frankly, David, uh, no one expected this result tonight. Nobody. Um, to have done as well as we've done. Uh, what this says is that people were not telling the pollsters what they were going to do. This is exactly what we saw in America with Trump. It's exactly what we saw with Brexit. More conservative-minded voters who were a bit intimidated by Get Up and the Greens and the press and some other media organisations that we won't need to mention tonight. Um, pressured, uh, didn't tell the pollsters what they were doing. It's a revolt by the middle classes, uh, working class people against Labor, against higher taxes. It's a revolt by the mining states in Queensland and Western Australia against this anti-mining push we've seen from the Greens. Um, and you've seen in Queensland, you saw in the Hunter uh, with Joel Fitzgibbon said, a remarkable result there he won, but a remarkable swing against him. So you're seeing people worried about their jobs, their taxes, their house prices, and they didn't want to let Bill Shorten loose on the Australian economy. And as many people said to me over recent weeks, why would we put in charge of our tax system a fellow that's never actually had a job in the private sector? Some might think that's unkind, but when you're, when you're making fundamental changes to our taxation system and our way of life, you're led by, the Labor Party's led by someone that's you know, never worked in the private sector, never employed anybody. And that was part of his unpopularity. He ran a very good campaign, I might say, Shorten, as did Morrison was spectacular. Um, you know, both sides performed well. There's no, no, no doubt about that. I thought Shorten, apart from the mistake on Super, was, ran a very good campaign. But in the end, people don't want all these higher taxes. They don't want the mining industry shut down in this country. And they don't want older people attacked. So, but there are lessons for the Liberal Party too. I mean, we've got to campaign more forcefully, you know, against Get Up and these groups. Uh, to lose Tony Abbott is a, is, a, is a tragedy for the Liberal Party. Uh, obviously, congratulations to Zali Stegall. But to lose someone like Abbott is, uh, you know, a very sad day for the party amidst, amidst a sea of happiness, David. Um, and look, there looks, there's 13 in doubt. We've got to win four of those. So you would think all things being equal, we would get four and that Morrison will form a majority government. I'm always very cautious about these things, but as you know, but you'd think we'd win four of 13. Morrison becomes prime minister again, utterly remarkable. And um, that bloke that put a million dollars that we read about in the paper the other day on Labor, I think it was at $1.13. <laughs> mm. oh, 
Yeah. Extraordinary. So good. Extraordinary. Yep. No, indeed. Oh. Ouch, indeed. I tell you what, I wonder, I wonder, oh, Michael, I wish thank we could you, find out who he was. I'd like to interview him. Yeah, but some <laughs> he wouldn't the, want to do the interview, though. Give me the bloke <laughs> sobbing down the street. Yeah. Some of the odds that were being offered on the coalition, uh, you start to think, $7 maybe you could, the other day, yeah, I really got put on. a few I bucks really on that, mate. Uh, <laughs> if you put your million bucks on that, Peter. Uh, all right, now, look, a few interesting points there that Michael raises. Just to tell you that Bill Shorten has not phoned Scott Morrison yet. We've just confirmed that, so that call has not been made yet. Uh, but we are expecting to see Bill Shorten um, before too long, within the next half hour or so. Look, it, Richard Miles, you know, I know this is a tough night. Uh, when you agree to come on an election panel, <laughs> you don't expect to... Oh, well, it, it's clearly... It's always a possibility. It is always a possibility, you, you can... uh, which means you've got to face some of these questions. Yep. I mean, has Bill Shorten just lost the unlosable election? Uh, look, I, I, I'm... <laughs> Bill has not made the call, as you just reported, um, and he hasn't spoken. And I'm not about to preempt any of that process. Um, I, I think it is worth making this point that, um, you know, we have actually been a really unified group of people since 2013. That's and true. it came off a period of time, you know, which I lived through and Stephen lived through, which was um, terrible. Um, in terms of the, the, the constant disunity that we, we faced. Stephen uh, reckons voters don't care too much about uh, this. I, well, actually... They just re-elected the uh, Morrison government after I'm not six so years of chopping and changing. Uh, well, let's see how that plays out, but, but I, I'm not... I think stability matters. Um, in any event, um, after a really difficult period, Bill has presided over a, a very unified team. Um, and I think the one thing that we owe... Bill now is is that uh, you know th this this is I mean we'll follow his lead um, at, at this moment so I'm not about to preempt. Any no, and I understand that he is still your leader and uh, you, you've got to you know, allow him the space to concede defeat. <laughs> and there, but there will be big questions about your policy mix. Obviously, your leadership will change. Um, Richo, coming back to who will be leader for Labor? What do you think? Yeah, well, it's. A, it's Depends who runs. Um, Tanya obviously would be uh, hard to beat. Um, I think, oh, I've said before, Chalmers is the coming star, so you'd hope he was in the, in the mix. Um, and, uh, you know, I think um, uh, both Bowen and, uh, and Burke have had the baton in the knapsack for quite some time and they're probably going to pull it out, so um, there'll be a few. But <coughs> they'll be taking on a tough task whoever it is, oh. right, in trying, to, in trying to walk back some of these unpopular policies, it would seem, particularly... In well, morale is going to be the, the first thing they've got, they've got to rebuild because no, no, no good pussyfooting around. Labor expected to win. And uh, so there are going to be a lot of very disappointed people. Mm. And so you've got to inject hope back into them, give them some inspiration, get them going, get them firing. Is there, is there a bigger challenge, though, Richo, for the Labor Party, uh, after losing this one to work out how it represents Queensland in particular while also trying to appeal to Victoria? I mean, how do you juggle <coughs> climate issues, concerns around that intergenerational warfare? Uh, how, how, do the, how do you balance all that? I don't know. I mean, it, it seems to me pretty obvious that a lot of Queenslanders just don't trust Labor to manage the till. Now, that's something that we really do have to overcome. Uh, if we don't... And we continue to, drag, <coughs> to lag behind in Queensland as far as we are, then I, I don't see a path to victory. I, I mean, we're, we really are going to struggle. You have to win so many, and you can't win too many more in Victoria. We've got no, everybody we... from now <laughs> to the sun. I mean, we, we, we are going to have to find a way in Queensland. Uh, you know, Palaszczuk found a way. She's unbeatable in the state. Mm. Um, so there is a way, mm. uh, just we haven't found it yet. And if we can't beat Dutton one day, I, mean, I think we should all go get, take ourselves out and, and give up and let another team take over. Let me go back to Andrew Bolt uh, for some final thoughts from you, Andrew, uh, tonight. This has been quite a night indeed. We're yet to hear from the two leaders. But I guess there's uh, the, the two sides here. Scott Morrison and the authority he will carry uh, as a re-elected Prime Minister. And then where to for Labor? What are your thoughts? Well, uh, first of all, uh, pick up something that uh, Peter Credlin said earlier tonight which is absolutely true. Scott Morrison's authority is now going to be enormous. Um, it's mitigated, of course, by the fact that he may well have to form a minority government, but put that to one side. 
He has won an incredible election that almost nobody, nobody thought was possible. So that alone puts him in a huge position of power. But more than that, he has lost the left-wing rump of the party that caused so much havoc by taking the party for a three-year frolic where it shouldn't have been on global warming and all that kind of thing. Gone is Malcolm Turnbull. Gone is Christopher Pine. Gone is Julie Bishop. Gone is Craig Laundy and Julia Banks and, and others too. It is a complete cleansing of that particular part of the party. Could add George Brandis to it. It is so liberating for him. Uh, Tony Abbott, I think, is a, a giant of a man, a great man, uh, but gone is one distraction less that uh, Scott Morrison has. So his authority is going to be huge. And there will now... This, I mean, Labor and the uh, Greens call this a climate change election. I tell you what's changed, the intellectual climate. Because looking at Labor, their confidence in global warming extremist policies will now be absolutely shattered. They cannot go to an election with policies like that ever again. And so when they're casting around for the next leader, I'd rather it was one of the guys sitting on your panel, uh, Richard Miles. It cannot be someone who has signed up holus bolus to the global warming uh, scare campaign because they have to go back from that. This will be a complete climate change, literally, in uh, the way we think about global warming. You think about Malcolm Turnbull. That is one more power that's been smashed. You look at the campaign that he ran with his son, Alex, and I suspect there's money involved. Don't, you know, don't get me wrong on that. I think that might come out. Uh, they had almost no effect. The great anti-Adani uh, sweep of protest has had almost... Well, had backfired. It's absolutely backfired. And, in fact, in Queensland, the Queensland Labor government, mark this, will be panicking about the results... The, the implication of this for their state election and the objections they've been throwing in the way of the Adani coal mine will go and the federal elect and the federal government will approve it. Adani will go ahead. This has been an amazing cultural change in our, uh, in our history. I think this is one of the most significant elections I can recall. Well, that's, uh, that's a very good point there, uh, Andrew. It, it, the, the impact this will have right across the board... Of course, we should contemplate the Senate as well, and maybe um, if we could just bring up that primary vote earlier uh, to see how that looks. If the coalition's sitting on about 41 per cent, I mean, I'm only suspecting here what that means in the Senate, but uh, it could mean the coalition, in fact, gaining Senate seats here and perhaps having, Andrew, an easier path in the Senate as well. And that would be just icing on the cake now for Scott Morrison. Yes, I mean, it's always going to be tricky because we've got a Senate with the crossbenchers have long realised for three consecutive parliaments now, it started with Julia Gillard in particular, uh, and then uh, Tony Abbott and, and, Scott and uh, Malcolm Turnbull, uh, we have crossbenchers who realise they're paralysed in saying no. As soon as you say yes to whatever the government wants, you have no power. While you say no, you've got them on the rack, you've got media attention, you please your constituency and you might get some trade-off. This is a real cancer. But, uh, so that's going to be tricky. But I do agree that the Senate will be marginally, We've... could be marginally easier. Andrew Bolt, thank oh. you very much for your contributions tonight. We'll let you go there. Bill Shorten, as you can see, has just arrived there at the Labor venue uh, with his wife Chloe by his side and uh, walking into what's going to be a very, very difficult moment for him. There's no doubt this night has been a whole lot harder for Bill Shorten and all of Labor than what they were hoping for and certainly what they were expecting. Uh, two elections Bill Shorten has fought and, uh, look, he did a lot better than everyone thought last time around in 2016. He's done a lot worse than everyone thought this time around in 2019. Labor has not got there. The question now is, will it be the coalition in a majority government or a minority government, but not much chance for Labor there, Peter Cridlin? No, absolutely not. I, think the, I, I actually think the coalition will get to a majority position. I said that a little bit earlier on, and there's more that are coming through. Um, I think it's just such a reminder on Get Up. This is the first time the coalition has really taken on Get Up head on, called them out for being this activist organisation, not really grassroots. Uh, Advance Australia was formed a couple of months ago. It started to land some punches. You know, good on Peter Dutton. We saw that in Dixon. I think there are a lot of other issues in the Warringah vote beyond just Get Up. But I don't think Get Up's had a great campaign right around the country. Uh, and I think Stephen Conroy made the point that Get Up's been disastrous uh, for the left side of politics. But Indulgent. this is such 
a reminder that, that a share of the voice doesn't mean a share of the vote. So, you know, if you're a big noise uh, through the elites and through the media, that does not equate to share of vote. Well, and just to drive that point home, uh, Phelps has failed. You can declare uh, Wentworth safe for Sharma. That's right. Uh, he, That's right. Maybe we could bring that up. He is up. Um, he is up. He's, uh, he's, he is you, uh, yep. you can call it now. It's, okay. it's over. And I think Macquarie's getting better for the Libs. I think that's uh, one already called. Uh, there's no, we think it's getting better for us. Oh, OK. Oh, there's yeah, Wentworth. We'll check in at Macquarie in a moment. moment. But there's Wentworth now, and you can see... It's uh, oh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's not a clue. Right. Um, I, I'd say that uh, Sharma's probably going to win this something like 52 and a half. Yeah. Maybe even 53. No, so. right. Sharma's... All right. Well, if you uh, have just joined us or if you've been watching throughout the night, it's gone 11 o'clock now on the East Coast, and that's five hours since the close of polls and the counting began. And, boy, what a ride it's been in that time. Here is how the state of the House looks right now, and it is all going the Coalition's way. We've got 64% of the, of the votes counted. The Coalition sitting on 72, 76 being the magic number, the target to get a majority... Labor's still stuck back on 61. We've still got 12 undecided seats. So only four more need to go to the Coalition to give them the majority. And if, even if they don't get those four, they're a whole lot closer, far more likely to form a minority government. Labor, it's just out of reach now. Three independents, Rebecca Sharkey for Centre Alliance, Bob Catter and Adam Bant the Green. And here's how the Chamber is looking right now. As you can see, the Coalition, the blue here, almost at a majority in its own right. Labor just stuck there on 61 it has not been a good night at all for Bill Shorten, who's just arrived at the Labor venue there in Melbourne. We're going to hear from him shortly. About 10 minutes ago, uh, the mail we were getting was that he had not yet made any phone call to Scott Morrison to concede defeat. Whether that's going to change in the next 10 minutes or so, we're expecting to see him soon. The vote share across the country, the national vote share, the coalition, 41.2%. Bear in mind, the opinion polls, even as late as today, had them stuck at 39%. Historically an unwinnable position for the Coalition, but it turns out the polls were wrong. 41% and climbing, 41.2%, as more of these West Australian votes come into the mix now as well. And it may seem some of these early vote numbers coming into the mix too. Labor's primary vote is below 34%, down at 33.8%. What does that tell us? One third of the Australian electorate willing to vote Labor, that's all. Then we have the Greens, 10.4%. That's... Not a bad result for the Greens. Doesn't increase their numbers in the House. We'll see whether it holds their numbers in the Senate. 4% other, uh, 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 the um, United Australia Party, Clive Palmer Party, 3.4%. I think we had uh, One Nation on a little, uh, a similar 3% uh, vote last time we checked on that as well. Let's go back to the Liberal Party headquarters where Laura Jays and Paul Murray are standing by. Uh, and... Scott Morrison, we know, is there. Bill Shorten is at his venue, so I guess it's now a question of when the phone call is made and when we're going to see a concession speech and a victory speech from the two leaders. But there's no doubt, Paul and Laura, as to uh, what's happened here tonight now. Yeah, when uh, or if a concession uh, phone call is made, I can tell you in the room now, it is buzzing. Uh, this is a, a victory that no-one in this room expected, even the... Uh, the rusted on of all rusted on Liberal Party supporters. There was a chant that went up a little while ago, uh, ScoMo, and I think it will be a presidential welcome. There is no doubt he has run a presidential campaign. This victory can be slated to home to him personally quite strongly. Now, the story at the moment, all eyes are on WA. With those votes coming in now, uh, David, as you just went through the numbers, that primary vote for the Liberal Party is at 41%, Labor 34 uh, so the path to victory for Labor isn't there uh, for the, the Liberal Party now. They've got 75. The Coalition well, have got 75 in their column and they are feeling good. There is uh, obviously a sense of relief, surprise, um, at times uh, all sorts of emotions that will uh, that'll play out uh, here. A Trumpian-esque effect in the idea that the polls, the pundits... Um, uh, the bookies were absolute that there was no shot, no chance. The coverage all day... We can day... bust a few myths here tonight, well, I was going to say, that's what we've got to jump on too, and I know you guys have been doing that very excellently here. We need to stop talking about Get Up. Get Up has had a very significant win, and I will uh, offer my best of thoughts to Tony Abbott, and I think there'd be some people who even voted against Tony Abbott tonight who, when they saw that speech, 
Well, they may well have not fully regretted it, but they would understand the calibre of person that they're bou bounced out of the parliament. But get up when it was as focused as that, OK, but it had the, the, all of these other factors on top of it in that particular seat. They have not performed in Dixon. They have not performed in Boothby. They have not performed uh, against Michael Suka. They have not performed against Craig Kelly. Um, they are a, a, a very loud, very noisy machine. But And we'll get into the analysis as days roll on. Um, but quite obviously, there is a massive shove back that happens at that election as a result of this election. And much of it also has to be some of the emphasis that we put the, on those splendid And, Paul, groups. this has been a bit of a cleansing for the Liberal Party, you'd Absolutely. have to say. There's been a, a purging, uh, you know, as uh, I've said, all the way through this can campaign, Tony Abbott has always been a divisive figure. This campaign didn't change any of that. But uh, there are a few problems that Scott Morrison doesn't have to deal with. He doesn't have to deal uh, with, you know, a few of these individuals oh. and their personalities butting heads. There's no Christopher Pine, there's no uh, Tony Abbott, there's no Malcolm Turnbull, there's no Kelly Julie Bishop, O'Dwyer, there's no Kelly Julie Bishop. Bishop. Pine. The list goes on. So, you know, that makes it a lot easier for him. He's unified. This is a clear victory. And, uh, you know, he has the authority in the party. Well, and, and he's made that very clear, that the truth is that tonight has only happened because of the strategy, the messaging, the execution, the policy attack. And let's be honest, at that Sky News forum, remember when everyone was talking about that moment of confrontation? Now, the essentially, Latham moment. well, most people read that. Do we miss the Latham moment? Well, they read it the wrong way. It was in reverse. The assumption of the establishment was that Scott Morrison was diminished by that moment, that he was diminished by... Um, the death of Bob Hawke, that he was diminished by the Labor Party machine when the absolute truth was that when it came to uh, a speech on a rainy night in Brisbane, he did it with no, without any notes. Bill Shorten had to read from notes when, when speaking about a friend who passed away, as difficult as that is. When you talk about uh, debate performance, everyone said he wasn't aggressive enough. Well, if he was too aggressive, then he would have lost points along the way. Scott Morrison deserves his place yeah. on that Liberal Mount Rushmore now because he did this alone. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Even the Nationals gave him credit for saving those seats in North Queensland. Look, I would just say one thing about the result. It's not uniform. We knew this wasn't going to be a uniform swing, so there are, are pockets of messages right over the country. What it says about climate change... I have no idea what it says. I got an about idea. The, what it says <laughs> I'll get back to you at nine o'clock tomorrow. <laughs> what it says about the polls, we need to look elsewhere. Correct. Well, as I said, Trump in Australia, it's happened. <laughs> All right, uh, Paul, Laura, thank you both uh, very much for that. Look, I think a really interesting point there too that they both made. If you consider 12 months ago, uh, Malcolm Turnbull was Prime Minister, Julie Bishop was the Deputy Liberal Leader and Foreign Minister, you had Christopher Pine as Leader of the House, you had Tony Abbott on the back bench. All of these characters now gone. And Scott Morrison, if you had asked someone 12 months ago, would Scott Morrison be Prime Minister, re-elected, winning an election, and all of them gone... Boy, oh boy, the world has changed for the Liberal Party. It is a very different party now that returns to government under the, well, leadership authority of Scott Morrison. Let's go to the Labor Party headquarters where Kieran Gilbert and Nick Rees are standing by and we saw Bill Shorten arrive there just a short time ago. Uh, what are the conversations going on in the room there now, Kieran? Well, uh, I'd love to know, David. I'm trying to ascertain whether or not there will be a concession or not. Bill Shorten is here. He's going to speak to the crowd shortly one of his close advisors said to me they don't think there'll be a concession tonight so uh, they want to see the rest of the votes counted before a final judgment is made apparently according to this one staff member i don't know definitively though because i've got to say bill shorten chloe shorten would be reeling tonight in the face of these numbers so i'm not sure how much they'd be communicating with all of their staff members anyway nick Look, you can only imagine the shock that Bill Shorten is going through at the moment. Uh, I mean, he spent every day of his waking adult life working towards this evening uh, and what he thought was going to be his rise to the Prime Ministership, and that has not happened. So uh, I think you can understand we're all human. Uh, he, he must be really struggling at the moment. He's arrived here at the building, and we're expecting him to speak shortly, uh, but... Like everyone here, I'm sure he's very, very upset. Do you think he will probably hold off on the concession? Because uh, there are a number of seats still in doubt. 
I mean, it's clear he's not going to be able to form government, isn't it? Look, I think we will see Bill Shorten speak uh, soon. He has arrived here. Uh, I believe Daniel Andrews, the Premier, is in the building as well. Um, we know that there's established protocol about how these things work, and uh, I would expect Bill Shorten to get up soon, and I think the numbers uh, would indicate uh, which way this election is going. Well, you're right. He did expect to be Prime Minister. In fact, his language today was... We'll, he will be swear, uh, swearing in our cabinet and talking about that sort of thing pr prematurely, as it turns out. But we've all been, well, many of us have been sideswiped by the result in terms of predictions based on the polling, which has just been fundamentally flawed or proven wrong. It's it happened before, of course, in the, the French presidential election. We've seen upsets in the, the US and now this particular result. Yeah, I mean, this is a result for the ages, uh, obviously for the uh, coalition. It's the sweetest victory of all. For Labor, it will require a lot of... Uh, assessment to be done. I think we're going to be analysing this result for a long, long time to come, Kieran. And there's, uh, you know, a lot of lessons in this for Labor, but I think there's probably lessons for the Coalition as well. A lot of uh, mention of the all-powerful all Scott Morrison. There's just a couple of other names I would mention, of course, beyond Josh Frydenberg, Matthias Cormann, is Ben Morton, former WA Liberal Party director, travelled with the Prime Minister throughout the whole campaign, one of Scott Morrison's most trusted confidants. He will be in the Ministry in the next uh, Morrison Ministry. David Spears, back to you. That's an interesting point there, Kieran. And uh, Nick Rees, thank you very much for that. I mean, there's uh, going to have to be some ministerial holes filled here, Matthias Cormann, based on just the departures that you've had. Uh, Nigel Scullion, Michael Keenan, um, Kelly, Kelly O'Dwyer, uh, Christopher Pine. Well, we know some of uh, Linda Reynolds becomes Defence Minister, but... Um, you're willing to you know, throw any names in the mix as to who's going to be joining you on the front? Let's, oh, no, let's, let's not get ahead of ourselves. That is, uh, you know, I mean, obviously, uh, you know, let's let's just uh, get through all of the formalities tonight, and the prime minister, in good time, uh, will, uh, you know, make these uh, judgments and decisions, and he uh, will make these announcements at the appropriate time, and it's not tonight. But for you, I mean, let me just ask you: you you must be well, relieved. Are you looking forward to another? three years in the Ministry? Well, look, I mean, that is entirely a matter for the Prime Minister, but I'm, I am relieved. I'm relieved for the Australian people because I genuinely believe that uh, Bill Shorten's agenda would have made our economy weaker, would have made our country weaker, uh, and would and was uh, was based on uh, an approach that would have turned Australia against Australia. I'm relieved for the Australian people that we, uh, have, that we continue to have the opportunity uh, to uh, encourage and uh, incentivise aspiration to uh, ensure that Australians today and into the future have the best possible opportunity to get ahead. Uh, and I'm relieved that as a team we continue to have the opportunity to serve, to uh, make our country stronger and to ensure... Mate, mate the election's over. No, no, but I'm... Yes, I'm you don't have to campaign I mean, anymore, I'm you won't. I'm answering the question. I'm answering the question. No, fair enough. Uh, uh, look, there is still that lingering question, Peter, about the agenda. For the third term? Well, yeah, obviously, but, obviously but not for the Australian people. But, but I think the Prime Minister now will get a chance to really shape it the way that he wants to shape it. I think that there were probably compromises made uh, to get through in, in fair shape to election night, never f for a moment thinking, I think, that they could actually win a majority. I think some cancers, quite frankly, have been cut out of the Liberal Party, uh, and he will have a much... Uh, more open hand, I suppose, than my former boss did uh, with some of the people that have departed. So good on uh, Scott Morrison. Good on the Liberals. I hope, I hope they have a common sense agenda. They don't need to set the world on fire. People want government out of their lives. Uh, David Spears, they want to be able to plan with confidence. They want to be able to get ahead and keep whatever it is uh, in their pocket when they do get ahead. Yep. Um, and also, I have to say, I tell you what, every lobbyist in the country will be scrambling tonight because no one predicted this result. I mean, a lot of them stopped <laughs> ringing the, the coalition. They had been courting the, the Labor people. They'll be hitting the phones, won't they, Richard Miles? Well, they will true. be hitting the phones. No, I'm sure that's right. Some of the uh, some of the lobby groups, though, I'm thinking in the property sector in particular, uh, will be celebrating this result. And, um, you know, they, they've done their bit to help uh, through this campaign on the negative gearing policies from Labor. Um, Richo, for Labor... You can't just drop policies you've taken to two elections easily. I mean, I know they may want to walk away from some of this stuff, but it's going to hang around their neck for a while. That's why, if, if Labor's smart, they will drop them quickly. Because if you don't, uh, and they hang around like a bad smell on a lift, you are in all sorts of trouble. Um, and, and you can't get ahead 
So my earnest hope is that Labor ditches the silly ones right now. What do you think about the 45% emissions reduction? Is that, is that something Labor can walk away from or is that just right in the heart of the true uh, that, That's a hard one, but I, again, I think you have to look at results and you have to react to them. You can't pretend. And if 45 is too high, then lower it. And I think that's, that's certainly what I'd do if I was Labor leader. I would look at these results and say it is not sustainable for us to keep going with something that the people are rejecting. Um, if we do that, we're guaranteeing further losses. I'm going to cut our losses and this is what we'll set. My new number is X. That's what I'd do. Stephen Connor. No, I think we've been very, very forward-leaning, if I were to put it at its most polite. Uh, I think our inability to guarantee baseload supply uh, and our positions around Adani uh, have left us vulnerable to uh, punishment in Queensland. And for those who wanted to believe that that would benefit us in a Victorian situation, our Victorian results are good, but they're not anywhere near good enough to balance the fact that we've made no progress, if not gone backwards, in Queensland. Uh, so I think certainly there has to be some pragmatism around our climate position uh, so that we can reposition ourselves. And I've always believed, and I've said so publicly many times and privately in the party, if we can't guarantee baseload supply mm. uh, into the next five and ten years, will we make the transition? That's not about not making the transition, but you've got to be able to guarantee baseload supply. So you think the headline... 45% emissions reduction is something that will need to be looked at by Labor? Yeah, no, I, I think when, when you look at what caused... Uh, well, I think the thing we struggled with the most, that it was sometimes difficult to watch our, our front benches try and explain what the costs around uh, our policy were. Yep. Uh, because we were so forward-leaning, I think that... That was my biggest uh, issue. If there was a negative, if you want to go, oh, that an one, Achilles I think. Heel. It was an Achilles, Achilles heel. And we were exposed and we looked uncomfortable trying to explain, <coughs> explain that. Richard Miles, do you agree? Uh, look, I think, again, I, I, I feel like I would like to hear... Uh, Bill speak, and I think he, he's, he's about to. But yeah. no, I, don't I mean, that's and, and there, but, but the there are, I mean, you know, there, there are some things you can say. One is, um, we are uh, a reformist party, and um, being ambitious and having policy is, is, is in our DNA. Um, it's also obvious to make the point that, and, and Graham's completely right. I mean, you, you need to look at results, and you need to appropriately react to them. And at the end of the day. Um, you know, being pragmatic and engaging in the art of the possible is what politics is about. Um, now, we need to have a look at all of that um, in the light of what falls out of tonight um, and, uh, and work our way forward. Um, but, um, you know, I think it's really important that um, we do that um, in a way which, which um, holds true to who we are as a party. I want to show you this state-by-state -state look at Labor's primary vote uh, it's a fascinating chart of where our country's at, I suppose, and some of the issues we're talking about here in Labor's policy mix. But in New South Wales, it sits at just under 35%, the primary vote for Labor. In Victoria, that's its strong state, right? It's sitting at 36.8%. Bear in mind, ACT is a, um, a different kettle of fish in a small jurisdiction. But Victoria and New South Wales are the two big states, and that's where the primary vote sits in Queensland, then it drops right down. It is, it is what, 9% lower in Queensland than it is in Victoria. Well, we clearly have to be competitive in Queensland. I mean, that, again, that is to state the obvious. Uh, and, and if you're getting less than 30% of the vote in a state but, like Queensland... I, I think uh, the Libs got a little bit of a pick-up out of Queensland or the LNP because of Malcolm not running this time round. Honestly, because he did not resonate... Uh, in 2016, so I think there's been some gains on the back of that. Scott Morrison has really resonated in Queensland. Well, that's true. But can I just... Uh, Graham was also right that, it, it, like, Labor can put an electable proposition to the people of Queensland, and Anastasia Palaszczuk has, has proven that. Um, and I think 
Now, running Australia, running any country, we're a G20 country. There are going to be complexities and there are going to be differences from one place to another. And it's about making sure that you can balance those in, in, a, in a sensible way. But clearly, we need to be um, competitive in Queensland. And you're not, state based office. on that. So this is the coalition. Let's take a look at this. The coalition state by state primary vote right now. New South Wales is up at 42.8%. That's a, that's a terrific result for the coalition in West New South Australia, Wales. Western Australia, 44.6%. I'd put yeah. that down to Matthias Corbyn. Uh, New South Wales is very <laughs> strong. It's, it's, West Australians um, have always, obviously, uh, been uh, you know, very much in favour of a pro-growth agenda. And then in Victoria... They wanted to secede once. Yeah. That, that's a really not scared really of aspiration in the West. <laughs> in Victoria, it's sitting at just under 39%, which is roughly where the polls were suggesting it would be nationally. But, uh, you know, that's the, that's the weak spot there, uh, Peter Credlin. It's not unexpected. And if someone had said to them Friday night that they would get that as a primary vote out of Victoria, they would have been doing cartwheels. Right? So that, yeah, that is a terrific result. I think there was think... a poll, an Ipsos poll, saying it was 34% or something to Victoria. I'll tell you, one thing I would love to see come out of this is that, and I'm talking against my employer here, that we give up this cycle of fortnightly polls. I think it is so damaging to our democracy and that we need to let governments and opposition to get on with proper policy making like they used to be when I started in politics in 98 and stop this personality churn, uh, the issues churn, it's not, it's not good the way that we fixate on these fortnightly but polls. I mean, we can see now how far away they are from the actual real results. I mean, I think, I think that's true, what, what Peter's saying. Uh, I mean, there's been a bit of discussion about the polls polling tonight. I, th I think the truth of it is, and I'm not the expert on this, but the way in which people uh, communicate with each other and communicate with the world is so... Uh, varied now compared to what it was 20 years ago when everyone had a landline and that's how you, you communicated, has meant that the art of polling is much harder. Mm. But what in turn that means is that news poll, indeed all the polls, um, are less valid um, now than they were. But um, we've and, rolled Prime Ministers on the oh, back of those no, polls. No, the, You've it, done it, the it, same thing. The, the tyranny of the news poll is... Yeah, I completely you know, agree with you. Give and, the Australian and yet, people... And if you go back 15 years, that news poll might have been uh, a valid um, a picture into what the Australian people were thinking. What, what's patently clear now um, is that it's not. But um, it also didn't have the frequency. That's you know, true, I too. think this is the other thing. It didn't have it's the frequency. A rolling... So it forced people to get into the policy debate. I mean, there used to be people covering rounds who were health yeah. reporters, who were foreign affairs writers that, that were, you know... People, when you got a phone call, when you worked in an office in a particular portfolio, when you got a call from particular people covering portfolio areas, you knew, Richard, you've done defence, they knew everything about that policy area. So I think that's right. where the scrutiny and transparency yeah. should Just, come. Uh, I, I should note, because, you know, again, in the polling discussion, there'll be a lot of focus on who is closest to the pin. Uh, Ipsos did have the ALP on 34. It's come in just a... Touch under that, I think, and uh, had the Libs on 39, and it's obviously come in at 41. So I think they might, Ipsos. in fact, be closest. For all the, you know, scorn put on uh, yep. Ipsos poll every now and then, might be closest to the mark. We'll see. Anyway, the state of the parties right now, uh, the coalition's crept up another one there to 73 seats now, uh, and Labor on 61. We're down to 11 still in the mix, 11 undecided, so the Coalition's inched another bit closer. They need three more to get to that majority. And perhaps we should have a look at those 11 undecided, the cliffhangers, if we can, to see who's ahead in which uh, of those 11 seats still to come. So Blair is where Labor's ahead with a 2,310-vote margin. But then you've got the Libs in front in Boothby, and Chisholm still, isn't that amazing? Only just 320 votes there in Chisholm. But that's a remarkable result there for the Libs in that part of Melbourne. Uh, Karangamite, the Liberals ahead uh, by what looks like a, a stronger... Uh, Labour ahead. Oh, sorry, Labour ahead. Labor's sorry, Labour ahead. Yep. 2,300 votes there. And then uh, Labour ahead in Cowan as well. Let's flip to the next page. The uh, remaining cliffhangers... And you can see that uh, Labor's still ahead in Dobell, Ed Monero and Lily, but then Macquarie in the Blue Mountains <coughs> and Swan in the West, the Libs are ahead. So that puts the Libs ahead in what... Uh, and there's the final one, Wentworth, yeah. where um, Karen Phelps is clinging on. But I think they had the Libs ahead in, what, four of those 11 seats? It needs to get 
three of those to win a majority? Six, yeah. What do you they're think? going to get their majority. You think they'll um, get the majority? Yeah, I think that's the way it, it's turned, and I think that that's what's going to happen. There'll be no change in Western Australia. It'll be exactly the same. I think that's right. Yep. All right. Well, we're also standing by to see uh, Bill Shorten emerge. I think we've got a live shot there um, at the venue where the opposition leader, the Labor leader, probably not for too much longer to hold that title, though. He is going to emerge uh, to give his speech. We don't know. I haven't had an update yet on when that's likely to happen. I'm sure there's a lot going on behind the scenes there. Um, Richard, well, what would be going on behind the scenes there right now? Obviously, they need to know whether it's all lost or not. That's yeah. the first thing. I mean, the first thing is to um, know exactly what the situation is. Um, I mean, the, the uh, in a sense, the concession speech is the moment when the election... Is called, and so you don't make it unless you're sure. You'd be really um, scrutiny, isn't and, and, it? And so, you, you, so the first thing is you, you want to know exactly where, you, where you're at. Um, I mean, this has clearly not been the night that, that Bill would have imagined, and um, it must be uh, really difficult for Bill. Um, and uh, you know, it's, it, it feels very sad. Um, Bill and I have been um, friends for since we were teenagers and, um, you know, I spoke to him earlier today and uh, we were very hopeful of, of, of obviously a different result. Um, and here is someone who, from his teenage years, was thinking about being Prime Minister. You know, it goes right back then, according to some of the profiles that ran this week. Uh, you know, and had a pretty fast rise historically when he entered Parliament, didn't he, to, to the leadership, Stephen Conroy? Yeah, no, look, I mean, he went pretty much straight onto the front bench uh, in that parliamentary secretary role, uh, and he's been a significant player in the Labor Party, the Labor movement, uh, and I'm sure, like Richard, I've known him since he was a teenager, and I'm sure he is absolutely devastated that the evening has not panned out as all expectations from all the public polling, the private polling. Uh, I'm sure he is sitting there... Uh, absolutely devastated. What is it about Bill Shorten, you think, that the Australian people weren't willing to embrace? I think, for those of us who know him well, he's, he's come across in the media uh, over the six years. I think he's, he, he's got better and better and better, but the early impressions where he... Uh, his authenticity that, if you've known him, is there... Uh, has just not translated in those early days, and that really stuck. Uh, I mean, if you looked how he campaigned in, in 2016, you could see the real Bill. He just loved campaigning. He loved getting out there among the people. Uh, but those, those early uh, signs really stuck uh, that he, he didn't... People, didn't really, people would often say to you, I don't know what he stands for. Uh, and so... Uh, I would, and they'd often ask me, given they knew that I'd known him for so long. I said, look, he, he really is engaging, funny, all of those things that you know about Bill behind the scenes, and many of you have all talked to yeah. Bill privately. But that just wasn't able to translate in the early days, and that seemed to stick rather than what I thought was uh, a more uh, relaxed and, and comfortable campaigner, particularly following the 2016 election. Opposition's hard to... I mean, you know, to do six years of opposition. Yeah. And, and I've, you know, paid a lot of credit to his staff, his backroom team. Um, I think particularly the last campaign result in 2016, but I guess all their conduct, uh, the unity which you talked about, yeah. that is not easy no, in opposition. Not, um... It's incredibly hard. And, um, and the commitment from his family, none of that uh, goes without great sacrifice. Um, this is one of the things we... We went through an opposition, you know, it's, it's particularly tough, you know who your friends are. And, you know, this is where Scott Morrison, in, in many respects, hasn't even had that training as opposition leader, yet here he is being returned as, as a Prime Minister in a very unexpected result. And, can I, you know, Bill, um, you know, Bill stood for working people. I mean, he, he Bill and I um, both finished our law degrees at the same time. We both did articles at a law firm at the same time. Um, Bill was really keen to work for a trade union as an organiser, um, which means getting up really early in the morning uh, and representing working people in the workplace. Um, he was the reason why I ended up doing uh, working for a trade union as well. And 
Um, he, he passionately believed in that. Um, and so the idea that, you know, I mean, he, he really deeply stood for something. And I think that uh, during the period as opposition leader, Peter is absolutely right. It, it is the hardest job in and, politics. And don't forget, I mean, you know, he saw off two prime ministers. Yeah, That's right. And... and, and and, 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 and not only that, but I think, you know, managed to... And, and takes credit for that. Not all of it, because yeah. obviously Liberal infighting and so on has a bit to do with it. But he managed to pick that fairness argument well on things like the company tax cuts and, and really brought Turnbull unstuck on that issue. Oh, I, I know, think during those Super Saturday by-elections, you know, he picked the 2014 budget straight out of the blocks totally on, right. on the um, fairness question and hammered that, hammered and, that, and, hammered and, that. And, and, and he hammered on the banks too. That's and he had that dead right. The banks, uh, you know, we're putting hospitals before banks or whatever that slogan yeah. was. And but he got, he got the 2014 budget absolutely right in terms of what our <laughs> strategy should be and he pulled it apart, um, you know... Yeah, no, a, sharp, a sharp opposition, uh, lady, I, but not willing to embrace him as Prime Minister, it would seem, the Australian people. Let me just quickly go to Laura Jays and Paul Murray. They're over at the Liberal headquarters tonight. We're yet to see any movement from the two leaders at either venue here, but uh, what do you got, guys? Well, I can tell you, David, exactly what is happening now is the waiting game that everyone is playing out. But I want to tell you what everyone doesn't know uh, publicly at the moment, and that is exactly what is happening now. And there is uh, no phone call that has happened yet between Bill Shorten and Scott Morrison. Uh, as I understand, the Prime Minister does want to follow the convention of accepting that phone call, hearing a public concession and then making public comments for obvious reasons to this room, Laura. But there is uh, a... Back channel conversation as such that is happening not between the leaders but between the parties. So but let's let's be honest. At half past eleven, while there is uh, you know a very public discussion about the where to from here, when the result is as obvious as it is, we're getting pretty close to some pretty ungracious. Well, Labor, Labor obviously think it doesn't uh, it isn't as obvious as uh, the rest of us. Uh, they should tell their panels on our channel. Exactly, exactly. But. Look, the officers obviously are speaking to each other. I don't know what about uh, negotiating a time, handing over phones, but that phone call between the two leaders has not happened as of, what, just two minutes ago. Yeah, we can, we, we, we've, we've double-checked this at, uh, at the highest possible levels, and I can tell you the Prime Minister is in this building. Um, the, he is, uh, is moving between... Uh, private room here and uh, and a room full of uh, of inner city support uh, inner sanctum supporters as inner city inner city no d not, not the bloke from the shire darling you know that <laughs> is it uh, but but clearly i mean we are getting to this moment where when this played out in 2016 this actually in my view helped shape a problem for malcolm turnbull going through the uh, the first part of his term they never won an opinion poll after that in part because remember this the way keating won in 93 i knew we'd win greatest victory of all one for the true believers it annoys people because it's about you and about the party the sensation i think here is that you've got to be very careful in these moments to say it's not all about me it's thank you to australia but conversely you do yourself and your legacy and your party damage when you cannot see the truth as it is, no matter how painful that truth is, and as everyone from from Richo to, to Richard Miles and right, Stephen, let me just Paul, jump in there, Paul and Laura. People. I'm just I'm just being told. Sorry to jump in. I am being told Bill Shorten has called Scott Morrison to concede defeat. Uh, I'm just hearing that uh, right now. So that news just coming through. Uh, I know you were checking in the last few minutes, but I've just been told that Bill Shorten has called Scott Morrison to concede defeat. Uh, and that will get the ball rolling on these speeches, a concession speech and a victory speech. But, um, <clears throat> yeah, sorry to interrupt you there, Paul and Laura, but uh, late. it is very late. It's uh, 11.30 at night here on the East, and um, that call has just gone through. So that moves things along a little bit. Uh, I'm not sure if we can go to uh, Nick Reese and Kieran Gilbert, who are at the Labor venue, because we'll see them... We'll see them, uh, we'll see activity there before we see Scott Morrison appear, as Paul mentioned, he'll follow tradition and wait for uh, Bill Shorten to concede. But, uh, OK, we'll come back to um, Nick and Kieran in a moment there at the Labor camp. But, look, is he right to wait this there late, Richo? It looks like there's movement at the station. I think he needs to do something pretty... Oh, here we go, there's applause happening. All right, no, but I mean, uh, look, is he right, given where the seat count is, to be waiting yes. until this late at night? Oh, oh, he, should have, he should have done it half an hour ago, but it doesn't matter. It's, it's good enough.
Yeah, you've got to be sure, haven't you, before you put in that call and then front you look up. A, you and, look uh, a, right nut, a right deal if you can't get seated in your plane. <laughs> yeah, uh, um, but he's not going to win, he knows that. Yeah, no, I think that's right. It's, it's how he frames this speech right here. Does he now announce that he's standing down as leader? I'm guessing he probably I myself wouldn't. will not be a candidate. You remember Goff's words? That's <laughs> right, that's right. Um, I would, you know, I think it's probably best thing for the party to clear that up straight away. Um, where were we on the New South Wales election night and Michael Daly didn't? Oh, and went on for a couple of days. Went on for a couple of days yeah, and then no. eventually backed out of the um, contention for the... Anyway, I don't think we're going to see that here after fighting two elections. I mentioned earlier that, uh, you know, you don't get more than two election losses. Kim Beasley did get another crack at it after things didn't go so well for Simon Crean, but um, he never got the chance to fight another election, did he? I wish... Uh, it's yeah. funny, you know, because I, I yeah, think we all say it is... He would, he would have been a great Prime Minister, yeah, Ken. Yeah, it was just yeah. a great tragedy okay. that never made it. Yeah. Kieran and Nick Rees are there over at the Labor right. headquarters in Melbourne. Where uh, Kieran, what can you tell us? Yeah, well, he's very close to speaking, Bill Shorten. It's been tense behind the stage, backstage, we're told by some of the Labor MPs that it's been understandably a bit tense, I guess, trying to work out what exactly they're going to say. Most of us think he probably should just concede because the numbers suggest if the coalition doesn't govern in majority, it's clear that they will have uh, the uh, majority, uh, more seats than the Labor Party, I should say, and be able to form minority government. Tense behind the scenes. He's going to speak very soon, finally, and the waiting game uh, will be done. Look, I think we will hear from Bill Shorten very soon. A lot of his senior advisers and staff are in the room. A lot of the senior Labor Party officials have made their way into the room. So all the signs are that we are going to hear from the opposition leader very, very shortly. Yep, yeah, he's uh, coming through now, apparently. Right now, Bill Shorten with his wife, Chloe, by his side. Now to step up to the stage, this is going to be a very tough moment for the Labor leader, Bill Shorten, after losing tonight's election. Let's have a listen to what he has to say. Friends. Friends. No, no. Friends. OK. I appreciate that, thank you. Friends. OK. Like, I'm really grateful for that, but... I was going to say, but... In the light of your reaction, I'm not sure it's quite as apt, but... I want to say beyond this room to Australians who supported Labor, I know that you're all hurting. And I am too. And without wanting to hold out any false hope, while there are still millions of votes to count and important seats yet to be finalised, it is obvious that Labor will not be able to form the next government. And so in the national interest. A short while ago, I called Scott Morrison to congratulate him. And I wish Jenny, and I wish Jenny and their daughters all the very best. And above all, I wish Scott Morrison good fortune and good courage in the service of our great nation. The national interest required no less. This has been a tough campaign, toxic at times. But now that the contest is over, all of us have a responsibility to respect the result, respect the wishes of the Australian people and to bring our nation together. However, that task we won for the next leader of the Labor Party because whilst I intend to continue to serve as the member for Maribyrn, I will not be a candidate in the next Labor leadership ballot. Along with my family, my precious family, the Labor Party and the trade union movement, it's my life. 
to be able to have served as leader of the Labor Party for five and a half years is a greater honour than anyone who'd my family before me or even I could have dreamed of when I joined the local branch 35 years ago. What I have always loved about the Labor Party, and I still do, is the ideas that we champion. It's the people we empower, the people who count upon us, the people who need good, strong, reforming Labor governments. Gee, I wish we could have formed a government for these Australians on this evening. I wish we could have won for the true believers, for our brothers and sisters and the mighty trade union movement. I wish, I wish we could have done it for Bob. But it was not to be. Labor's next victory will belong to our next leader and I'm confident that victory will come at the next election. Friends, the test, the test even beyond victory, which I set myself in the lead up to this election, was that at 6pm when the polls closed, when the final votes were cast, I wanted to be able to look at myself in the mirror and say there was nothing more that I could have done. No more ideas that we should have expressed. I want to say to our Labor movement and our Labor Party, all of you can say this. We worked incredibly hard. We advanced ideas. We campaigned on a positive vision. We were upfront and clear about the reforms that both sides of politics have ignored for decades. And we have said loud and clear that Australia needs and needed to take real action on climate change. <laughs> Clearly, on climate action, amongst others, parts of our nation remain deeply divided. For the sake of the next generation, Australia must find a way forward on climate change. And clearly, the coalition's arrangements with One Nation and Clive Palmer have heard our vote in a lot of places where it mattered most, particularly in Queensland and New South Wales. Friends, I am disappointed by tonight's results. But I am not disappointed for me. I'll always be proud of the courage and the integrity and the vision that our team showed. I'm disappointed for people who depend upon Labor, but I'm proud that we argued what was right, not what was easy. This is what politics should be in our country. Politics should be the battle of ideas. And I say to all of you here, and all of those tens of thousands of people, the volunteers, the candidates, that you leave here tonight with your head held up, I say carry on the fight. Yes. Carry on the fight for a fair go at work, for the equal treatment of women in their march to a proper treatment in this country. Carry on the fight for our national disability insurance scheme and getting it back on track. For a stronger Medicare and a better deal for pensioners. But above all tonight, I say to all of our supporters, those who push the progressive case for Australia, I say Labor is a great party. We are a resilient and proud movement. And we never give up. Falling down is not our challenge. Standing up again is our mark. Leave here knowing that we've argued for the future. 
and our time will come. Count upon that. And friends, the only reason I've been able to give everything to this job for the last 2,000 days is because of the love and support of Chloe and our kids. I'm not unique. Everyone in public life is only here because of the patience and love of our families. But to Chloe, Rupert, Gigi and Clementine, you've put up with so much. I love you so much. I also want to take the chance to thank all of my parliamentary colleagues for their unity, for their talent and support. In particular, I thank my outstanding deputy leader, Tanya Plibersek, Chris Bowen and Penny Wong. I offer my commiserations to all those good Labor candidates who fought well but fallen short, as well as friends who've lost their seats. There are too many people for me to thank individually tonight. They know who they are. I want to say how deeply grateful I am for the guidance and wisdom of my trusted advisors, for the dedication and hard work of my staff, for the brilliant passion and enthusiasm of a whole Labor family from premiers and former leaders and legends through, of course, to our mighty rank and file. Friends, over the past few weeks, it's remarkable. Millions of Australians have cast their vote, have peacefully exercised their disagreements and their right to choose their representatives. People whose ancestors have called this continent home for 60,000 years and 10,000 resettled refugees, many of whom voted in this election for the first time in their life. <laughs> to offer yourself as a leader of such a great country, to seek to serve such generous and courageous people, it is an extraordinary honour. I leave the stage tonight, but I encourage all Australians, particularly young Australians, never lose faith in the power of individuals to make a difference. Never give up. Never give up aiming for better. Better for your country. Better for your future. Because the things that matter most are the things that are worth fighting for. We can't change the past. But my word, we can change the future. Thank you and good night. Well, Bill Shorten there, and so often in Australian politics, we see it a terrific speech bowing out from the leadership. No surprise in that after two election losses, leaders don't get that terribly often, and an unexpected one at this one, uh, this defeat tonight. He is standing down as leader. He will not recontest the leadership when the ballot is held. They'll go through the process, you may recall, after they lost government in 2013, where if there are more than one candidate, if there is more than one candidate putting their hand up for the leadership, they'll go through the process of the party rank and file deciding who that leader is. Sky News can confirm for you right now, though, that Anthony Albanese will be uh, one of the candidates, at least. Whether there will be more, we're yet to see. But I understand Anthony Albanese will be contesting the leadership. He, of course, contested it uh, five and a half years ago against Bill Shorten. He won the rank and file, but not the caucus ballot. It's a two-part equation here. You need to win over the rank and file members, but also the parliamentary team. And that's where Anthony Albanese fell short last time around, too. Bill Shorten. He's stuck around. He served on the front bench loyally. Now will Anthony Albanese be able to secure the prize after two election losses and come in as Labor leader and opposition leader? If he does, or if it's Tanya Plibersek, or if it's someone else on the right of the party, it will not be an easy task. After taking such an ambitious agenda to this election, the franking credits, negative gearing, capital gains tax and trusts, tax changes, the bold climate policy agenda as well, can they walk back some of these issues easily? What we heard from Bill Shorten there tonight was a, a rev up to a disappointed Labor Party base. Don't give up 
the fight. He's, of course, not telling the party where they need to go on each of these policy issues. That's not his role now. A clearly disappointed Bill Shorten, though, kept a smile on his face as best he could there with Chloe by his side to say that they can win the next one. He believes they will win the next one, but they need to keep on fighting. And that's a message that a disheartened Labor base need to hear on a night like tonight. We'll check in with Kieran Gilbert and Nick Rees, who were there at that venue. They were there listening to what Bill Shorten had to say. Come back to them in just a moment. But let me get the thoughts of our panel there. Richard Miles, I've got to go to you first on this. What did you make of Bill Shorten's speech there and uh, what follows now? Well, I think it was a very gracious speech. Um, you know, I feel very sorry and pained for Bill. Um, I, 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 you know, this is... Uh, uh, for Stephen and I have walked this journey with Bill for a very long period of time. It's frankly an unimaginable moment. Um, and uh, but but I think it was it was a gracious speech, and um, and he, uh, you know, made it clear that we need to be as a party um, a party which does seek to reform and does bring about policy agendas. And you know, I think we can have some pride in the fact that we 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 took up the the. The fight of ideas, and that's where we're, that's the ground that we're on. Has Bill Shorten done the right thing in standing down as leader? Oh, look, I think um, it, it, it was obviously Bill's call. I think I think um, he, he's put it this way: in 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 doing it on his own terms, in terms of standing down from the leadership, there is a dignity in that, and and it does allow um, the party now to to move on. Um, I, I think it was always clear in Bill's mind that if he didn't win this election, he wouldn't be. Uh, the leader of the Labor Party going forward. So, for him, it was always uh, an existential fight in that sense. Well, now the question is who will be the leader. Anthony Albanese will be running. No great surprise in that. Would he make a good Labor leader now? Oh, I, th I mean, there's a whole lot of people who would make um, uh, a good leader of the Labor Party and, and Anthony's got a whole lot of um, capabilities and, and um, has been a, you know, a great servant of the Labor movement. But would I'm not... A, would you stand I, 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 Look, I'm not about to go into all of that now and, and, and I don't think tonight is the night for that. I mean, it, it's, it's... You know, I'm... I'm t tonight, in a sense, is, is about acknowledging the role that Bill's played as our leader over the last five years and and the real, really uh, giant contribution that he's made to our party and to our movement. And he's made clear that he's going to continue on as the member for Maribyrnong, and so um, there's a contribution still to be made. OK, um, but just let me just be clear on this. Would you be interested in running? Oh, I, I, I'm not going to get into any of that, David. I, I think that... That's it's, not a it's, no. But, it, but tonight is about... Um, uh, T tonight is about this election. It it's about um, a very significant moment in Bill making um, the decision that he's made. Um, and it brings to an end, you know, a, a, an era of very significant unity, but, um, uh, you know, an era where there's been a lot of accomplishment within our party. And, and one thing I do think in relation to what Bill said uh, then, which is I completely agree with, um, we can win the next election. Uh, right. We can absolutely win the next election and, and the role now is to uh, bring inspiration back to uh, those in the caucus, obviously, and, and the broader party beyond and ultimately the Australian people about um, why uh, the country would be better served by having a Labor government. There's a lot we can come back to here. Scott Morrison, we're waiting to see. He's not far off, apparently, at the uh, Liberal headquarters there tonight. It's nearly midnight. Uh, I'm sure he would have not been expecting to still be... Um, waiting to give a speech, but boy, he won't mind because it's a victory speech that he's going to give tonight and that's perhaps not something many expected even just this time yesterday, but uh, that's what he'll be delivering at that podium any moment now. Stephen Conroy, look, as a journalist, you can understand why I'm, you know, pressing Richard Miles there for an answer, but he's, he's probably got a point. Tonight's about Bill Shorten. Uh, what did you think of that concession speech? Uh, look, I think it was gracious, appropriate, uh... And uh, Bill expressed, on behalf of all of the Labor Party and the Labor movement, uh, disappointment and, and sorrow that everybody feels. Uh, and he uh, was as positive as it was possible to be uh, in the circumstances. Like Richard, as he said, we've both known him since he was a, a teenager. Uh, we've both admired him. Uh, we've worked with him. Uh, and it's, uh, it, uh, it was good to see that he... Did it on his own terms. We're standing by, as you can see, uh, the 
Liberal Party event where John Howard and Gladys Berejiklian uh, are standing by. Philip Ruddock, the New South Wales Party president, is there. Uh, all on hand to witness this moment in history, really. I think, as Michael Kroger put it a little earlier, perhaps one of the most impressive election wins for the Liberal Party in memory. Uh, Richo, is that overstating it? No, it's not. This is an extraordinary win. I, I don't think anybody can take that away from, from Scott tonight. He's had a magnificent victory. And uh, good luck to him. I mean, he, he worked his ring elf and um, he paid dividends. You know, he, he is a fundamentally decent fellow and I think that shows. And a high-risk strategy because if he'd all gone to Richo, he had nowhere to hide. I mean, it was very much yep, the Scott campaign. Him. Absolutely. Now, of course, he's Prime Minister, so if he'd lost it... You know, may well would have, <coughs> may well have left Parliament. Who knows? Uh, that's all history now. But Chips or I've just got a note from someone who's telling me that the uh, Palmer vote is polling poorly in the Queensland Senate race. It looks like no it chance. won't get a seat at all, but it could be a seat to One Nation. Yep. Roll the hoopla and carry on. Sorry, so that Clive Palmer. I'm just going through messages. Clive Palmer may not he's get a correct. Uh, he's, fifty million bucks. It's fifty yeah. million dollars. Well, you know, it's it's it is kind of heartening to think that. You can't necessarily buy a seat. It's hard to think that he gets, uh, you know, sussed out by the Australian people, as does Ro Rob Oakshot. That's heartening. But boy, oh boy, um, that's extraordinary. The, the yeah. amount of advertising that's gone on there, um, perhaps not surprising, though, given the baggage he was carrying with all of that. But uh, um, yeah, well, his national vote was sitting at about three, three and three point four percent earlier. I'm not sure if we have a. He's state on, break he's on three. Land. So. The last check I had was uh, Labor have got 23% of the vote in the Senate. Uh, and the last position in Queensland will be between probably Labor and the Libs. The Libs are on 9%. Uh, and Palmer's, I think, only on... It's up there on the screen now. Well, it's yeah. interesting, you know, M Malcolm Roberts is... Oh, OK, that. Queensland up there. So this is the Queensland Senate race. Um, and just Malcolm talk, talk Roberts me through what all that means in terms of... Well, um, th this is the first election, uh, the first half Senate election with a new Senate voting arrangement. So uh, unlike in the past, where you had automatic distribution of preferences uh, below the line, with 97% of people voting above the line, you, you now effectively have a version of optional preferential. And so a lot of the vote... Um, <clears throat> I mean, uh, essentially, the uh, two point five six and the 1.64 for Labour, I mean, I, I would predict... That, that when there's, a, there's, a, there's a real possibility there that the LNP will pick up three and that Labor will pick up two when it's all said and done. Can we just go back to Queensland, sorry? Uh, I just wanted to see where that left the rest of the, the pack there. So, sorry, that, you were saying how many for the Coalition and Labor? Two. Well, it, it depends, on, it depends on, on a range of things that we can't see yeah. from here uh, because it's, it's, you know, it is no longer full... But uh, the point about Clive Palmer is, where is he? That's well, he's, right. he's not. He's, he's obviously not in the line-up there, yeah. Okay. Clive okay. Palmer's done really poorly. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go back to the Liberal yeah. headquarters. Here comes it's Scott Morrison, uh, Ben Ford, <laughs> squeezing in a couple really of questions good. before Did you believe they uh, get on stage. I've always believed in the miracles, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go and do it. Good luck. There's the Prime Minister, Scott Morrison. He's making his way now into the room. Introduced by, uh, by Ben Ford, which is, which is most helpful. Ben. Um, and he's making his way in to uh, give this victory speech. We've just... Uh, no, the camera's gone a little bit wild there, but uh, let's come back to it if we can there. Uh, we want to capture this moment and the grin on his face and Jenny as well. Uh, wow, maybe the girls uh, have gone to bed already, but this has been a family affair. Enters the room here. He's being jammed on... And there they go. He's squeezing through the door there into the a crowd of what will be cheering Liberal supporters tonight. Perhaps for many of them, most of them, an unexpected victory that they can celebrate tonight and they have this man to thank for it. Scott Morrison has carried this campaign almost single-handedly. Yes, he's had the team support. There'll be plenty of shout-outs to all those who've done their bit. Andrew Hurst, the Liberal Party Federal Director, in his first campaign... He's no novice at politics, but his first campaign as campaign director, and he's pulled this off. But Scott Morrison, clearly the one who deserves the most credit for all of this. Who would have thought back in August last year when the Liberal Party was tearing itself apart on the leadership front, Scott Morrison emerged as a compromise candidate in many ways to pull it all together 
to get into a campaign in enough shape to then win that campaign. And I can see his girls are there. They have not gone to bed. And they are looking pretty excited and wide awake Christmas as well. Eve. Looks like Christmas Eve. <laughs> and it's, isn't that great to see? Good for them. This is uh, something they will remember forever. <laughs> All right, and you can see the uh, the crowd are just getting as many selfies and snaps as they can of who will be a liberal hero now, Scott Morrison. He's done the unthinkable for many in pulling off this victory tonight. We still don't know exactly how many seats they'll end up on. Bill Shorten called him about half an hour ago to concede defeat. We've seen him do that publicly as well. So now the way is clear for Scott Morrison. Perhaps not clear through that crowd just yet, but there are plenty of hands. He will be shaking. High fives as well. I'm just predicting here, how good is this? Might be the first words that come out of his mouth. All right. <clears throat> And the point we've been making tonight as well is the not just the authority invested in him now having won this against the odds, but the clear field he now faces. I mean, the disappointment for the Liberal Party and Tony Abbott losing in Warringah tonight, his departure, that of Julie Bishop, that of others as well, means that he is now unrivaled now in the leadership, Scott Morrison. And he really has it in front of him now as he, I think, has a... Brief congratulations there and a hug indeed from John Howard. He's as happy as anyone in that room, given what he did to help during this campaign as well. I think the girls are going to go up on stage, are they, with Dad? Yep, they sure are. It's been a family affair throughout this campaign. No surprise, they're all going to be up there to celebrate this. Let's have a listen. Thank you, friends. Can I just start by saying, as you know, a little while ago, Mr. Shorten contacted me, and I thank him. I thank him very much in the spirit in which he made that call, and I thank him very much for his kind remarks to me and to Jenny and to our family, and I would like to wish him and Chloe and his family all the best and God's blessings. I have always believed in miracles. I'm standing with the three biggest miracles in my life here tonight. And tonight, we've been delivered another one. How good is Australia? And how good are Australians? This is, this is the best country in the world in which to live. And it's those Australians that we have been working for for the last five and a half years since we came to government under Tony Abbott's leadership back in 2013. It has been those Australians who have worked hard every day. They have their dreams, they have their aspirations to get a job, to get an apprenticeship, to start a business, to meet someone amazing, <laughs> to start a family, to buy a home, to work hard and provide the best you can for your kids, to save for your retirement, and to ensure that when you're in your retirement that you can enjoy it because you've worked hard for it. are the quiet Australians who have won a great victory tonight. Thank you. Because it's always been a 
about them. It's always been for those of you watching this at home tonight. For me and for my government, for all of my team, it's all about you. Tonight is not about me or it's not about even the Liberal Party. Tonight is about every single Australian who depends on their government to put them first. And so, friends, that is exactly what we are going to do. Our government will come together after this night and we will get back to work just as Gladys Berejiklian got back to work here in New South Wales just a few months ago. And that is our task and that is my undertaking to Australians from one end of the country to the other. I said that I was going to burn for you and I am every single day. So let me talk about some of our other miracles tonight. Melissa McIntosh out there in Lindsay. <laughs> Phil Thompson up there in Townsville and Herbert. Bridget Archer down there in Bass. The big unit, Gav Pearce down there in Braddon. Terry Young up there in Longman in Brisbane. Sarah Richards, we're bringing back Macquarie. But in saying that, can I also say thank you to some great service, and I hope will continue to be service, at least in a number of these cases. Can I start off by saying thank you to Tony Abbott for your service to this country? And to Sarah Henderson and Chris Cruther and Warren Mundine, who are still in there, and we've still got votes to count, and they're not stepping back, can I thank them very much for the hard campaign that they have fought. <laughs> to all of those in the seats that we held going into this campaign, who had to work hard to ensure that, as a result of their incredible efforts, they were able to be returned tonight, can I particularly thank Jason Wood, yeah. Michael Suka, yeah. David Coleman down in Banks, yeah. Lucy Wicks up there in Robertson. Yeah. Pretty much the whole state of Queensland. <laughs> yeah. How good's Queensland? <laughs> room in New South Wales, this close to origin, I've got to tell you. But particularly to Bert Van Manen, to Peter Dutton, yeah. Trevor Evans, Luke Howarth, Michelle Landry, good old Ken O'Dowd, Warren Ench up there, right in the top, all of our Queensland members, I want to thank you. And we've got some great new members coming in as well. Dr Katie Allen, she's here with, she's down there in Higgins. Dr Fiona Martin is here with us in Reed. <laughs> Professor Celia Hammond over there in the west coming in in Turton. <laughs> Pat Conaghan up there in Cowper. <laughs> and Angie Bell up there on the Gold Coast. I want to thank all of my candidates, all of my members, all of you who have worked so hard to get them where we've been able to come to tonight on behalf of all of those Australians that we work for and we serve and we do it humbly and we do it in great appreciation. I particularly want to thank a number of people who have been instrumental in the, tonight's result. I want, to start, I want to start by thanking Gladys Berejiklian, <laughs> Stephen Marshall, the Premier of South Australia, and Will Hodgman, the Premier of Tasmania. They have led by example in their great victories and they've shown us the way at a federal level and they have worked so hard for us all around. So glad, particularly here in my home state. Thank you so much. 
and campaigning without, without drawing a breath, the great John Howard and Jeanette Howard. I, of course, want to thank all of my leadership team who have served so well and so loyally. To Michael McCormick and all of our team at the Nationals. <laughs> to the Big Mac, as I like to call him. Michael McCormick and to Bridget McKenzie. Thank you to all of those uh, in the Nationals for the great job you've done in supporting us. We're a tremendous coalition and we will be as we reform our government after tonight. I also want to thank Josh Frydenberg, yeah. my deputy, and to Amy and their kids. Josh is a great mate, and he's been a tremendous treasurer and a great deputy leader. And well done down there in Melbourne, Josh. You've held the whole, held the whole team together. And we thank you, and I thank you very much. He has a pretty good budget, too. Yeah. Back in surplus next year. And of course, to Matthias Corman, who's been our Minister in Residence up in Queensland, and to Simon Birmingham, who has been our, our campaign spokesperson. But another person I particularly want to thank tonight is, is Greg Hunt. Greg Hunt is an outstanding Health Minister, and he stood up down there in Flinders, and it's great to have you back, mate. There's a lot of people to thank, but Andrew Hurst, our federal director, Hursty, and of course to Nick Greiner, who is a great son of New South Wales, our federal president, together with Andrew Burns, our federal treasurer. I, I, thank him very much and all the state directors around the country. They have run an outstanding campaign. They have set a new mark, a new model, a new way for us to campaign as a Liberal and national team. And this has really set an entirely new benchmark, Hursty. And I want to thank you for your leadership at our CHQ. <laughs> to my own team and my own staff, can I thank the Kunk, John Kunkel, my Chief of Staff, can I thank you, Ron Finkelstein, my PPS, Andrew Carswell, leading the media team. And can I also send a long thank you over the, over the Nullarbor, over to Benny Morton, who's been with me every step of the way. And all of my colleagues. It, it remains only me to thank those who have been so, as, so close to me all of my life. Ma Mary and John Morrison are here tonight. My parents and my brother, Alan, and his wife, Susie. My mother-in-law, Beth, is here. They're just over here on the left. And Gary and Michelle, you all got to know Gary. How good's Gary Warren? Amazing fella. It's great to have you all here, and Jenny's family, and Cecily and Rob. And my brother, Alan, who I mentioned. I've mentioned Alan. We shared a room to her in university. You've probably heard me tell that story about 20 times. But to the dearest of my family who are with me to here tonight, to my beautiful miracle girls, Abby and Lily. Yeah. Thank you. And to the woman I fell in love with in my teens, and it's never let up. And... And now Australia has fallen in love with her, Jenny Morrison. <laughs> so, friends, we've got a lot of work to do. We've got a lot of work to do. And we're going to get back to work. We're going to get back to work for the Australians that we know go to work every day, who face those struggles and trials every day. They're looking for a fair go and they're having a go and they're going to get a go from our government. Every single day, they are who we'll have right in front of us as we put in place and continue the policies which we know will keep our economy strong to guarantee the essentials that Australians rely on, that'll keep Australians safe, 
and secure, and most importantly, most importantly, that will keep Australians together. We are an amazing country of amazing people. God bless Australia. Great victory for the quiet Australians. The re-elected Prime Minister Scott Morrison says there, well, there aren't too many quiet Australians in that room right now. They are cheering what many agree was an unthinkable victory, even as late as yesterday. But here he is, Scott Morrison, eight months after obtaining the leadership and again in an unusual situation where he wasn't even a candidate for the leadership until the very end. But now, after eight months in the job, he has turned things around for the Liberal Party and the Coalition. Turned things around during the campaign. Tonight, he's turned it around again, and here they are, back in power for a third term. And Scott Morrison protected now as leader with the change in the rules. He should be there for the full third term. And, of course, he uh, has that authority vested in him now as being the one who carried this campaign on his shoulders almost single-handedly. We heard him thank then all those who did help, including Matthias Cormann here on the panel with us, his deputy, Josh Frydenberg, the Nationals too. But there's no doubt Scott Morrison did far more of the heavy lifting in this campaign than we usually see. How does it now look? Well, here is the State of the House with just over 70% of the vote count. 76 is a majority government and the Coalition sits on 73. Labor, 61. The Greens, 1. Bob Catter, Centre Alliance, 3. Independents, 11 still undecided. So, the Coalition still need only three of those 11 to go their way to hit a majority. And the chances are they will do that. Here's what the Chamber is looking like at the moment. This blue of Coalition seats now nearly at the majority. Across the country, the vote, let's have a look at that. The primary vote tells the story of what's happened here tonight. It sits at 41.3%, higher than any opinion polls showed throughout this campaign, even at the end. The best they got was 39%, but they've done better in the actual result. The polls were wrong. Labor crashing down to 34%. Well, a couple of polls didn't indicate it might get that low, but that's a whole lot lower than they thought, and clearly not a winning position. The Greens finishing right now on 10%, and you can see some of the other smaller party results, including the Clive Palmer United Australia Party on 3.4%. After preferences, how does that put the two sides, the two-party preferred nationwide result? Let's take a look at that. The Coalition now sitting on 51.6%, Labor sitting on 48.4%. And that is a swing to the Coalition of nearly 2% after a 65% count. So that swing, 1.83%, is where that count is right now. And that is a winning position for the Coalition. Let's go to Paul Murray and Laura Jays, who are there at the venue where we just saw... Scott Morrison talk about those quiet Australians who've backed him in. It's now back to work. Laura Jays, what did you make of that speech? It was a, a very gracious speech from Scott Morrison. He hit all the right notes. He thanked all the right people. He uh, paid special tribute to Tony Abbott, who's lost his seat tonight. A special tribute to the, the giant of the Liberal Party in John Howard, who was one of the first there to shake his hand as he went up on stage. And having his family there beside him, um, you know, I just think he looks uh, calm, natural, not overexcited, didn't look like the adrenaline was uh, pumping too hard. This is um, a man, I think, who always believed he could win tonight. He always believed. He made people around him in his own cabinet and ministry believe that they could win tonight, and he has delivered for them. And it is he's, he's won the unwinnable election. Uh, Scott Morrison, he's done it. For oh, correct. Party. Look, and, and, and you have to unpack this, and we will, of course, do so in the next little while, but Australia is not as woke as Twitter would like to think. It is not as obsessed with the things that the media have so often talked about. Yes, yeah, sometimes it's a little bit daggy, sometimes it's a little bit naff. No, 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 I'm not suggesting we are some... There's no back... Like, Scott Morrison and Andrew Hurst have worked out in, with absolute sophistication the simplest possible personal interaction between a leader and the people when they go into seats.
but an incredibly sophisticated game to make sure that the 20 seats that would decide government or not were sandbanked, were worked on to make sure that it didn't matter what the mainstream media, what the polls or anything else did, that they were going to be able to hold on to those positions. Well, they now, they wavered from their, their mission, if you like. They didn't um, get spooked uh, by the polls. They didn't uh, make uh, decisions on the run that were responding to events per se. They stuck to a plan. It was a simple plan. It was a simple message and it cut. Well, can I say too, I know that we all talk to the people at the heart of campaigns and they all say that they are confident, they all say that it's leaning their way. Scott Morrison never doubted his ability to get to this moment. Now, whether this moment was going to happen or not is not in his hands, but he never doubted his ability to get to this moment. That's why you wake up in Tasmania and you fly all the way through the country, all the way through election day. It's why you push harder and harder every day and with that simple presentation style, very at times Howard-esque in its simplicity, but I've got to say, in the same way we had Howard's battlers and all the rest of it, Morrison's miracles, I think, is where he, he was trying to get that on the front page somewhere tomorrow. <laughs> Indeed. Paul Murray, Laura Jays, thank you for all your great contributions throughout tonight. Uh, we'll get you on and soak up some of that excitement in the room. Let's go to the Labor headquarters where it's, boy, oh, boy, just look at... Uh, <laughs> difference between the two rooms down there in Melbourne, Kieran Gilbert and Nick Reese. Uh, is anyone left in the room or have they all cleared out? Well, David, it's a win for the quiet Australians and there are quite a few very quiet Australians in this room right now <laughs> as we speak. In fact, you know, <laughs> I'll tell you what, Nick, the, to the victor goes the spoils and the, the losers can please themselves. And as you said, they, they have cleared out pretty much, David. Uh, a very sombre mood, understandably. All the polls had suggested they were going to be in the mix. Um, some of them thought that their pessimistic uh, predictions were that they'd be in minority at worst. They've got not even close to that. Uh, but uh, Bill Shorten, I guess, in his valedictory, in his final speech as leader, he did as well as he could have. I mean, let's start with the room. I mean, I think Labor was hoping there'd be 2,000 people in this auditorium at this point in time. And uh, really, at this point, it's you and me and not too many others. No, uh, there right. people leaving in tears. Yeah. Arms around each other, consoling each other. It's a very maudlin affair uh, here in Essendon Field tonight. Um, in terms of uh, the results, uh, I think we're going to be pulling that apart for a long time to come. Uh, obviously, uh, there's what happened in Queensland. Labor didn't see that coming. But there's much more to this story than that. I mean, there's Tasmania. Uh, there's, uh, Labor went backwards in New South Wales as well. I mean, you know, this is going to have to be a very thorough review that Labor undertakes in this campaign. As for Bill Shorten, I mean, you know, he's had a sense of destiny about him his whole life. I mean, he's gotten up every day since he was a teenager working towards this night and uh, it hasn't turned out like he thought. No, well, the lights are on. It's time to go home, David. It's, uh, yeah, as, as they say, not the way they, they had anticipated the night to unfold, but... Congratulations to uh, Scott Morrison and his team. It's been a very effective campaign and a fine speech to finish it. Yeah, indeed. Nick, Kieran, thank you for all your contributions tonight. And, uh, Kieran, I'll be seeing you bright and early in the morning as well to see video and get some sleep. To it. Uh, look, <laughs> the ramifications go well beyond the two leaders here. A great result for Scott Morrison. As Nick mentioned, the man, Bill Shorten, who many thought would be destined for the leadership, has failed to get there. He bows out of the leadership. But... The ramifications go well beyond that. Tonight's result has upended the climate debate, the coal mining debate, the tax debate, you name it. This is going to see a big rethink about where our policy settings are right now, certainly on the left, and how they reposition them. We haven't got a lot of time because it is uh, now uh, into the early hours of the morning. I want to get some final thoughts from the panel. Stephen Connor will whip around the desk. So what do you think? Where does this leave life for Labor? Uh, look, I think Labor's got a... Uh a real challenge now. Uh, obviously, choosing a new leader will be the uh, first part of that. Uh, I've lived through, personally, defeats like this. Uh, so it, it is... You know, the, the party will be shell-shocked. Uh, and so choosing the leader, uh, the new leader will need to sit back with the new front bench and start working through the wreckage to try and work out what went wrong. Uh, and what needs to be changed going forward. All right. Matthias Corman, uh, look, congratulations to you and uh, the rest of the, the team have been involved in this. It is a remarkable election win. 
Where, what are your final thoughts on, uh, on this outcome? Back to work. Like, uh, essentially, as the Prime Minister said, it's now back to work for the Australian people, continuing uh, the job that we've been doing over the last five and a half years, building a stronger economy, making sure that families around Australia today and into the future have the best possible opportunity to get ahead. That is uh, what lies ahead for us. And Peter Credlin, of course, you know, we reflected earlier in the night, the other big story has been Tony Abbott's loss in Warringah, but, of course, the disappointment for the Liberals there obviously offset by this extraordinary outcome. Look, I think no Liberal can um, be too upset about Tony when you look at Tony's speech tonight. Take, take your lesson from Tony's speech. Uh, as I said at the time, that is a measure of the man. It was incredibly gracious. And I think at the end, um, congratulations to Matisse, because he's been working on that surplus for many years. He'll actually get to see it. I think that's terrific. And this is about faith. And this is about family. This is about reward for effort and keeping it in your own pocket. And, and it's responsible climate policy, not reckless climate policy. This is going to be a big debate in this country from here on in. I think that's right. Richard Miles, dark well, days ahead for Labor, or is it not quite so grim? How do you see things going for you? Well, I think the first thing is that Scott Morrison is to be congratulated on, on his win. Um, it, it is a very significant achievement, um, given the events of, of last August. Um, I, I felt all along that if, if we were to lose tonight, then in a sense, you know, the next uh, period of time is, is, is probably, in a sense, more important for, for Labor to make sure that we come together as quickly as possible um, and that it's, it, it's, it's not a, you know, it's not the dark time. Obviously, Stephen's right, people will feel shell-shocked, but um, we've got to regroup um, and, uh, and, and find the inspiration to move forward to contest the next election, and I know that we can win. Well, there'll be a lot to talk about in the coming days about all of that. Richo, a final word to you. What's your final thoughts on this outcome? Uh, well, the problem for Labor's new leader will be morale. It'll take a long time for Labor to get over this. They won't get over it in five minutes. Uh, these things, uh, they really strike the heart of, of the faithful. And there'll be a lot of people very disappointed tonight. Um, I've had some texts that suggest to me that I'm probably right on that. Um, there are people wanting to jump out of windows on... Unfortunately, they're not on the first floor either, so um, it, it, it's a problem. Um, but uh, Labor can be resilient and, and it'll come back over the years. But this, this tonight is not a story about Labor. Tonight it's a story about Scott Morrison. Um, and uh, I'd say he, uh, he's had a triumph beyond all belief. Well, I mean, you're right to say the nature of this sort of tight result... Uh, disappointing for Labor, but it's by no means Not the end in of the an world. unwinnable position for the next time around. Libs have got to be clear. careful, though. Libs have got to be yep. careful, because in 93, they won in 96 on the back of 93. Just be careful. be careful. And look, tonight is a great night for Scott Morrison. There's no doubt about that. The euphoria, you could, you could see it coming off the screen uh, from that room. How they govern now over the coming three years is, uh, well, vested in Scott Morrison there as the re-elected Prime Minister, eight months only in the job, and, boy, after the big twists and turns we've seen over the last three and six years, uh, another big surprise here tonight with this election outcome. For Labor, well, it is going to be a tough road ahead from here, not just in the days and weeks that follow, but in the policy resetting, which will be a very difficult thing indeed. Well, thank you for your company tonight. Thank you for all of those on the panel for your wonderful contributions, even if it hasn't been the night some of you expected. We do thank you very much for being here. And... Uh, sharing your thoughts through it all. As I say, thank you very much for your company. We're going to have a lot of coverage and analysis on this in the coming days ahead right here on Sky News. But bye for now. Last weekend in Sydney was great. Although, I thought the place was a bit expensive. That's strange. I got quite a good deal on the hotel. Seriously? You think $200 a night is a good deal? What? No, never spend that on a hotel. Well, how did you do it then? Well, with Trivago, you can search for the hotel you want, select the dates, and Trivago will compare prices from hundreds of websites worldwide to find the ideal hotel for you. Do I know you? Hotel. Trivago. Hotel. Trivago.
This is standard underwear, made from cotton. And this is step one, made from bamboo. Cotton traps sweat. Bamboo whips it away. These ride up, bunch up, and chafe. Not step one. We've invented these lycra panels between the legs, so you'll never chafe again. These need constant readjustment. But step one has hidden a piece of elastic around the pouch, which keeps everything in place. For a thousand five-star reviews, free shipping, and your first pair are guaranteed. Buy them online at stepone.live. And a few days later, you'll be wearing the world's most comfortable underwear. Harvey Norman 4-Day Furniture and Bedding Floor Stock Clearance on now. Rush in for up to 50% off selected floor stock. That's up to 50% off mattress and ensemble floor stock from all the big brands. Up to 50% off bedroom furniture and Manchester floor stock. Up to 50% off lounges, dining, outdoor and home office furniture floor stock. Four days only. Everything must clear. Up to 50% off selected floor stock across the range. Don't miss out. 4-Day Furniture and Bedding Floor Stock Clearance ends Monday at Harvey Norman. At Prosper, we help you invest in your small business at tax time. With funds to install this. Right now, when you take out a business loan, you could be eligible for the government's 30K instant asset write-off. Prosper, we help small businesses fund what's next. Apply today. Hi, I'm Alex Schultz. And I'm Andrew Cooper. In 2015, we took a surf trip to Bali, Indonesia, and saw firsthand just how bad the world's plastic pollution crisis really is. We wanted to make it our mission to solve this problem, and we have. We started cleaning the ocean by ourselves until 2017 when we started our ocean cleanup company, 4Ocean. Now, we've become the world's largest ocean cleanup company, employing captains and crews seven days a week to clean our oceans and coastlines. We've operated out of 27 different countries, and to date, we've removed over 2 million pounds of trash from the ocean. And now, we're inviting you to join the clean ocean movement. All of our cleanup efforts are funded entirely through the sale of our bracelet. The 4Ocean bracelet is made from our ocean plastic and the recycled glass bottles that we collect. Every bracelet purchase helps fund the removal of one pound of trash from the ocean and supports the 4Ocean cleanup movement. So visit 4Ocean.com today to become part of the solution. It's mayhem at Carpet Call and we've slashed prices on our flooring range. Carpet your whole house for under $2,200 in luxurious loop pile carpet. Real hardwood quick system timber boards from $39.95 per metre. Pergo waterproof surface laminate. And there's easy click laminate from $19.95 per metre. Beautiful fashion rugs starting from just $200. And ask us about our range of made to order blinds. It's mayhem month at Carpet Call. The experts in the trade. going to set AGT history. America's Got Talent. Stream or tune in Friday, May 31, Fox 8. You should have killed me, Ethan. The end you always feel is coming. What the hell is he doing? I find it best not to look. I can no longer protect you. Don't you see? This is a trap. Mission Impossible Fallout. Stream on Fox Flix or watch on Foxtel Movies Premiere. Live, this is The Front Page with Jane Marwick. Good evening and welcome to this very special edition of The Front Page. What a night. Against all the polls, except the one that matters... The Coalition has won the 2019 federal election. The Coalition has so far claimed 74 seats, the ALP 65. A short time ago, Bill Shorten conceded. Here it is. I want to say beyond this room to Australians who supported Labor, I know that you're all hurting, and I am too. And without wanting to hold out any false hope, while there are still millions of votes to count and important seats yet to be finalised, it is obvious that Labor will not be able to form the next government. And so, in the national interest, a short while ago, I called Scott Morrison to congratulate him and I wish Jenny, and I wish Jenny and their daughters all the very best. And above all, 
I wish Scott Morrison good fortune and good courage in the service of our great nation. The national interest required no less. This has been a tough campaign, toxic at times. But now that the contest is over, all of us have a responsibility to respect the result, respect the wishes of the Australian people and to bring our nation together. However, that task we won for the next leader of the Labor Party because whilst I intend to continue to serve as the member for Maribyrn, I will not be a candidate in the next Labor leadership ballot. Along with my family, my precious family, the Labor Party and the trade union movement, it's my life. To be able to have served as leader of the Labor Party for five and a half years is a greater honour than anyone who would my family before me or even I could have dreamed of when I joined the local branch 35 years ago. There he is, Bill Shorten. He's not going to contest the leadership again of the Labor Party uh, with his wife, Chloe Shorten. It must be a very, very hard time for families and lots of people in the ALP tonight. Of course, leaving Scott Morrison to claim victory. Here he is. Can I just start by saying, as you know, a little while ago, Mr Shorten contacted me and I thank him... I thank him very much in the spirit in which he made that call and I thank him very much for his kind remarks to me and to Jenny and to our family and I would like to wish him and Chloe and his family all the best and God's blessings. I have always believed in miracles. the three biggest miracles in my life here tonight. And tonight we've been delivered another one. How good is Australia? Australians. This is, this is the best country in the world in which to live. And it's those Australians that we have been working for for the last five and a half years since we came to government under Tony Abbott's leadership back in 2013. It has been those Australians who have worked hard every day. They have their dreams, they have their aspirations. To get a job, to get an apprenticeship, to start a business, to meet someone amazing. <laughs> to start a family, to buy a home, to work hard and provide the best you can for your kids. To save for your retirement, and to ensure that when you're in your retirement that you can enjoy it because you've worked hard for it. Yeah. These are the quiet Australians who have won a great victory tonight. There he is, a jubilant Scott Morrison. How good is Australia? Well, as Alan Jones, who's been predicting a win for the Coalition, said, the pollsters got it wrong, and in my view, People keep their thoughts to themselves for fear of being frowned upon or lampooned until they get to the polling booth. On my way to Sky, I called into Celia Hammond's party and the mood was incredibly upbeat. Got a picture of her here with the former Liberal State Education Minister, Peter Collier. Celia Hammond is Julie Bishop's replacement in Curtin and she was the victim of a very dirty campaign over here. That's been underreported, but I'll tell you, I saw it firsthand. We'll take a look of that photograph of Celia Hammond and Peter Collier. There's the tweet. Uh, there they are in that bottom right-hand corner. Absolutely jubilant. 
Got another photo for you, Andrew Hasty. He has campaigned extremely well in the seat of Canning. Here he is with his son, Jonathan. He sent this photograph to me. We'll get that one up for you. They're watching the coverage. Uh, there's Peter Collier and Celia Hammond. Up next, the photo of Andrew Hasty, who has increased his margin and had uh, a tremendous campaign. And we'll also show you Vince. There's Andrew and Jonathan. They were watching Peter Dutton's speech there. And finally, we've got a photograph of Vince Connolly here, who retained the seat of Stirling after Michael Keenan decided not to contest the election. Well, John Howard said we can't divide the country on class lines, and he's right. The Australian reports that former Liberal Prime Minister John Howard has said the election show result showed Australians rejecting Bill Shorten's class warfare tactics and his radical action on climate change. What a night. Now, let's bring in the panel, Macquarie, Me Macquarie Media's Clinton Maynard. Good evening and welcome, Clinton. Thanks for being patient with us. As I said, it would be fluid tonight, and indeed it is. Welcome along. What an extraordinary night. I think the biggest political upset in since 1993's failed fight-back package. Yeah, and no surprise to you, because you're on Talkback Radio, and we heard things on Talkback Radio that people weren't telling the pollsters. Sky News, Sydney's Danica DiGiorgio, originally from Perth. Danica, thanks for joining us. Jane, great to be here. And, yes, uh, what a night. Who would have thought that this would have been the outcome, but certainly uh, an emphatic win for Scott Morrison. Indeed. Guys, we're here to show you the front pages of tomorrow's papers, and I can tell you, I think newspaper editors were tearing their hair out tonight. We were getting uh, re front pages changing. Clinton, you can understand this, and Danica, as uh, they weren't sure how the results were going to go. Let's hold up for you first... Tomorrow's Sunday Mail. This is the Courier Mail. It's a photograph of Scott Morrison. ScoMo's shock. Scott Morrison, Renee Vila Villaris writes, was closing in on forming government last night in a bombshell federal election result. That was the latest one we got. Clinton, a lot of people are saying they're surprised. But as I said to you, you're on talk radio. We saw it with the electric cars policy. We saw talkback callers railing against Bill Shorten refusing to tell us what a 45% emissions target reduction and 50% renewables by 2030 uh, were going to cost. I feel, and franking credits for me, I feel that those issues were enormous with talkback listeners. What are your thoughts? Oh, no question. Look, the, the polls have now shown they fail us. For three years, the Coalition's been trailing Labor. Mind you, Bill Shorten has never been more popular than either Malcolm Turnbull, Tony Abbott before Malcolm Turnbull, or now Scott Morrison. But the, pale, the, the polls have completely failed. But if you listen to talk radio, and there's a huge constituency across this country listening to talk radio, they were very much mindful that Labor's policy was going to harm them in terms of franking credits and negative gearing. And I don't think it's a surprise yeah. that, that Labor has really suffered in Queensland today. Many, many people who rely on franking credits, for instance, are retired people. Where do retired people often leave? Where do they go if they live in Victoria or New South Wales? They move to Queensland and they rely on those franking credits for their income. Danica, um, Clinton and I, of course, uh, talk radio is our bread and butter. Um, I'll give you tomorrow's front page of the Sunday Mail to talk about. Uh, this one is the Adelaide Advertiser's front page in Adelaide tomorrow, uh, and it says, Great Scott. I mean, <laughs> the newspaper editors, Danica, have had a lot of fun with some of these headlines. Morrison Hall's libs back from the brink, uh, and a couple of other stories there. Voters savage former Prime Minister Tony Abbott. Uh, Danica, you can see that the snappers... As, uh, as news photographers are called, were out there trying to get the very best shots. I'd like your thoughts on, on this photo on this front page. Oh, well, look, you know, there he is smiling. I mean, he's, he's happy. He's been, um, had his kids by his side and, and I'm sure he truly believes that. I'm just going to show you a couple of front pages, but I want to talk about Western Australia. Let's look at the Northern Territorian, the Sunday <laughs> Territorian. They reckon Scott Morrison's done a Stephen Bradbury, I think, 
I think um, if we put that front page up, I think that uh, the, the coalition might beg to differ. And Perth's Sunday Times also has the headline, Great Scott. Look, um, WA Today has written about the seats, about Canning, Cowan, Curtin, Hasluck, uh, and Nathan Hondras saying in this one, Clinton, that the party also believes it could be in the hunt in Cowan, depending on which way early votes break. Now, Anne Ali had had that point by 0.7 of a percent, uh, but the coalition think that they might be able to take that off her. And I just wanted to point to uh, Andrew Hastie has had... He campaigned really, really hard on the ground. I'm unsurprised that he has increased his margin. Kurt and Celia Hammond, uh, there was a very dirty campaign against her. Hasluck, Ken Wyatt. Um, what, what do you make of it? They're, they're <laughs> the Labor Clinton didn't win any seats mm. in WA. Um, the West Australians have sent a really, really loud message, haven't they? Oh, look, I think this is again an example, and I think, Jane, as you from the West would agree, that people in Perth and Western Australia often accuse those on the East of trying to control them, that we know best in the East. And perhaps this, in, in some ways, is almost a protest vote against Labor and believing they, they thought they could pick up seats in, in Perth and, and WA, and, and clearly they haven't. And we on the East can't do the thinking for you in the West all the time. And sometimes yeah. I think we think we can. Look, and I must correct, if I said didn't win any seats, I meant didn't pick up any new seats, mm. you know. There was talk about Swan, there was talk about Hasluck. Uh, and they've had some new talent on the ground that have done very, very well. Danica, you'll remember Michael Keenan, yep. extremely popular in the seat of Stirling. There was, you know, uh, the new member in there now, uh, Vince Connolly. People sort of thought that he didn't have much of a chance. And, in fact, he, he did. Uh, and, and so that's where... So that's the way the cards have fallen for Labor and the Coalition. Danika, your final thoughts? Well, Western Australia, Jane, of course, is a very interesting state overall. And... The Labor Party did not clearly do well. They had hoped to pick up at least five seats in the state, and that didn't happen, but particularly uh, areas like Swan with Hannah Beasley, that, that was what they had anticipated. But I also think you have to look at Western Australia. Uh, West Australians, over the last couple of years, they've always felt like perhaps they've been quite hard done by. We look at the GST issue, and it's something that the Coalition has been able to deliver on in the last 12 to 18 months. And the economy is important to West Australians. Jobs are important to West Australians. So I think from that aspect of it, that was probably something that was playing on voters' minds in the West. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think for everybody, and we'll just put that Territorian up if we do have it, uh, the Sunday Territorian with the Stephen Bradbury picture. Um, I think, Clinton, we can end, we can end <laughs> on this thought, really. <laughs> um, if we've got the territory in any way. It's got Scott Morrison. There it is. We can, we can end on that thought, uh, Clinton, that I just think the changes were too dramatic for people. I think so. And I think you could actually superimpose John Hewson's photo on Bill Shorten's photo on the front page of the territory. Just one last point. I think this shows you can't fool Australians. Clive Palmer tried to fool Australians with $60 million worth of advertising. He hasn't even secured a seat for himself, a Queensland Senate seat, and that shows Australians actually know best. Indeed. Uh, Clinton Maynard, thank you for being so patient and joining us tonight. Danica DiGiorgio, thank you too. Thank you, Jane. And thanks to you for watching us here on Sky News. Hasn't the coverage been simply amazing from the Sky News team? Up next, we'll take you to the United Kingdom with Sky News UK. Yes. to receive the Nobel Prize. Behind every good man... It's all real, darling. <laughs> ..is a greater woman. My wife doesn't write, thank God. Otherwise, I'd suffer permanent writer's block. Can you hear I think you are sick and tired. Tired of his affairs. Tired of being invisible. The Wife. Stream on Fox Flix or watch on Foxtel Movies Premiere. Wow! This is simply stunning finals football. Just remarkable. This is why we love this game. Perhaps the most dramatic is to come. Who scores? We are going to have a great final in Perth. Breathtaking. No! Wow! This will be a dog fight. Let's go.
This is incredible stuff. This is must-watch television. This, ladies and gentlemen, is why we love football. However far away my sister goes, she always manages to become the topic of any given conversation. I didn't know Miss Lister was back. Oh, very much so, ma'am. Well, well, well. Is it wise to collect the rents? Why shouldn't I? Because it's a man's job. People talk. Miss Lister is rather eccentric. She isn't always as feminine. Some people would like her to be. You think because I'm a woman, I'll be persuaded to take less? Well, now you know me better. You don't want to get involved in all that. It's a nasty business. I'm not intimidated. <laughs> when the time comes, us landlords must give as good as we get. It appears you have my niece quite under your spell. I rather think she has me under hers. I was born like this. Why should I compromise myself? If she wants to start running with the big dogs. She's gonna find out what it's like when they start fighting. Stream or watch Gentleman Jack from tonight, 7.30 on Fox Showcase. Friday, what am I looking at? Oh my god. You are now leaving Earth orbit. Cue the music. Hell yeah. The eagle has landed. I want all that in here. Hit it. Bring the cinema experience home with Foxtel Movies. You shouldn't have killed me, Ethan. The end of all this thing is coming. What the hell is he doing? Find the best not to milk. I can no longer protect you. Don't you see? This is the trap. Everybody out! Go, go, go! Mission Impossible Fallout. Stream on Fox Flicks or watch on Foxtel Movies Premiere. I want you to come with me on an epic journey. We explore the rise and dramatic fall of empires. Stream or watch End of Empire. Monday, May 27, only on History. From fighting diseases with synthetic biology to powerful machine learning. Anything from biotech, hardware, spaceships, satellites. We're exploring deep tech at the bleeding edge. We're doing it at a scale and at a detail that hasn't been done before. But as we advance, how do we stop the brain drain and ensure our best and brightest stay in Australia? That's all on the Innovation Forum Thursday. This program proudly supported by ACS. Think ahead. Create the future. Change the world. James, the results are coming in. Wait, 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 there, look, all the results? The Outsiders, Sunday morning election special. Find the latest results and what it means for you. Uh-oh, I think we've lost Rita. Well, you know. This is Sky News at four. The headlines, Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison wins a surprise re-election after the opposition concedes defeat. How good is Australia? And how good are Australians? Scottish Conservative leader Ruth Davidson says the party is likely to get a kicking in the European elections. Campaigners march in Belfast to call for same-sex marriage to be legalised in Northern Ireland. And Windsor Castle holds its third royal wedding inside a year. In sport, Johanna Conta is through to her second final of 2019. And can Manchester City add the FA Cup to their Premier League and League Cup titles by beating Watford at Wembley? Good afternoon. The Australian Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, has won a surprise re-election, overcoming the odds to beat Labour's Bill Shorten, who'd been favoured to become the country's sixth Prime Minister in as many years. Within the past hour, Mr Morrison has told supporters he'd always believed in miracles, with just over 70% of votes now counted. Mr Morrison's Liberal Party and its coalition partners are just shy of what they need for a majority, but the Labour Party has already conceded defeat. Laura Bondock's report contains flash photography. The polling station Barbies were fired up as Australia voted. Both sides had hoped for a taste of victory in what's been one of the country's closest ever elections. 
But defying all predictions, Prime Minister Scott Morrison clung to power with a win for his Liberal Party-led coalition. I have... Now, Australia's Prime Minister Scott Morrison has confounded opinion polls to take a surprise victory in the country's general election. His opponent, Bill Shorten, had been predicted to win but accepted defeat this afternoon. Our correspondent, Laura Bundock, has the details. The polling station Barbies were fired up as Australia voted. Both sides had hoped for a taste of victory in what's been one of the country's closest ever elections. But defying all predictions, Prime Minister Scott Morrison clung to power with a win for his Liberal Party-led coalition. I have always believed in miracles. Yeah. I'm standing with the three biggest miracles in my life here tonight. And tonight, we've been delivered another one. Scott Morrison's victory is being hailed one of Australia's greatest political comebacks. He campaigned by himself as his party fell out over policy. Many thought Bill Shorten's Labour Party would scrape through, but the polls got it wrong and Labour lost. It is obvious that Labour will not be able to form the next government. And so, in the national interest, a short while ago, I called Scott Morrison to congratulate him. There was upset for the coalition when former Prime Minister Tony Abbott lost his seat. <laughs> Come on, that felt good, didn't it, Julie? <laughs> this election has been unpredictable. The climate change debate has played a part, attracting votes in urban areas, but it was a harder sell in Australia's rural mining communities. <laughs> Surrounded by his party faithful, the celebrations got underway. The polls had written him off, but Scott Morrison proved them wrong. Achieving what many thought was impossible, he remains Prime Minister, one paper calling it a political miracle. Laura Bundock, Sky News.